The French Revolution, A History, by Thomas Carlyle. Volume 1, The Bastille. Book 1, The Death of Louis XV. Chapter 1, Louis the Well-Beloved. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Peter Dan. Book 1, Chapter 1. Louis the Well-Beloved. President Hainaut, remarking on royal surnames of honour, how difficult it often is to ascertain not only why, but even when they were conferred, takes occasion in his sleek official way to make a philosophical reflection. The surname of bien Armé, well beloved, says he, which Louis XV bears, will not leave posterity in the same doubt. This prince, in the year 1744, while hastening from one end of his kingdom to the other, and suspending his conquests in Flanders that he might fly to the assistance of Alsace, was arrested at Metz by a malady which threatened to cut short his days. At the news of this, Paris, all in terror, seemed a city taken by storm. The churches resounded with supplications and groans. The prayers of priests and people were every moment interrupted by their sobs, and it was from an interest so dear and tender that this surname of bien Amé fashioned itself, a title higher still than all the rest which this great prince has earned. So stands it written in lasting memorial of that year, 1744. Thirty other years have come and gone, and this great prince again lies sick. But in how altered circumstances now! Churches resound not with excessive groanings. Paris is stoically calm. Sobs interrupt no prayers, for indeed none are offered, except priests' litanies read or chanted at fixed money rate per hour, which are not liable to interruption. The shepherd of the people has been carried home from little Trianon, heavy of heart, and been put to bed in his own chateau of Versailles. The flock knows it and heeds it not. At most in the immeasurable tide of French speech, which ceases not day after day and only ebbs towards the short hours of night, may this of the royal sickness emerge from time to time as an article of news. Bets are doubtless depending, nay, some people express themselves loudly in the streets. But for the rest, on green field and steepled city, the May sun shines out, the May evening fades, and men ply their useful or useless business as if no Louis lay in danger. Dame du Barry indeed might pray if she had a talent for it. Duke d'Aguillon too, Marpeau and the Parlement Marpeau, These, as they sit in their high places, with France harnessed under their feet, know well on what basis they continue there. Look to it, Daiguillon, sharply as thou didst from the mill of Saint-Cast, on Quiberon and the invading English. Thou covered, if not with glory, yet with meal. Fortune was ever accounted inconstant, and each dog has but his day. Forlorn enough languished Duke d'Aguillon, some years ago, covered, as we said, with meal, nay, with worse. For La Chalotte, the Breton parlementier, accused him not only of poltroonery and tyranny, but even of concussion, official plunder of money, which accusations it was easier to get quashed by backstairs influence than to get answered. Neither could the thoughts or even the tongues of men be tied. Thus, under disastrous eclipse, had this grand nephew of the great Richelieu to glide about, unworshipped by the world. Resolute Choiseul, the abrupt, proud man, disdaining him, or even forgetting him. Little prospect but to glide into Gascony, to rebuild Chateau there, and die in glorious killing game. However, in the year 1770, a certain young soldier, Dumouriez by name, returning from Corsica, could see, with sorrow, at Compiègne, the old king of France, on foot, with doffed hat, in sight of his army, at the side of a magnificent phaeton, doing homage to the Dubarry. Much lay therein. Thereby, for one thing, could Daguignon postpone the rebuilding of his chateau and rebuild his fortunes first. For stout Chauzet would discern in the Dubarry nothing but a wonderfully dizzened scarlet woman, 
and go on his way as if she were not. Intolerable. The source of sighs, tears, of pettings and pouting, which would not end till France, La France as she named her royal valet, finally mustered heart to see Choiseul, and with that quivering in the chin, tremblement du menton, natural in such case, faltered out a dismissal, dismissal of his last substantial man, but pacification of his scarlet woman. Thus Daiguillon rose again and culminated. And with him there rose Mapio, the banisher of Parlement, who plants you a refractory president, a croy in Combray, on the top of steep rocks, inaccessible except by litters, there to consider himself. Likewise there rose Abbe Terre, dissolute financier, paying eightpence in the shilling, so that wits exclaim in some press at the playhouse, Where is Abbe Terre, that he might reduce us to two-thirds? And so have these individuals, verily, by black art, built them a Dom Daniel, or enchanted Du Barrydom, call it an Armida place, where they dwell pleasantly. Chancellor Mappeo playing blind man's buff with the scarlet enchantress, or gallantly presenting her with dwarf negroes, and a most Christian king has unspeakable peace within doors, whatever he may have without. My Chancellor is a scoundrel, but I cannot do without him. Beautiful Amida Palace, where the inmates live enchanted lives, lapped in soft music of adulation, waited on by the splendours of the world, which nevertheless hangs wondrously as by a single hair. Should the most Christian king die, or even get seriously afraid of dying, for, alas, had not the fair haughty Chateauroux to fly, with wet cheeks and flaming heart, from that fever scene at Metz, driven forth by sour shavelings? She hardly returned when fever and shavelings were both swept into the background. Pompadour, too, when Damien wounded royalty slightly under the fifth rib, and her drive to Trianon went off futile in shrieks and madly shaken torches, had to pack and be in readiness yet did not go, the wound not proving poisoned. For his majesty has religious faith, believes at least in a devil. And now a third peril, and who knows what may be in it, for the doctors look grave, asked privily if his majesty had not the smallpox long ago, and doubt it may have been a false kind. Yes, Marpeo, pucker those sinister brows of thine, and peer out on it with thy malign rat eyes. It is a questionable case. Sure, only that man is mortal, that with the life of one mortal snaps irrevocably the wonderfulest talisman, and all you buried him rushes off with tumult into infinite space, and ye, as subterranean apparitions are wont, vanish utterly, leaving only a smell of sulphur. These, and what holds of these may pray, to Beelzebub, or whoever will hear them, but from the rest of France there comes, as was said, no prayer, or one of an opposite character, expressed openly in the street. Chateau or hotel, where an enlightened philosophism scrutinised many things, is not given to prayer. Neither are Rosbach victories, terre finances, nor say only 60,000 lettres de cachet, which is Marpeo's share, persuasives towards that. Oh, hey no, prayers? From a friend smitten by black art with plague after plague, and lying now in shame and pain, with a harlot's foot on its neck, what prayers can come? Those lank scarecrows that prowl hunger-stricken through all highways and byways of French existence, will they pray? The dull millions that, in the workshop or furrow field, grind foredone at the wheel of labour like halted gin horses, if blind so much the quieter? or they that in the Bicetra hospital ate to a bed lie waiting their manumission? Dim are those heads of theirs, dull stagnant those hearts. To them the great sovereign is known mainly as the great regrater of bread. If they hear of his sickness, they will answer with a dull tant pis pour lui, or with the question, will he die? Yes, will he die? That is now for all France the grand question and hope, whereby alone the king's sickness has still some interest. End of Book One, Chapter One
The French Revolution, A History, by Thomas Carlyle, Volume 1. Book 1, The Death of Louis XV. Chapter 2, Realised Ideals. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan. Book 1, Chapter 2, Realised Ideals. Such a changed France, have we, and a changed Louis. Changed, truly, and further than thou yet seest. To the eye of history many things in that sick room of Louis are now visible, which to the courtiers there present were invisible. For indeed, it is well said, in every object there is inexhaustible meaning, the eye sees in it what the eye brings means of seeing. To Newton and to Newton's dog Diamond, what a different pair of universes, while the painting on the optical retina of both was most likely the same. Let the reader here in this sick room of Louis Endeavour to look with the mind, too. Time was when men could, so to speak, of a given man, by nourishing and decorating him with fit appliances to the due pitch, make themselves a king almost as the bees do, and what was still more to the purpose, loyally obey him when made. The man so nourished and decorated, thenceforth named royal, does verily bear rule, and is said and even thought to be, for example, prosecuting conquests in Flanders, when he lets himself like luggage be carried thither, and no light luggage covering miles of road. For he has his unblushing chateau with her band boxes and rouge pots at his side, so that at every new station a wooden gallery must be run up between their lodgings. He has not only his maison bouche and vitaille without end, but his very troop of players, with their pasteboard coulisses, thunder barrels, their kettles, fiddles, stage wardrobes, portable larders, and chaffering and quarrelling enough, all mounted in wagons, tumbrils, second-hand chaises, sufficient not to conquer Flanders, but the patience of the world. With such a flood of loud jingling appurtenances does he lumber along, prosecuting his conquests in Flanders, wonderful to behold. So nevertheless it was and had been. To some solitary thinkers it might seem strange, but even to him inevitable, not unnatural. For ours is a most fictile world, and man is the most fingent plastic of creatures. A world not fixable, not fathomable, an unfathomable somewhat which is not we, which we can work with and live amidst and model miraculously in our miraculous being and name world. But if the very rocks and rivers, as metaphysic teachers are in strict language, made by those outward senses of ours, how much more by the inward sense are all phenomena of the spiritual kind, dignities, authorities, holies, unholies, which inward sense, moreover, is not permanent like the outward ones, but forever growing and changing? Does not the black African take of sticks and old clothes, say, exported Monmouth Street cast clothes, what will suffice, and of these, cunningly combining them, fabricate for himself an eidolon, idol or thing seen, and name it mumbo-jumbo, which he can thenceforth pray to with upturned awestruck eye, not without hope? The white European mocks, but ought rather to consider and see whether he at home could not do the like a little more wisely. So it was, we say, in those conquests of Flanders thirty years ago, but so it no longer is. Alas, much more lies sick than poor Louis, not the French king only, but the French king's ship. This too, after long rough tear and wear, is breaking down. The world is also changed. So much that seemed vigorous has sunk decrepit. So much that was not is beginning to be. Born over the Atlantic to the closing ear of Louis, king by the grace of God, what sounds are these? Muffled, ominous, new in our centuries. Boston Harbour is black with unexpected tea. Behold, a Pennsylvanian Congress gather, and ere long on Bunker Hill, democracy announcing in rifle volleys, death-winged under her star banner, to the tune of Yankle Doodle Doo, that she is born, and whirlwind-like, will envelop the whole world. Sovereigns die, and sovereignties. How all dies, and is for a time only, is a time phantasm, yet reckons itself real. 
the Merovingian kings slowly wending on their bullet carts through the streets of Paris with their long hair flowing have all wended slowly on into eternity. Charlemagne sleeps at Salzburg with truncheon grounded, only Fable expecting that he will awaken. Charles the Hammer, Pepin, Bow-Legged, where now is their eye of menace, their voice of command? Rollo and his shaggy Northmen cover not the Seine with ships, but have sailed off on a longer voyage. The hair of Towhead, Ted de Toop, now needs no combing. Iron cutter, Taillefer, cannot cut a cobweb. Shrill Fredegonda, Shrill Brunhilde have had out their hot life scold and lie silent, their hot life frenzy cooled. Neither from that black tower de nail descends now darkling the doomed gallant in his sack to the sane waters plunging into night. For Dame de nail now cares not for this world's gallantry, heeds not this world's scandal. Dame de nail is herself gone into night. They are all gone, sunk down, down, with the tumult they made, and the rolling and the trampling of ever new generations passes over them, and they hear it not any more forever. And yet, withal, has there not been realised somewhat? Consider, to go no further, these stone edifices and what they hold. Mud town of the borderers, Lutetia Parisiorum or Parisiorum, has paved itself, has spread over the Seine islands, and far and wide on each bank, and become city of Paris, sometimes boasting to be Athens of Europe, and even capital of the universe. Stone towers frown aloft, long-lasting, grim with a thousand years. Cathedrals are there, and a creed, or memory of a creed, in them. Palaces and estate and law. Thou seest the smoke vapour, unextinguished breath as of a thing living. Labour's thousand hammers ring on her anvils. Also a more miraculous labour works noiselessly, not with the hand, but with the thought. How have cunning workmen in all crafts, with their cunning head and right hand, tamed the four elements to be their ministers, yoking the winds to their sea chariot, making the very stars their nautical timepiece, and written and collected a bibliothèque du roi, amongst whose books is the Hebrew book? A wondrous race of creatures, these have been realised, and what of skill is in these? Call not the past time, with all its confused wretchedness, a lost one. Observe, however, that of man's whole terrestrial possessions and attainments, unspeakably the noblest are his symbols, divine or divine-seeming, under which he marches and fights with victorious assurance in this life-battle what we can call his realised ideals. Of which realised ideals, omitting the rest, consider only these two, his church or spiritual guidance, his kingship or temporal one. The church, what a word was there, richer than Golconda and the treasures of the world. In the heart of the remotest mountains rises the little kirk, the dead all slumbering round it under their white memorial stones, in hope of a happy resurrection. Dull wert thou, O reader, if never in any hour, say of moaning midnight, when such kirk hangs spectral in the sky, and being was as if swallowed up of darkness, it spoke to thee things unspeakable, that went into thy soul's soul. Strong was thee that had a church, what we can call a church. He stood thereby, though in the centre of immensities, in the conflux of eternities, yet manlike towards God and man, the vague, shoreless universe had become for him a firm city and dwelling which he knew. Such virtue was in belief. In these words well spoken, I believe. Well might men prize their credo, and raise stateliest temples to it, and reverend hierarchies, and give it the tithe of their substance. It was worth living for, and dying for. Neither was that an inconsiderable moment when wild-armed men first raised their strongest aloft on the buckler throne, and with clanging armour and hearts said solemnly, Be thou our acknowledged strongest. In such acknowledged strongest, well-named king, cognic, kenning, or man that was able, what a symbol shone now for them, 
significant with the destinies of the world, a symbol of true guidance in return for loving obedience, properly, if he knew it, the prime want of man, a symbol which might be called sacred, for is there not, in reverence for what is better than we, an indestructible sacredness? On which ground, too, it was well said, there lay in the acknowledged strongest a divine right, as surely there might in the strongest, whether acknowledged or not, considering who it was that made him strong. And so, in the midst of confusions and unutterable incongruities, as all growth is confused, did this of royalty, with loyalty environing it, spring up, and grow mysteriously, subduing and assimilating, for a principle of life was in it, till it also had grown world great and was among the main fact of our modern existence. Such a fact that Louis XIV, for example, could answer the expostulatory magistrate with his L'État c'est moi, the state, I am the state, and be replied to by silence and abashed looks. So far had accident and forethought, had your Louis XI's and the leaden virgin in their hatband and torture wheels and canonical oubliettes, man-eating under their feet, your Henry Force and their prophesied social millennium, when every peasant should have his fowl in the pot, and on the whole the fertility of this most fertile existence, named of good and evil, brought it in the manner of the kingship. Wondrous, concerning which may we not again say that in the huge mass of evil as it rolls and swells there is ever some good working imprisoned, working towards deliverance and triumph. How such ideals do realise themselves and grow wondrously from amid the incongruous, ever-fluctuating chaos of the actual, this is what world history, if it teach anything, has to teach us. How they grow and, after long stormy growth, Bloom out, mature, supreme, then quickly, for the blossom is brief, fall into decay, sorrowfully dwindle and crumble down, or rush down noisily or noiselessly disappearing. The blossom is so brief as of some centennial cactus flower, which after a century of waiting shines out for hours. Thus from the day when rough Clovis in the Champ de Mars, in sight of his whole army, had to cleave retributively the head of that rough Frank with sudden battle-axe and the fierce words, It was thus thou clavest the vase, St. Remy's and mine, as Soissons, forward to Louis the Grand and his l'état c'est moi, we count some twelve hundred years. And now this very next Louis is dying, and so much dying with him. Nay, Thus, too, if Catholicism, with and against feudalism, but not against nature and her bounty, gave us English a Shakespeare and era of Shakespeare, and so produced a blossom of Catholicism, it was not till Catholicism itself, so far as law could abolish it, had been abolished here. But of those decadent ages in which no ideal either grows or blossoms, when belief and loyalty have passed away and only the cant and false echo of them remains, and all solemnity has become pageantry, and the creed of persons in authority has become one of two things, an imbecility or a Machiavellism. Alas, of these ages world history can take no notice. They have to become compressed more and more, and finally suppressed in the annals of mankind, blotted out as spurious, which indeed they are. Hapless ages, wherein, if ever in any, it is an unhappiness to be born. To be born and to learn only by every tradition and example that God's universe is Balliol's and a lie, and the supreme quack, the hierarch of men. In which mournfulest faith, nevertheless, do we not see whole generations, two and sometimes even three successively, live what they call living and vanish without chance of reappearance. In such a decadent age, or one fast verging that way, had our poor Louis been born. Grant also that if the French kingship had not, by course of nature, long to live, he of all men was the man to accelerate nature. The blossom of French royalty, cactus-like, has accordingly made an astonishing progress. In those Metz days it was still standing with all its petals, though bedimmed by Orléans regents and Rouet ministers and cardinals, but now, in 1774, we behold it bold 
and the virtue nigh gone out of it. Disastrous indeed does it look with those same realised ideals, one and all. The church, which in its palmy season, seven hundred years ago, could make an emperor wait barefoot in penance shift three days in the snow, has for centuries seen itself decaying, reduced even to forget old purposes and enmities and join interest with the kingship. On this younger strength it would fain stay its decrepitude, and these two will henceforth stand and fall together. Alas, the Sorbonne still sits there in its old mansion, but mumbles only jargon of dotage, and no longer leads the consciences of men. Not the Sorbonne, it is encyclopaedia, philosophy, and who knows what nameless innumerable multitudes of ready writers, profane singers, romancers, players, disputators and pamphleteers that now form the spiritual guidance of the world. The world's practical guidance, too, is lost or has glided into the same miscellaneous hands. Who is it that the king, able man, named also Wa, Rex, or director, now guides? His own huntsmen and prickers. When there is to be no hunt, it is well said, Le Ra ne fera rien. Today his majesty will do nothing. He lives and lingers there because he is living there, and none has yet laid hands on him. The nobles, in like manner, have nearly ceased either to guide or misguide, and are now, as their master is, little more than ornamental figures. It is long since they have done with butchering one another or their king. The workers, protected, encouraged by majesty, have ages ago built walled towns, and there ply their crafts. Will permit no robber baron to live by the saddle, but maintain a gallows to prevent it. Ever since that period of the Fronde, the noble has changed his fighting sword into a court rapier and now loyally attends his king as ministering satellite, divides the spoil not now by violence and murder but by soliciting and finesse. These men call themselves supports of the throne, singular gilt pasteboard caryatides in that singular edifice. For the rest, their privileges every way are now much curtailed. That law authorising a seigneur as he returned from hunting to kill not more than two serfs and refresh his feet in their warm blood and bowels has fallen into perfect desuetude and even into incredibility. For if Deputy La Poule can believe in it and call for the abrogation of it, so cannot we. No charola for these last fifty years, though never so fond of shooting, has been in use to bring down slaters and plumbers and see them roll from their roofs, but contents himself with partridges and grouse. Close viewed, their industry and function is that of dressing gracefully and eating sumptuously. As for their debauchery and depravity, is perhaps unexampled since the era of Tiberius and Commodus. Nevertheless, one has still partly a feeling with the Lady Maréchale. Depend upon it, sir, God thinks twice before damning a man of that quality. These people of old surely had virtues, uses, or they could not have been there. Nay, one virtue they are still required to have, for mortal man cannot live without a conscience, the virtue of perfect readiness to fight duels. Such are the shepherds of the people. And now how fares it with the flock? With the flock, as is inevitable, it fares ill and ever worse. They are not tended, they are only regularly shorn. They are sent for to do statute labour, to pay statute taxes, to fatten battlefields named bed of honour with their bodies in quarrels which are not theirs. Their hand and toil is in every possession of man, but for themselves they have little or no possession. Untaught, uncomforted, unfed, to pine dully in thick obscuration, in squalid destitution and obstruction. This is the lot of the millions. Peuple taillable et corveillable, a merci et miséricorde. In Brittany they once rose in revolt at the first introduction of pendulum clocks, thinking it had something to do with the gabelle. Paris requires to be cleared out periodically by the police and the horde of hunger-stricken vagabonds to be sent wandering again over space. For a time. During one such periodical clearance, says Lacretelle, 
in May 1750, the police had presumed withal to carry off some reputable people's children in the hope of exhorting ransoms for them. The mothers fill the public places with cries of despair. Crowds gather, get excited. So many women in distraction run about exaggerating the alarm. An absurd and horrible fable arises among the people. It is said that the doctors have ordered a great person to take baths in young human blood for the restoration of his own, all spoiled by debaucheries. Some of the rioters, adds Lacretelle quite coolly, were hanged on the following days. The police went on. O oh, ye poor naked wretches! And this, then, is your inarticulate cry to heaven, as of a dumb, tortured animal crying from uttermost depths of pain and debasement? Do these azure skies, like a dead crystalline vault, only reverberate the echo of it on you? Respond to it only by hanging on the following days? Not so, not for ever. Ye are heard in heaven, and the answer too will come, in a horror of great darkness and shakings of the world and a cup of trembling which all the nations shall drink. Remark, meanwhile, how from amid the wrecks and dust of this universal decay new powers are fashioning themselves, adapted to the new time and its destinies. Besides the old noblesse, originally of fighters, there is a new recognised noblesse of lawyers, whose gala day and proud battle day even now is an unrecognised noblesse of commerce, powerful enough with money in its pocket. Lastly, powerfulest of all, least recognised of all, a noblesse of literature, without steel on their thigh, without gold in their purse, but with the grand thaumaturgic faculty of thought in their head. French philosophism has arisen, in which little word how much do we include? Here, indeed, lies properly the cardinal symptom of the whole widespread malady. Faith is gone out, scepticism is come in. Evil abounds and accumulates. No man has faith to withstand it, to amend it, to begin by amending himself. It must even go on accumulating. While hollow languor and vacuity is the lot of the upper and wanton stagnation of the lower, and universal misery is very certain, what other thing is certain? That a lie cannot be believed. Philosophism knows only this. Her other belief is mainly that, in spiritual, supersensual matters, no belief is possible. Unhappy! Nay, as yet the contradiction of a lie is some kind of belief, but the lie with its contradiction once swept away, what will remain? The five unsatiated senses will remain, the sixth insatiable sense of vanity. The whole demonic nature of man will remain, hurled forth to rage blindly without rule or reign, savage itself, yet with all the tools and weapons of civilization, a spectacle new in history. In such a France, as in a powder tower, where fire unquenched and now unquenchable is smoking and smouldering all around, has Louis XV lain down to die. With pompadourism and dubarryism, his fleur-de-lis has been shamefully struck down in all lands and in all seas. Poverty invades even the royal exchequer, and tax farming can squeeze out no more. There is a quarrel of twenty-five years standing with the Parlement, Everywhere want, dishonesty, unbelief and hot-brained skylists for state physicians. It is a portentous hour. Such things can the eye of history see in this sick room of King Louis, which were invisible to the courtiers there. It is twenty years gone Christmas Day since Lord Chesterfield, summing up what he had noted of this same France, wrote and sent off by post the following words that have become memorable. In short, all the symptoms which I have ever met with in history, previous to great changes and revolutions in government, now exist and daily increase in France. End of Book 1, Chapter 2《The French Revolution A History》by Thomas Carlyle, Volume 1 Book 1, The Death of Louis XV Chapter 3. 
Viaticum. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan. Book 1, Chapter 3, Viaticum. For the present, however, the grand question with the governors of France is, shall extreme unction, or other ghostly viaticum, to Louis, not to France, be administered? It is a deep question. For, if administered, if so much as spoken of, must not, on the very threshold of the business, which du Barry vanish, hardly to return, should Louis even recover? With her vanishes Duke d'Aiguillon and company, and all their amy de palace, as was said. Chaos swallows the whole again, and there is left nothing but a smell of brimstone. But then, on the other hand, what will the Dauphinists and Choiseulists say? Nay, what may the royal martyr himself say, should he happen to get deadly worse without getting delirious? For the present he still kisses the Dubarry hand. So we from the anteroom can note. But afterwards? Doctors' bulletins may run as they are ordered, but it is confluent smallpox, of which, as is whispered too, the gatekeeper's once so buxom daughter lies ill. And Louis XV is not a man to be trifled with in his viaticum. Was he not wont to catechise his very girls in the Parc aux Cerfs and pray with and for them that they might preserve their orthodoxy? A strange fact, not an unexampled one, for there is no animal so strange as man. For the moment, indeed, it were all well could Archbishop Beaumont be prevailed upon to wink with one eye. Alas, Beaumont would himself so fain do it, for, singular to tell, the Church too, the whole posthumous hope of Jesuitism, now hangs by the apron of this same unmentionable woman. But then, the force of public opinion? Rigorous Christophe de Beaumont, who has spent his life in persecuting hysterical Jansenists and incredulous non-confessors, or even their dead bodies, if no better might be, how shall he now open heaven's gate and give absolution with the corpus delicti still under his nose? Our grand armoner Rochemont, for his part, will not higgle with the royal sinner about turning of the key. But there are other churchmen. There is a king's confessor, foolish Abbe Moudon, and fanaticism and decency are not yet extinct. On the whole, what is to be done? The doors can be well watched, the medical bulletin adjusted and much, as usual, be hoped for from time and chance. The doors are well watched, no improper figure can enter. Indeed, few wish to enter, for the putrid infection reaches even to the oeil de boeuf, so that more than fifty fall sick and ten die. Mesdames and princesses alone wait at the loathsome sick bed, impelled by filial piety. The three princesses, Grai, Schiff, Koch, Rag, snip, pig, as he was wont to name them, are assiduous there, when all have fled. The fourth princess, Locke, dud, as we guess, is already in the nunnery, and can only give her orisons. Poor Grey and sisterhood, they have never known a father, such as the hard bargain grandeur must make. Scarcely at the debotter, when royalty took off its boots, could they snatch up their enormous hoops, gird the long train round their waists, huddle on their black cloaks of taffeta up to the very chin, and so, in fit appearance of full dress, every evening at six, walk majestically in, receive their royal kiss on the brow, and then walk majestically out again, to embroidery, small scandal, prayers and vacancy. If Majesty came some morning with coffee of its own making and swallowed it with them hastily while the dogs were uncoupling for the hunt, it was received as a grace of heaven. Poor withered ancient women, in the wild tossings that yet await your fragile existence before it be crushed and broken, as ye fly through hostile countries over tempestuous seas, are almost taken by the Turks, and wholly in the sanscalotic earthquake, know not your right hand from your left, be this always an assured place in your remembrance, for the act was good and loving. To us also it is a little sunny spot in that dismal howling waste where we hardly find another. Meanwhile, what shall an impartial prudent courtier do? 
in these delicate circumstances, while not only death or life, but even sacrament or no sacrament is a question the skilfulest may falter. Few are so happy as the Duc d'Orléans and the Prince de Condé, who can themselves with volatile salts attend the king's antechamber, and at the same time send their brave sons, Duc de Chartres, Egalité that is to be, Duc de Bourbon one day, Condé too, and famous among dotards, to wait upon the Dauphin. With another few it is a resolution taken. Yacta est alia. Old Richelieu, when Beaumont, driven by public opinion, is at last for entering the sick room, will twitch himself by the rocher into a recess, and there, with his old dissipated mastiff face and the oiliest vehemence, be seen pleading, and even as we judge by Beaumont's change of colour, prevailing, that the king be not killed by a proposition in divinity. Duc de Fransac, son of Richelieu, can follow his father, when the curé of Versailles whimpers something about sacraments, he will threaten to throw him out of the window if he mentions such a thing. Happy these, we may say, but to the rest that hover between two opinions, is it not trying? He who would understand to what a pass Catholicism, and much else, had now got, and how the symbols of the holiest have become gambling dice of the basest, must read the narrative of those things by Bessonval and Soulevy and other court newsmen of the time. He will see the Versailles galaxy all scattered asunder, grouped into new, ever-shifting constellations. There are nods and sagacious glances, go-betweens, silk dowagers mysteriously gliding with smiles for this constellation, sighs for that. There is a tremor of hope or desperation in several hearts. There is the pale grinning shadow of death, ceremoniously ushered along by another grinning shadow of etiquette. At intervals the growl of chapel organs, like prayer by machinery, proclaiming as in a kind of horrid diabolic horse laughter, Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. End of Book 1, Chapter 3《The French Revolution》A History by Thomas Carlyle, Volume One, Book One: The Death of Louis XV, Chapter Four: Louis the Unforgotten. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan. Book One, Chapter Four: Louis the Unforgotten. Poor Louis. With these it is a hollow phantasmagory, where, like mimes, they mope and mowl, and utter false sounds for hire, but with thee it is frightful earnest. Frightful to all men is death, from of old named King of Terrors. Our little compact home of an existence, where we dwelt complaining, yet as in a home, is passing, in dark agonies, into an unknown of separation, foreignness, unconditioned possibility. The heathen emperor asks of his soul, Into what places art thou now departing? The Catholic king must answer, To the judgment bar of the Most High God. Yes, it is a summing up of life, A final settling, And giving in the account of the deeds done in the body. They are done now, And lie there unalterable, And do bear their fruits, Long as eternity shall last. Louis XV had always the kingliest abhorrence of death. Unlike that praying Duke of Orléans, Egalité's grandfather, for indeed several of them had a touch of madness, who honestly believed that there was no death, he, if the court newsman can be believed, started up once on a time glowing with sulphurous contempt and indignation on his poor secretary, who had stumbled on the words Feu-Roi l'Espagne, the late King of Spain. Fera, monsieur? Monseigneur, hastily answered the trembling but adroit man of business. C'est un titre qu'il prenant. Tis a title they take. Louis, we say, was not so happy, but he did what he could. He would not suffer death to be spoken of, avoided the sight of churchyards, funereal monuments, and whatsoever could bring it to mind. It is the resource of the ostrich who, hard-hunted, sticks his foolish head in the ground and would fain forget that his foolish unseeing body is not unseen too. 
or sometimes with a spasmodic antagonism significant of the same thing and of more, he would go, or stopping his court carriages, would send into churchyards and ask how many new graves there were today, though it gave his poor pompadour the disagreeablest qualms. We can figure the thought of Louis that day, when, all royally caparisoned for hunting, he met, at some sudden turning in the wood of Senar, a ragged peasant with a coffin. For whom? It was for a poor brother's slave, whom Majesty had sometimes noticed slaving in those quarters. What did he die of? Of hunger. The king gave his steed the spur. But figure his thought when death is now clutching at his own heartstrings, unlooked for, inexorable. Yes, poor Louis, death has found thee. No palace walls or lifeguards, gorgeous tapestries or gilt buckram of stiffest ceremonial could keep him out. But he is here, here at thy very life breath, and will extinguish it. Thou, whose whole existence hitherto was a chimera and scenic show, at length becomest a reality, sumptuous Versailles burst asunder like a dream into void immensity. Time is done, and all the scaffolding of time falls wrecked with hideous clang around thy soul. The pale kingdoms yawn open, there must thou enter naked, all unkinged, and await what is appointed thee. Unhappy man, there as thou turnest in dull agony on thy bed of weariness, what a thought is thine. Purgatory and hellfire, now all too possible in the prospect, in the retrospect, alas, what thing didst thou do that were not better undone? What mortal didst thou generously help? What sorrow hadst thou mercy on? Do the five hundred thousand ghosts who sank shamefully on so many battlefields from Rossbach to Quebec that thy harlot might take revenge for an epigram crowd round thee in this hour? Thy foul harem, the curses of mothers, the tears and infamy of daughters? Miserable man, thou hast done evil as thou couldst. Thy whole existence seems one hideous abortion and mistake of nature, the use and meaning of thee not yet known. Wert thou a fabulous griffin, devouring the works of men, daily dragging virgins to thy cave, clad also in scales that no spear would pierce, no spear but death's? A griffin not fabulous but real, frightful, O Louis, seem these moments for thee. We will pry no further into the horrors of a sinner's deathbed. And yet, let no meanest man lay flattering unction to thy soul. Louis was a ruler, but art not thou also one? His wide France, look at it from the fixed stars, themselves not yet infinitude, is no wider than thy narrow brickfield, where thou too didst faithfully or didst unfaithfully. Man, symbol of eternity imprisoned into time, it is not thy works which are all mortal, infinitely little, and the greatest no greatest than the least, but only the spirit thou workest in that can have worth or continuance. But reflect in any case, what a life problem this of poor Louis, when he rose as bien Name from that met sick bed, really was. What son of Adam could have swayed such incoherences into coherence? Could he? Blindest fortune alone has cast him on the top of it. He swims there, can as little sway it as the drift log sways the wind-tossed, moon-stirred Atlantic. What have I done to be so loved, he said then. He may say now, what have I done to be so hated? Thou hast done nothing, poor Louis. Thy fault is properly even this, that thou didst nothing. What could poor Louis do? abdicate and wash his hands of it in favour of the first that would accept. Other clear wisdom there was none for him. As it was, he stood gazing dubiously, the absurdest mortal extant, a very solecism incarnate, into the absurdest confused world, wherein at lost nothing seemed so certain that he, the incarnate solecism, had five senses that were flying tables. Tables volantes, which vanish through the floor to come back reloaded, and a pac osef. Whereby at least we have again this historical curiosity, a human being in an original position, swimming passively as on some boundless mother of dead dogs towards issues which he partly saw. For Louis had withal a kind of insight in him. 
So, when a new minister of marine, or what else it might be, came announcing his new era, the scarlet woman would hear from the lips of majesty at supper. Yes, he spread out his ware like another, promised the beautifulest things in the world, not a thing of which will come. He does not know this region, or he will see. Or again, tis the twentieth time I hear all that. France will never get a navy, I believe. How touching also was this. If I were lieutenant of police, I would prohibit those Paris cabriolets. Doomed mortal, for is it not a doom to be solecism incarnate? A new roi fainéant, king do nothing, but with the strangest new mayor of the palace, no bow-legged pepper now for mayor, but that same cloud-capped, fire-breathing spectre of democracy, incalculable, which is enveloping the world. Was Louis no wickeder than this, or the other private do-nothing and eat all, such as we often enough see under the name of man and even man of pleasure, cumbering God's diligent creation for a time? Say, wretcheder, his life solecism was seen and felt of a whole scandalised world. Him endless oblivion cannot engulf and swallow to endless depths, not yet for a generation or two. However, be this as it will, we remark, not without interest, that on the evening of the fourth, Dame Du Barry issues from the sick room with perceptible trouble in her visage. It is the fourth evening of May, year of grace, 1774. Such a whispering in the Oie de Boeuf. Is he dying then? What can be said is that Du Barry seems making up her packages. She sails weeping through her gilt boudoirs as if taking leave. Daiguillon and company are near their last card. Nevertheless, they will not yet throw up the game. But as for the sacramental controversy, it is as good as settled without being mentioned. Louis can send for his Abbe Moudon in the course of next night, be confessed by him, some say, for a space of seventeen minutes, and demand the sacraments of his own accord. Nay, already in the afternoon... Behold is not your sorceress du Barry with the handkerchief at her eyes, mounting Daiguillon's chariot, rolling off in his duchess's consolatory arms. She is gone, and her place knows her no more. Vanish, false sorceress, into space. Needless to hover at neighbouring Ruel, for thy day is done. Shut to the royal palace gates for evermore. Hardly in coming years shalt thou, under cloud of night, descend one in black domino like a black night bird, and disturb the fair Antoinette's music party in the park, all birds of paradise flying from thee, and musical windpipes growing mute. Thou unclean, yet unmalignant, not unpitiable thing! What a course was thine from that first truckle bed in Joan of Arc's country, where thy mother bore thee with tears to an unnamed father, forward through lowest subterranean depths and over highest sunlit heights of harlotdom and rascaldom, to the guillotine axe which shears away thy vainly whimpering head. Rest there uncursed, only buried and abolished. What else befitted thee? Louis, meanwhile, is in considerable impatience for his sacraments, sends more than once to the window to see whether they are not coming. Be of comfort, Louis, what comfort thou canst. They are under way, those sacraments. Toward six in the morning they arrive. Cardinal Grand Amano Rochemon is here, in pontificals, with his pixes and his tools. He approaches the royal pillow, elevates his wafer, mutter or seems to mutter somewhat, and so, as the Abbe Georgel, in words that stick to one, expresses it, has Louis made the amend honourable to God. So does your Jesuit construe it. Wah, wah, as the wild Clotaire groaned out when life was departing, what great God is this that pulls down the strength of the strongest kings? The amende honorable, what legal apology you will, to God, but not, if Daiguillon can help it, to man. Du Barry still hovers in his mansion at Ruel, and while there is life there is hope. Grand Armoner Rochemont, accordingly, for he seems to be in the secret, has no sooner seen his pixes and gear repacked than he is stepping majestically forth again as if the work were done. But King's confessor Abbe Moudon starts forward with anxious acidulant face, twitches him by the sleeve, whispers in his ear. 
whereupon the poor cardinal must turn round and declare audibly that his majesty repents of any subject of scandal he may have given a pudonne, and purposes by the strength of heaven assisting him to avoid the like for the future words listened to by richelieu with mastiff face growing blacker answered to aloud with an epithet which bossinval will not repeat Old Richelieu, conqueror of Menorca, companion of flying table orgies, perforator of bedroom walls, is thy day also done? Alas, the chapel organs may keep going, the shrine of Saint Genevieve be let down and pulled up again without effect. In the evening the whole court, with Dauphin and Dauphiness, assist at the chapel. Priests are hoarse with chanting their prayers of forty hours, and the heaving bellows blow almost frightful, for the very heaven blackens, battering rain torrents dash with thunder, almost drowning the organ's voice, and electric fire flashes make the very flambeau on the altar pale, so that the most, as we are told, retired when it was over with hurried steps in a state of meditation, ressuyement, and said little or nothing. So it has lasted for the better half of a fortnight, the Dubarry gone almost a week, Bessonval says all the world was getting impatient, que cela fini, that poor Louis would have done with it. It is now the 10th of May, 1774. He will soon have done now. This 10th May day falls into the loathsome sickbed, but dull, unnoticed there. For they that look out of the window are quite darkened. The cistern wheel moves discordant on its axis. Life, like a spent steed, is panting towards the goal. In their remote apartments, Dauphin and Dauphiness stand road-ready, all grooms and equerries booted and spurred, waiting for some signal to escape the house of pestilence. And hark, across the Oie de Boeuf, what sound is that? Sound terrible and absolutely like thunder. It is the rush of the whole court, rushing as in wager to salute the new sovereigns. Hail to your majesties! The Dauphin and Dauphiness are king and queen. Overpowered with many emotions, they two fall on their knees together and with streaming tears exclaim, O oh God, guide us, protect us, we are too young to reign. Too young indeed. Thus, in any case, with a sound absolutely like thunder, as the horologe of time struck and an old era passed away. The Louis that was lies forsaken, a mass of abhorred clay, abandoned to some poor persons and priests of the Chapelle Ardente, who make haste to put him in two lead coffins pouring in abundant spirits of wine. The new Louis, with his court, is rolling towards Choisy through the summer afternoon, the royal tears still flow, but a word mispronounced by Monsieur d'Artois sets them all laughing, and they weep no more. Light mortals, how ye walk your light life minuet over bottomless abysses divided from you by a film. For the rest, the proper authorities felt that no funeral could be too unceremonious. Bessonval himself thinks it was unceremonious enough. Two carriages containing two noblemen of the usher species and a Versailles clerical person, some score of mounted pages, some fifty palfreniers, these with torches, but not so much as in black, start from Versailles on the second evening with their leaden beer. At a high trot they start, and keep up that pace. For the jibes, brocard, of those Parisians who stand planted in two rows all the way to St. Denis and give vent to their pleasantry, the characteristic of the nation, do not tempt one to slacken. Towards midnight the vaults of St. Denis receive their own, unwept by any eye of all these, if not by poor Locke, his neglected daughters, whose nunnery is hard by. Him they crush down and huddle underground in this impatient way, him and his era of sin and tyranny and shame. For behold, a new era is come, the future all the brighter that the past was base. End of Book One, Chapter Four The French Revolution, A History, by Thomas Carlyle, Volume One Book Two, The Paper Age, Chapter One 
Astraea Redux. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan. Book 2, Chapter 1. Astraea Redux. A paradoxical philosopher carrying to the utmost length that aphorism of Montesquieu's Happy the people whose annals are tiresome has said Happy the people whose annals are vacant. In which saying, mad as it looks, may there not still be found some grain of reason? For truly, as it has been written, silence is divine, and of heaven. So in all earthly things, too, there is a silence which is better than any speech. Consider it well, the event, the thing which can be spoken of and recorded, is it not in all cases some disruption, some solution of continuity? Were it even a glad event, it involves change, involves loss of active force, and so far, either in the past or in the present, is an irregularity, a disease. Stillest perseverance were our blessedness, not dislocation and alteration, could they be avoided. The oak grows silently in the forest a thousand years, Only in the thousandth year, when the woodman arrives with his axe, is there heard an echoing through the solitudes, and the oak announces itself when, with a far-sounding crash, it falls. How silent, too, is the planting of the acorn, scattered from the lap of some wandering wind. Nay, when our oak flowered or put on its leaves, its glad events, what shout of proclamation could there be? Hardly from the most observant a word of recognition. These things befell not, they were slowly done, not in an hour, but through the flight of days. What was to be said of it? This hour seemed altogether as the last was, as the next would be. It is thus everywhere that foolish rumour babbles not of what was done, but of what was misdone or undone and foolish history, ever more or less the written epitomised synopsis of rumour, knows so little that were not as well unknown. Attila invasions, Walter the Penniless Crusades, Sicilian Vespers, Thirty Years' Wars, mere sin and misery, not work but hindrance of work. For the earth all this while was yearly green and yellow with her kind harvests, The hand of the craftsman, the mind of the thinker, rested not. And so, after all, and in spite of all, we have this so glorious, high-domed, blossoming world, concerning which poor history may well ask with wonder whence it came. She knows so little of it, knows so much of what obstructed it, what would have rendered it impossible. Such, nevertheless, by necessity or foolish choice, is her rule and practice, whereby that paradox, happy the people whose annals are vacant, is not without its true side. And yet, what seems more pertinent to note here, there is a stillness, not of unobstructed growth, but of passive inertness, and symptom of imminent downfall. As victory is silent, so is defeat. Of the opposing forces, the weaker has resigned itself. The stronger marches on, noiseless now, but rapid, inevitable. The fall and overturn will not be noiseless. How all grows and has its period, even as the herbs of the fields, be it annual, centennial, millennial. All grows and dies, each by its own wondrous laws, in wondrous fashion of its own, spiritual things most wondrously of all. Inscrutable to the wisest are these latter, not to be prophesied of or understood. If when the oak stands proudliest, flourishing to the eye, you know that its heart is sound, it is not so with the man, how much less with the society, with the nation of men. Of such it may be affirmed even that the superficial aspect, that the inward feeling of full health, is generally ominous. For indeed it is of apoplexy, so to speak, and a plethoric lazy habit of body that churches, kingships, social institutions oftenest die. Sad when such institution plethorically says to itself, Take thy ease, thou hast goods laid up. Like the fool of the gospel to whom it was answered, Fool, this night thy life shall be required of thee. 
Is it the healthy peace or the ominous unhealthy that rests on France for these next ten years, over which the historian can pass lightly without call to linger, for as yet events are not, much less performances? Time of sunniest stillness, shall we call it what all men thought the new age of gold? Call it at least of paper, which in many ways is the succedaneum of gold, Bank paper, wherewith you can still buy where there is no gold left. Book paper, splendent with theories, philosophies, sensibilities. Beautiful art, not only of revealing thought, but also of so beautifully hiding from us the want of thought. Paper is made from the rags of things that did once exist. There are endless excellencies in paper. What wisest philosoph in this halcyon, uneventful period could prophesy that there was approaching, big with darkness and confusion, the event of events? Hope ushers in a revolution, as earthquakes are preceded by bright weather. On the 5th of May, fifteen years hence, old Louis will not be sending for the sacraments, but a new Louis, his grandson, with the whole pomp of astonished, intoxicated France, will be opening the States General. Du Barrydom and its Daiguillons are gone forever. There is a young, still docile, well-intentioned king, a young, beautiful and bountiful, well-intentioned queen, and with them all France, as it were, become young. Mopio and his Parlement have to vanish into thick night. Respectable magistrates, not indifferent to the nation, were it only for having been opponents of the court, can descend unchained from their steep rocks at Crow in Combray and elsewhere, and return singing praises. The old Parlement of Paris resumes its functions. Instead of a profligate, bankrupt Abbe Terre, we have now, for Controller General, a virtuous philosophic Turgo with a whole reformed France in his head, by whom whatsoever is wrong, in finance or otherwise, will be righted as far as possible. Is it not as if wisdom herself were henceforth to have seat and voice in the Council of Kings? Turgo has taken office with the noblest plainness of speech to that effect, been listened to with the noblest royal trustfulness. It is true, as King Louis objects, they say he never goes to Mass. But liberal France likes him little worse for that. Liberal France answers, the Abbe Terray always went. Philosophism sees, for the first time, a philosopher, or even a philosopher, in office. She, in all things, will applausively second him. Neither will light old Morapa obstruct if he can easily help it. Then how sweet are the manners, vice losing all its deformity, becoming decent as established things, making regulations for themselves do, becoming almost a kind of sweet virtue. Intelligence so abounds, irradiated by wit and the art of conversation. Philosophism sits joyful in her glittering saloons, the dinner guest of opulence grown ingenuous, the very nobles proud to sit by her and preachers lifted up over all Bastille, a coming millennium. From far ferny, Patriarch Voltaire gives sign. Veterans Diderot, d'Alembert have lived to see this day. These with the younger Marmontel, Morolais, Chamfort, Reynal, make glad the spicy board of rich ministering dowager, a philosophic farmer general. O oh, nights and suppers of the gods, of a truth the long demonstrated will now be done. The age of revolutions approaches, as Jean-Jacques wrote, but then of happy blessed ones. Man awakens from his long somnambulism, chases the phantasms that beleaguered and bewitched him. Behold the new morning glittering down the eastern steeps. Fly, false phantasms, from its shafts of light. Let the absurd fly, utterly forsaking this lower earth forever. It is truth and astraea redux that, in the shape of philosophism, henceforth reign. For what imaginable purpose was man made, if not to be happy? By victorious analysis and progress of the species, happiness enough now awaits him. 
kings can become philosophers, or else philosophers kings. Let but society be once rightly constituted by victorious analysis. The stomach that is empty shall be filled, the throat that is dry shall be wetted with wine, labour itself shall be all one as rest, not grievous but joyous. Wheat fields, one would think, cannot come to grow untilled, no man made clay or made weary thereby, unless indeed machinery will do it. Gratuitous tailors and restaurateurs may start up at fit intervals, one as yet sees not how. But if each will, according to rule of benevolence, have a care for all, then surely no one will be uncared for. Nay, who knows but by sufficiently victorious analysis, human life may be indefinitely lengthened and men get rid of death as they have already done of the devil. We shall then be happy in spite of death and the devil. So preaches magniloquent philosophism, heredeunt Saturnia Regna. The prophetic song of Paris and its philosophe is audible enough in the Versailles Oi de Boeuf, and the Oi de Boeuf, intent chiefly on nearer blessedness, can answer at worst with a polite, why not? Good old cheery Morapar is too joyful a Prime Minister to dash the world's joy. Sufficient for the day be its own evil. Cheery old man, he cuts his jokes and hovers careless along, his cloak well adjusted to the wind, if so be he may please all persons. The simple young king, whom Amorapa cannot think of troubling with business, has retired into the interior apartments. Taciturn, irresolute, though with a sharpness of temper at times, he at length determines on a little smith work. And so, in apprenticeship with a sieur gamin, whom one day he shall have little cause to bless, is learning to make locks. It appears further he understood geography and could read English. Unhappy young king, his childlike trust in that foolish old Morapa deserved another return, but friend and foe, destiny and himself, have combined to do him hurt. Meanwhile, the fair young queen in her halls of state walks like a goddess of beauty, the cynosure of all eyes, as yet mingles not with affairs, heeds not the future, least of all dreads it. Weber and Campan have pictured her there within the royal tapestries, in bright boudoirs, baths, peignoirs, and the grand and little toilette, with a whole brilliant world waiting obsequious on her glance. Fair young daughter of time, What things has time in store for thee? Like earth's brightest appearance, she moves gracefully, environed with the grandeur of earth, a reality and yet a magic vision, for behold, shall not utter darkness swallow it? A soft young heart adopts orphans, portions meritorious maids, delights to succour the poor, such poor as come picturesquely in her way, and sets the fashion of doing it, for, as was said, benevolence has now begun reigning. In her Duchess de Polignac, in Princess de Lamballe, she enjoys something almost like friendship. Now, too, after seven long years, she has a child, and soon even a Dauphin of her own can reckon herself, as queens go, happy in a husband. Events the grand events are but charitable feasts of morals, fête de mer with their prizes and speeches, poissard processions to the dauphin's cradle, above all flirtations, their rise, progress, decline and fall. There are snow statues raised by the poor in hard winter to a queen who has given them fuel. There are masquerades, theatricals, beautifyings of little Trianon, purchase and repair of St. Cloud journeyings from the summer court Elysium to the winter one. There are poutings and grudgings from the Sardinian sisters-in-law, for the princes too are wedded, little jealousies which court etiquette can moderate. Wholly the lightest-hearted, frivolous foam of existence, yet an artfully refined foam, pleasant were it not so costly, like that which mantles on the wine of champagne. Monsieur, the king's elder brother, has set up for a kind of wit, and leans towards the philosophic side. 
Monsieur d'Artois pulls the mask from a fair impertinent, fights a duel in consequence, almost drawing blood. He has breeches of a kind new in this world, a fabulous kind. Four tall lackeys, says Mercier, as if he had seen it, hold him up in the air that he may fall into the garment without vestige of wrinkle, from which rigorous encasement the same four, in the same way and with more effort, must deliver him at night. This last is he who now, as a grey, time-worn man, sits desolate at Graz, having winded up his destiny with the three days. In such sort are poor mortals swept and shovelled to and fro. End of Book 2, Chapter 1《The French Revolution, A History》by Thomas Carlyle Volume 1 Book 2, The Paper Age Chapter 2, Petition in Hieroglyphs This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan Book 2, Chapter 2 Petition in Hieroglyphs With the working people, again, it is not so well. Unlucky. For there are twenty to twenty-five millions of them, whom, however, we lump together into a kind of dim, compendious unity, monstrous but dim, far off as the canai, or, more humanely, as the masses. Masses, indeed. And yet, singular to say, if, with an effort of imagination, thou follow them over broad France, into their clay hovels, into their garrets and hutches, the masses consist all of units, every unit of whom has his own heart and sorrows, stands covered there with his own skin, and if you prick him, he will bleed. O oh, purple sovereignty, holiness, reverence! Thou, for example, Cardinal Grand Armoner, with thy plush covering of honour, who hast thy hands strengthened with dignities and monies, and art set on thy world watchtower solemnly in sight of God for such ends. What a thought that every unit of these masses is a miraculous man, even as thyself art, struggling with vision or with blindness for his infinite kingdom this life which he has got once only in the middle of eternities, with a spark of the divinity, what thou callest an immortal soul, in him. Dreary, languid do these struggle in their obscure remoteness, their hearth cheerless, their diet thin. For them in this world rises no era of hope, hardly now in the other, if it be not hope in the gloomy rest of death, for their faith, too, is failing. Untaught, uncomforted, unfed. A dumb generation, their voice only an inarticulate cry. Spokesmen in the King's Council, in the World's Forum, they have none that finds credence. At rare intervals, as now in 1775, they will fling down their hoes and hammers, and to the astonishment of thinking mankind, flock hither and thither, dangerous, aimless, get the length even of Versailles. Turgot is altering the corn trade, abrogating the absurdest corn laws. There is Darth, real or, were it even factitious, an indubitable scarcity of bread. And so... On the second day of May, 1775, these waste multitudes do here at Versailles Chateau, in widespread wretchedness, in sallow faces, squalor, winged raggedness, present as in legible hieroglyphic writing their petition of grievances. The chateau gates have to be shut, but the king will appear on the balcony and speak to them. They have seen the king's face. Their petition of grievances has been, if not read, looked at. For answer, two of them are hanged on a new gallows forty feet high, and the rest driven back to their dens for a time. Clearly a difficult point for government, that of dealing with these masses, if indeed it be not rather the sole point and problem of government, and all other points mere accidental crotchets, superficialities and beatings of the wind. For let charter chests, use and want, law common and special, say what they will, the masses count to so many millions of units, made to all appearance by God. 
whose earth this is declared to be. Besides, the people are not without ferocity. They have sinews and indignation. Do but look what holiday old Marquis Mirabeau, the crabbed old friend of men, looked on in these same years from his lodging at the baths of Mont d'Or. The savages descending in torrents from the mountains, our people ordered not to go out. The curate in surplice and stole, justice in its peruke. Marichose, sabre in hand, guarding the place till the bagpipes can begin. The dance interrupted in a quarter of an hour by battle. The cries, the squealings of children, of infirm persons and other assistants tarring them on as the rabble does when dogs fight. Frightful men, or rather frightful wild animals, clad in dupes of coarse woolen with large girdles of leather studded with copper nails, of gigantic stature, heightened by high wooden clogs, sabots rising on tiptoe to see the fight, tramping time to it, rubbing their sides with their elbows, their faces haggard, figure half, and covered with their long, greasy hair, the upper part of the visage waxing pale, the lower distorting itself into the attempt at a cruel laugh and a sort of ferocious impatience. And these people pay the tie, and you want further to take their salt from them? And you know not what it is you are stripping bare, or as you call it, governing, what by the spurt of your pen in its cold, dastard indifference you will fancy you can starve always with impunity, always till a catastrophe come? Ah, madame, such government by blind man's buff, stumbling along too far, will end in the general overturn. Coubute général. Undoubtedly, A dark feature, this, in an age of gold, age at least of paper and hope. Meanwhile, trouble us not with thy prophecies, O croaking friend of men, tis long that we have heard such, and still the old world keeps wagging its old way. End of Book Two, Chapter Two The French Revolution, A History, by Thomas Carlyle, Volume 1. Book 2, The Paper Age, Chapter 3, Questionable. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan. Book 2, Chapter 3, Questionable. Or is this same age of hope itself but a simulacrum, as hope too often is? Cloud vapour, with rainbows painted on it, beautiful to see, to sail towards, which hovers over Niagara Falls. In that case, Victoria's analysis will have enough to do. Alas, yes, a whole world to remake, if she could see it, work for another than she. For all is wrong and gone out of joint. The inward spiritual and the outward economical, head or heart, there is no soundness in it. As indeed evils of all sorts are more or less of kin and do usually go together, especially it is an old truth that wherever huge physical evil is, there as the parent and origin of it has moral evil to a proportionate extent been. Before those five and twenty labouring millions, for instance, could get that haggardness of face which old Mirabeau now looks on in a nation calling itself Christian and calling man the brother of man, what unspeakable, nigh infinite dishonesty of seeming and not being in all manner of rulers and appointed watchers, spiritual and temporal, must there not through long ages have gone on accumulating? It will accumulate. Moreover, it will reach a head, for the first of all Gospels is this, that a lie cannot endure for ever. In fact, if we pierce through that rose-pink vapour of sentimentalism, philanthropy and feasts of morals, there lies behind it one of the sorriest spectacles. You might ask, what bonds that ever held a human society happily together, or held it together at all, are in force here? It is an unbelieving people, which has suppositions, hypotheses and froth systems of Victoria's analysis, and for belief this mainly, that pleasure is pleasant. Hunger they have for all sweet things, and the law of hunger, but what other law? Within them or over them? Properly, none. 
Their king has become a King Popinjay, with his Morapa government gyrating as the weathercock does, blown about by every wind. Above them they see no god, or they even do not look above except with astronomical glasses. The church indeed still is, but in the most submissive state, quite tamed by philosophism, in a singularly short time, for the hour was come. Some twenty years ago, your Archbishop Beaumont would not even let the poor Jansenists get buried. Your Lomini Brienne, a rising man whom we shall meet with yet, could, in the name of the clergy, insist on having the anti-Protestant laws which condemned to death for preaching put in execution. And alas, now not so much as Baron Holbach's atheism can be burnt, except as pipe matches by the private speculative individual. Our church stands halted, dumb, like a dumb ox, lowing only for provender of tithes, content if it can have that, or dumbly, dully, expecting its further doom. And the twenty millions of haggard faces, and as finger-post and guidance to them in their dark struggle, a gallows forty feet high? Certainly a singular golden age, with its fist of morals, its sweet manners, its sweet institutions, institution douce, betokening nothing but peace among men. Peace? Oh, philosophy sentimentalism, what hast thou to do with peace when thy mother's name is Jezebel? Foul product of still fouler corruption, thou with the corruption art doomed. Meanwhile, it is singular how long the rotten will hold together, provided you do not handle it roughly. For whole generations it continues standing, with a ghastly affectation of life, after all, life and truth have fled out of it, so loath are men to quit their old ways and conquering indolence and inertia venture on new. Great, truly, is the actual, is the thing that has rescued itself from bottomless deeps of theory and possibility and stands there as a definite, indisputable fact whereby men do work and live, or once did so. Widely shall men cleave to that, while it will endure, and quit it with regret when it gives way under them. Rash enthusiast of change, beware! Hast thou well considered all that habit does in this life of ours? How all knowledge and all practice hang wondrous over infinite abysses of the unknown, impracticable, and our whole being is an infinite abyss overarched by habit, as by a thin earth rind laboriously built together. But if every man, as it has been written, holds confined within him a madman, what must every society do, society which in its commonest state is called the standing miracle of this world? Without such earth rind of habit, continues our author, call it system of habits, in a word fixed ways of acting and of believing, society would not exist at all. With such it exists, better or worse. Herein too, in this its system of habits, acquired, retained, how you will, lies the true law code and constitution of a society, the only code, though an unwritten one, which it can in no wise disobey. The thing we call written code, constitution, form of government and the like, what is it but some miniature image and solemnly expressed summary of this unwritten code? Is, or rather, alas, is not, but only should be, and always tends to be, in which latter discrepancy lies struggle without end. And now we add in the same dialect, but let by ill chance in such ever-enduring struggle your thin earth rind be once broken, the fountains of the great deep boil forth, fire fountains enveloping, engulfing. Your earth rind is shattered, swallowed up. Instead of a green flowery world, there is a waste, wild, weltering chaos, which has again with tumult and struggle to make itself into a world. On the other hand, be this conceded, where thou findest a lie that is oppressing thee, extinguish it. Lies exist there only to be extinguished. They wait and cry earnestly for extinction. 
Think well, meanwhile, in what spirit thou wilt do it, not with hatred, with headlong self-violence, but in clearness of heart, with holy zeal, gently, almost with pity. Thou wouldst not replace such extinct lie by a new lie, which a new injustice of thy own were, the parent of still other lies, whereby the latter end of that business were worse than the beginning. So, however, in this world of ours, which has both an indestructible hope in the future and an indestructible tendency to persevere as in the past, must innovation and conservation wage their perpetual conflict as they may and can. Wherein the daimonic element that lurks in all human things may doubtless some once in a thousand years get vent. But indeed, may we not regret that such conflict, which after all is but like that classical one of hate-filled Amazons with heroic youths, and will end in embraces, should usually be so spasmodic? For conservation, strengthened by that mightiest quality in us, our indolence, sits for long ages, not victorious only, which she should be, but tyrannical, incommunicative. She holds her adversary as if annihilated, such adversary lying all the while like some buried Enceladus, who, to gain the smallest freedom, must stir a whole trinacria with it itness. Wherefore, on the whole, we will honour a paper age too, an era of hope. For in this same frightful process of Enceladus revolt, when the task on which no mortal would willingly enter has become imperative, inevitable, is it not even a kindness of nature that she lures us forward by cheerful promises, fallacious or not, and a whole generation plunges into the Erebus blackness lighted on by an era of hope? It has been well said, man is based on hope, he has properly no other possession but hope. This habitation of his is named the place of hope. End of Book 2 Chapter 3《The French Revolution — A History》by Thomas Carlyle, Volume 1 Book 2 — The Paper Age Chapter 4 — Maurepa This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan. Book 2 — Chapter 4 — Maurepa but now, among French hopes, is not that of old Monsieur de Maurepas one of the best grounded, who hopes that he, by dexterity, shall contrive to continue minister? Nimble old man, who for all emergencies has his light jest, and ever in the worst confusion will emerge cork-like, unsunk. Small care to him is perfectibility, progress of the species, and astraea redux, Good only that a man of light wit, verging towards fourscore, can, in the seat of authority, feel himself important among men. Shall we call him, as Horti Chateroux was wont of old, Monsieur Facquenet, diminutive of scoundrel? In court dialect he is now named the Nestor of France, such governing Nestor as France has. At bottom, nevertheless, it might puzzle one to say where the government of France in these days specially is. In that chateau of Versailles we have Nesta, King, Queen, ministers and clerks with paper bundles tied in tape, but the government? For government is a thing that governs, that guides, and if need be, compels. Visible in France there is not such a thing. Invisible, inorganic, on the other hand, there is, in philosophe salon, in oeil de boeuf galleries, in the tongue of the babbler, in the pen of the pamphleteer. Her Majesty, appearing at the opera, is applauded. She returns, all radiant with joy. Anon, the applauses wax fainter, or threaten to cease. She is heavy of heart. The light of her face has fled. Is sovereignty some poor Montgolfier, which, blown into by the popular wind, grows great and mounts, or sinks flaccid if the wind be withdrawn? France was long a despotism tempered by epigrams, and now, it would seem, the epigrams have got the upper hand. Happy were a young Louis the Desired to make France happy, if it did not prove too troublesome, and he only knew the way. 
but there is endless discrepancy around him, so many claims and clamours, a mere confusion of tongues. Not reconcilable by man, not manageable, suppressible, save by some strongest and wisest men, which only a lightly jesting, lightly gyrating Monsieur de Maurepas can so much as subsist amidst. Philosophism claims her new era, meaning thereby innumerable things, and claims it in no faint voice, for France at large, hitherto mute, is now beginning to speak also, and speaks in that same sense. A huge, many-toned sound, distant yet not unimpressive. On the other hand, the oeil de boeuf, which as nearest one can hear best, claims with shrill vehemence that the monarchy be, as heretofore, a horn of plenty, wherefrom loyal courtiers may draw to the just support of the throne. Let liberalism and a new era, if such is the wish, be introduced, only no curtailment of the royal monies, which latter condition, alas, is precisely the impossible one. Philosophism, as we saw, has got her turgo made controller-general, and there shall be endless reformation. Unhappily, this turgo could continue only twenty months. With a miraculous fortunatus purse in his treasury, it might have lasted longer. With such purse, indeed, every French controller-general that would prosper in these days ought first to provide himself. But here again, may we not remark the bounty of nature in regard to hope? Man after man advances confident to the Augean stable, as if he could clean it, expend his little fraction of an ability on it with such cheerfulness, does, in so far as he was honest, accomplish something. Turgo has faculties, honesty, insight, heroic volition, but the fortunatus purse he has not. Sanguine controller general. A whole pacific French revolution may stand schemed in the head of the thinker, but who shall pay the unspeakable indemnities that will be needed? Alas, far from that, on the very threshold of the business, he proposes that the clergy, the noblesse, the very parliament be subjected to taxes. One shriek of indignation and astonishment reverberates through all the chateau galleries. Monsieur de Maurepas has to gyrate. The poor king, who had written a few weeks ago, Il n'y a que vous et moi qui aimions le peuple. There is none but you and I that has the people's interest at heart. Must write now a dismissal, and let the French Revolution accomplish itself, pacifically or not, as it can. Hope, then, is deferred? Deferred, not destroyed or abated? Is not this, for example, our patriarch Voltaire, after long years of absence, revisiting Paris? With face shriveled to nothing, with huge peruke a la Louis XIV, which leaves only two eyes visible, glittering like carbuncles. The old man is here. What an outburst! Sneering Paris has suddenly grown reverent, devotional with hero worship. Nobles have disguised themselves as tavern waiters to obtain sight of him. The loveliest of France would lay their hair beneath his feet. His chariot is the nucleus of a comet whose train fills whole streets. They crown him in the theatre with immortal vivats, finally stifle him under roses. For old Richelieu recommended opium in such a state of the nerves, and the excessive patriarch took too much. Her Majesty herself had some thought of sending for him, but was dissuaded. Let Majesty consider it, nevertheless. The purport of this man's existence has been to wither up and annihilate all whereon Majesty and worship for the present rest, and is it so that the world recognises him? with apotheosis as its prophet and speaker, who has spoken wisely the thing it longed to say? Add only that the body of this same rose-stifled, beatified patriarch cannot get buried except by stealth. It is wholly a notable business, and France without doubt is big, what the Germans called of good hope. We shall wish her a happy birth hour and blessed fruit. Beaumarchais too has now winded up his law pleadings memoirs, not without result, to himself and to the world. 
Caron Beaumarchais, or de Beaumarchais, for he got ennobled, had been born poor, but aspiring Assyriant, with talents, audacity, adroitness, above all with the talent for intrigue, a lean but also a tough, indomitable man. Fortune and dexterity brought him to the harpsichord of Mesdames, our good Princess Locke, Grey, and Sisterhood. Still better, Paris Duvernier, the court banker, honoured him with some confidence to the length even of transactions in cash, which confidence, however, Duvernier's heir, a person of quality, would not continue. Quite otherwise, there springs a lawsuit from it, wherein tough Beaumarchais, losing both money and repute, is, in the opinion of Judge Reporter Goetzman of the Parliament Bopéo, of a whole indifferent acquiescing world, miserably beaten, in all men's opinions, only not in his own. Inspired by the indignation which makes, if not verses, satirical law papers, the withered music master, with a desperate heroism, takes up his lost cause in spite of the world, fights for it against reporters, parliament and principalities, with light banter, with clear logic, adroitly with an inexhaustible toughness and resource, like the skilfulest fencer, on whom so skilful is he the whole world now looks. Three long years it lasts with wavering fortune. In fine, after labours comparable to the Twelve of Hercules, our uncomparable Caron triumphs, regains his lawsuit and lawsuits, strips reporter Gertzman of the judicial ermine, covering him with a perpetual garment of obloquy instead, and in regard to the Parliament Mopio, which he has helped to extinguish, to Parliament of all kind and to French justice generally, gives rise to endless reflections in the minds of men. Thus has Beaumarchais, like a lean French Hercules, ventured down, driven by destiny, into the nether kingdoms, and victoriously tamed hell-dogs there. He also is henceforth among the notabilities of his generation. End of Book Two, Chapter Four The French Revolution, A History, by Thomas Carlyle Volume 1. Book 2. The Paper Age. Chapter 5. Astraea Redux Without Cash. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan. Book 2. Chapter 5. Astraea Redux Without Cash. Observe, however, beyond the Atlantic, has not the new day verily dawned? Democracy, as we said, is born, storm girt, is struggling for life and victory. A sympathetic France rejoices over the rights of man. In all saloons it is said, What a spectacle! Now too behold our Dean, our Franklin, American plenipotentiaries here in position soliciting. The sons of the Saxon Puritans with their old Saxon temper, old Hebrew culture, sleek Silas, sleek Benjamin, here on such errand among the light children of heathenism, monarchy, sentimentalism and the scarlet woman. A spectacle, indeed, over which saloons may cackle joyous, though Kaiser Joseph, questioned on it, gave this answer most unexpected from a philosophe. Madame, the trade I live by is that of royalist. Mon métier à moi, c'est d'être royaliste. So thinks light more apart, too. But the wind of philosophism and force of public opinion will blow him round. Best wishes, meanwhile, are sent, clandestine privateers armed. Paul Jones shall equip his bonhomme Richard. Weapons, military stores can be smuggled over if the English do not seize them, wherein, once more, Beaumarchais dimly as the giant smuggler becomes visible, filling his own lank pocket with all. But surely, in any case, France should have a navy. For which great object were not now the time, now when that proud termagant of the seas has her hands full? It is true, an impoverished treasury cannot build ships, but the hint once given, which Beaumarchais says he gave, this and the other loyal seaport chamber of commerce will build and offer them, goodly vessels bound into the waters, a ville de Paris, leviathan of ships. And now, when gratuitous three-deckers dance there at anchor with streamers flying, and eleutheromaniac philosophdom grows ever more clamorous, what can a Morapa do but gyrate? 
Squadrons crossed the ocean, gauges, lees, rough Yankee generals with woollen nightcaps under their hats present arms to the far-glancing chivalry of France and newborn democracy sees, not without amazement, despotism tempered by epigrams fight at her side. So, however it is, King's forces and heroic volunteers, Rochambeau, Bouillet, Lameth, Lafayette, have drawn their swords in this sacred quarrel of mankind, shall draw them again elsewhere in the strangest way. Off Ushant some naval thunder is heard, in the course of which did our young prince, Duke de Chartres, hide in the hold, or did he materially by active heroism contribute to the victory? Alas, by a second edition we learned that there was no victory, or that English Keppel had it. Our poor young prince gets his opera plaudits changed into mocking tees and cannot become Grand Admiral, the source to him of woes which one may call endless. Woe also for V de Paris, the leviathan of ships. English Rodney has clutched it and led it home with the rest. So successful was his new manoeuvre of breaking the enemy's line. It seems as if, according to Louis XV, France were never to have a navy. Brave Safran must return from Hyder Alley in the Indian waters with small result, yet with great glory for six non-defeats, which, indeed, with such seconding as he had, one may reckon heroic. Let the old sea hero rest now, honoured of France, in his native Savannes mountains. Send smoke, not of gunpowder, but mere culinary smoke, through the old chimneys of the castle of Jales, which one day in other hand shall have other fame. Brave La Peru shall by and by lift anchor on philanthropic voyage of discovery, for the king knows geography. But alas, also, this will not prosper. The brave navigator goes and returns not. The seekers search far seas for him in vain. He has vanished, trackless, into blue immensity, and only some mournful, mysterious shadow of him hovers long in all heads and hearts. Neither while the war yet lasts will Gibraltar surrender. Not though Creon, Association, with the ablest projectors extant, are there, and Prince Condé and Prince d'Artois have hastened to help. Wondrous leather-roofed floating batteries set afloat by French-Spanish Pac de Famaille gave gallant summons, to which nevertheless Gibraltar answers plutonically with mere torrents of red-hot iron, as if stone calpe had become a throat of the pit, and utters such a doomsblast of a no as all men must credit. And so, with this loud explosion, the noise of war has ceased. An age of benevolence may hope for ever. Our noble volunteers of freedom have returned to be her missionaries. Lafayette, as the matchless of his time, glitters in the Versailles Oe de Boeuf, has his bust set up in the Paris Hotel de Ville. Democracy stands inexpugnable, immeasurable, in her new world, has even a foot lifted towards the old, and our French finances, little strengthened by such work, are in no healthy way. What to do with the finances? This indeed is the great question. A small but most black weather symptom which no radiance of universal hope can cover. We saw Turgo cast forth from the controller ship with shrieks for want of a Fortunatus's purse. As little could Monsieur de Cluny manage the duty, or indeed do anything but consume his wages, attain a place in history where, as an ineffectual shadow, thou beholdest him still lingering, and let the duty manage itself. Did Genevieve's Necker possess such a purse, then? He possessed banker's skill, banker's honesty, credit of all kinds, for he had written academic prize essays, struggled for India companies, given dinner to philosophe, and realised a fortune in twenty years. He possessed further a taciturnity and solemnity of depth, or else of dullness, How singular for Saladon Gibbon, false swain as he had proved, whose father, keeping most probably his own gig, would not hear of such a union, to find now his forsaken Demoiselle Suchot sitting in the high places of the world as minister's madame, and Necker not jealous. A new young Demoiselle, one day to be famed as a madame and de stay, was romping about the knees of the decline and fall. 
The Lady Necker founds hospitals, gives solemn philosoph dinner parties to cheer her exhausted controller general. Strange things have happened. By clamour of philosophism, management of Marquis de Perse and poverty constraining even kings. And so Necker, Atlas-like, sustains the burden of the finances for five years long? Without wages, for he refused such, cheered only by public opinion and the ministering of his noble wife. With many thoughts in him, it is hoped, which however he is shy of uttering. His Comte Rendu, published by the royal permission, fresh sign of a new era, shows wonders which what but the genius of some Atlas Necker can prevent from becoming portents. In Necker's head, too, there is a whole Pacific French Revolution of its kind, and in that taciturn dull depth or deep dullness, ambition enough. Meanwhile, alas, his Fortunatus's purse turns out to be little other than the old Vectigal of parsimony. Nay, he too has to produce his schemes of taxing, clergy, noblesse to be taxed, provincial assemblies and the rest, like a mere turgot. The expiring Monsieur de Maurepas must gyrate one other time. Let Necker also depart, not unlamented. Great in a private station, Necker looks on from the distance, abiding his time. Eighty thousand copies of his new book, which he calls Administration des Finances, will be sold in a few days. He is gone, but shall return, and that more than once, borne by a whole shouting nation. Singular controller general of the finances, once clerk in Telusson's bank. End of Book 2 Chapter 5《The French Revolution — A History》by Thomas Carlyle, Volume 1 Book 2 — The Paper Age Chapter 6 — Windbags This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan. Book 2 — Chapter 6 — Windbags So much as the world in this its paper age or era of hope. Not without obstructions, war explosions, which, however, heard from such distance, are little other than a cheerful marching music. If, indeed, that dark living chaos of ignorance and hunger, five and twenty million strong under your feet, were to begin playing. For the present, however, consider Longchamp. Now, when Lent is ending and the glory of Paris and France has gone forth as in annual want, not to assist at Tenebris masses, but to sun itself and show itself and salute the young spring, Manifold, bright-tinted, glittering with gold, all through the Bois de Boulogne in long-drawn variegated rows like long-drawn living flower borders, tulips, dahlias, lilies of the valley, all in their moving flower-pots of new gilt carriages, pleasure of the eye and pride of life. So rolls and dances the procession, steady, a firm assurance, as if it rolled on adamant and the foundations of the world, not on mere heraldic parchment, under which smoulders a lake of fire. Dance on, ye foolish ones. Ye sought not wisdom, neither have ye found it. Ye and your fathers have sown the wind, ye shall reap the whirlwind. Was it not from of old written, the wages of sin is death? But at Longchamp, as elsewhere, we remark for one thing, that dame and cavalier are waited on each by a kind of human familiar named Jockey. Little elf or imp, though young, already withered, with its withered air of premature vice, of knowingness, of completed elfhood, useful in various emergencies. The name Jockey, Jockey, comes from the English, as the thing also fancies that it does. Our Anglomania, in fact, has grown considerable, prophetic of much. If France is to be free, why shall she not, now when mad war is hushed, love neighbouring freedom? Cultivated men, your Dukes de Lioncourt, de la Rochefoucauld, admire the English constitution, the English national character, would import what of it they can. Of what is lighter, especially if it be light as wind, how much easier the freightage. Non-admiral, Duc de Chartres, not yet d'Orléans or Egalité, flies to and fro across the strait, importing English fashions. 
this he, as hand and glove with an English Prince of Wales, is surely qualified to do. Carriages and saddles, top boots and redding coats, as we call riding coats. Nay, the very mode of riding, for now no man on a level with his age, but will trot a l'anglaise, rising in the stirrups, scornful of the old sit-fast method in which, according to Shakespeare, butter and eggs go to market. Also he can urge the fervid wheels, this brave chatter of ours. No whip in Paris is rasher and surer than the unprofessional one of Monseigneur. Elf jockeys we have seen, but now real Yorkshire jockeys, and what they ride on and train, English racers for French races. These likewise we owe first, under the providence of the devil, to Monseigneur. Prince d'Artois also has his stud of racers. Prince d'Artois has with all the strangest horse leech, a moonstruck, much enduring individual of Neuchâtel in Switzerland, named Jean Paul Marat. A problematic Chevalier d'Eon, now in petticoats, now in breeches, is no less problematic in London than in Paris, and causes bets and lawsuits. Beautiful days of international communion. Swindlery and blackguardism have stretched hands across the channel and saluted mutually. On the racecourse of Vincennes or Sablon, behold, in English curricle and four, wafted glorious among the principalities and rascalities, an English Dr. Dodd, for whom also the two early gallows gapes. Duke de Chartres was a young prince of great promise, as young princes often are, which promise, unfortunately, has belied itself. With the huge Orléans property, with the Duke de Pontrièvre for father-in-law, and now the young brother-in-law Lambal killed by excesses, he will one day be the richest man in France. Meanwhile, his hair is all falling out, his blood is quite spoiled by early transcendentalism of debauchery. Carbuncles stud his face, dark studs on a ground of burnished copper. A most signal failure, this young prince. The stuff prematurely burnt out of him, little left but foul smoke and ashes of expiring sensualities. What might have been thought, insight and even conduct, gone now or fast going, to confuse a darkness, broken by bewildering dazzlements, to obstreperous crotchets, to activities which you may call semi-delirious or even semi-galvanic. Paris affects to laugh at his charioteering, but he heeds not such laughter. On the other hand, what a day not of laughter was that when he threatened for Lucas' sake to lay sacrilegious hands on the Palais Royal Garden. The flower parterre shall be riven up, the chestnut avenue shall fall, time-honoured boscages under which the opera hammer dryads were wont to wander, not inexorable to men. Paris moans aloud. Philidor from his Café de la Régence shall no longer look on greenness. The lounges and losels of the world where now shall they haunt. In vain is mosing, the axe glitters, the sacred groves fall crashing, for indeed Monseigneur was short of money. The opera hammy dryads fly with shrieks. Shriek not, ye opera hammer dryads, or not as those that have no comfort. He will surround your garden with new edifices and piazzas, though narrowed it shall be replanted, dizened with hydraulic jets, cannon which the sun fires at noon, things bodily, things spiritual, such as man has not imagined. And in the Palais Royal shall again, and more than ever, be the sorcerer's Sabbath and Satan at home of our planet. What will not mortals attempt? From remote Annonay in the Vivere, the brothers Montgolfier send up their paper dome filled with the smoke of burnt wool. The Vivere Provincial Assembly is to be prorogued this same day. Vivere Assembly members applaud and the shouts of congregated men. Will victorious analysis scale the very heavens then? Paris hears with eager wonder. Paris shall ere long see. From Réveillon's paper warehouse there in the Rue Saint-Antoine, a noted warehouse, the new Montgolfier airship launches itself. Ducks and poultry are born skyward, but now shall men be born. Nay, chemist Charles thinks of hydrogen and glazed silk. Chemist Charles will himself ascend from the Tuileries garden, Montgolfier solemnly cutting the cord. 
By heaven, he also mounts, he and another? Ten times ten thousand hearts go palpitating, all tongues are mute with wonder and fear, till a shout like the voice of seas rolls after him on his wild way. He soars, he dwindles upwards, has become a mere gleaming circlet, like some turgotine snuff-box, what we call turgotine platitude, like some new daylight moon. Finally he descends, welcomed by the universe. Duchess Polignac with a party is in the Bois de Boulogne, waiting, though it's drizzly winter, the 1st of December, 1783. The whole chivalry of France, Duke de Chartres foremost, gallops to receive him. Beautiful invention, mounting heavenward so beautifully, so unguidably. Emblem of March and our age of hope itself, which shall mount specifically light, majestically in this same manner, and hover, tumbling with a fate will. Well, if it do not, Pilatre-like explode, and demount all the more tragically. So, riding on windbags, will men scale the Empyrean. Or observe Herr Dr. Mesmer in his spacious magnetic halls, Long stoled he walks, reverend, glancing upwards as in rapt commerce, an antique Egyptian hierophant in this new age. Soft music flits, breaking fitfully the sacred stillness. Round their magnetic mystery, which to the eye is mere tubs with water, sit breathless, rod in hand, the circles of beauty and fashion, each circle a living, circular passion flower, expecting the magnetic afflatus and new manufactured heaven on earth. O oh, women, O oh, men, great is your infidel faith, a parliamentary Duport, a Burgas d'Espremenil, we notice there, chemist Berthelet, too, on the part of Monsignor de Chartres. Had not the Academy of Sciences, with its Bayes, Franklins, Lavoisiers, interfered? But it did interfere. Mesmer may pocket his hard money and withdraw. Let him walk silent by the shore of the Bodensi, by the ancient town of Constance, meditating on much. For so, under the strangest new vesture, the old great truth, since no vesture can hide it, begins again to be revealed, that man is what we call a miraculous creature with miraculous power over men, and on the whole with such a life in him and such a world round him as victorious analysis with her physiologies, nervous systems, physic and metaphysic will never completely name, to say nothing of explaining. Wherein also the quack shall, in all ages, come in for his share. End of Book 2, Chapter 6《The French Revolution》A History by Thomas Carlyle, Volume 1 Book 2, The Paper Age, Chapter 7, Contra Social This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan. Book 2, Chapter 7, Contra Social In such succession of singular prismatic tints, flush after flush suffusing our horizon, does the era of hope dawn on towards fulfilment. Questionable. As indeed, with an era of hope that rests on mere universal benevolence, victorious analysis, vice cured of its deformity, and in the long run on twenty-five dark savage millions looking up in hunger and weariness to that ecce signum of theirs forty feet high, how could it be but questionable? Through all time, if we read aright, Sin was, is, will be, the parent of misery. This land calls itself most Christian, and has crosses and cathedrals. But its high priest is some Roche Amon, some necklace cardinal Louis de Rohan. The voice of the poor through long years ascends inarticulate in jacquerie, meal mobs, low whimpering of infinite moan, unheeded of the earth, not unheeded of heaven. Always, moreover, where the millions are wretched, there are the thousands straitened, unhappy. Only the units can flourish, or, say, rather, be ruined the last. 
Industry all noosed and halted, as if it too were some beast of chase for the mighty hunters of this world to bait and cut slices from, cries passionately to these its well-paid guides and watchers, not guide me, but laissez-faire, leave me alone of your guidance. What market has industry in this France? For two things there may be market and demand, for the coarser kind of field fruit, since the millions will live, for the fine kind of luxury and spicery, of multiform taste, from opera melodies down to races and courtesans, since the units will be amused. It is at bottom but a mad state of things. To mend and remake all which we have indeed victorious analysis. Honour to victorious analysis. Nevertheless, out of workshop and laboratory, what thing was victorious analysis yet known to make? Detection of incoherences mainly. Destruction of the incoherent. From of old, doubt was but half a magician. She evokes the spectres which she cannot quell. We shall have endless vortices of froth logic whereon first words and then things are whirled and swallowed. Remark, accordingly, as acknowledged grounds of hope, at bottom mere precursors of despair, this perpetual theorising about man, the mind of man, philosophy of government, progress of the species and such like, the main thinking furniture of every head. Time and so many Montesquieu's, Mabley's, spokesmen of time have discovered innumerable things and now has not Jean-Jacques promulgated his new evangel of a contrat social explaining the whole mystery of government and how it is contracted and bargained for to universal satisfaction? Theories of government, such have been and will be in ages of decadence. Acknowledge them in their degree as processes of nature who does nothing in vain as steps in her great process. Meanwhile, what theory is so certain as this, that all theories, were they never so earnest, painfully elaborated, are, and by the very conditions of them, must be incomplete, questionable, and even false? Thou shalt know that this universe is what it professes to be, an infinite one. Attempt not to swallow it for thy logical digestion. Be thankful if skilfully planting down this and the other fixed pillar in the chaos, thou prevent it swallowing thee. That a new young generation has exchanged the sceptic creed, what shall I believe, for passionate faith in this gospel according to Jean-Jacques, is a further step in the business, and but tokens much. Blessed also is hope, and always from the beginning there was some millennium prophesied, millennium of holiness, but what is notable, never till this new era, any millennium of mere ease and plentiful supply. In such prophesied lubber land of happiness, benevolence, and vice cured of its deformity, trust not, my friends. Man is not what one calls a happy animal. His appetite for sweet victual is so enormous. How, in this wild universe which storms in on him, infinite, vague menacing, shall poor man find, say not happiness, but existence and footing to stand on, if it be not by girding himself together for continual endeavour and endurance? Woe if in his heart there dwelt no devout faith, if the word duty had lost its meaning for him. For as to this of sentimentalism, so useful for weeping with over romances and on pathetic occasions, it otherwise verily will avail nothing, nay less. The healthy heart that said to itself, how healthy am I, was already fallen into the fatalist sort of disease. Is not sentimentalism twin sister to Kant, if not one and the same with it? Is not Kant the materia prima of the devil, from which all falsehoods, imbecilities, abominations body themselves, from which no true thing can come? For Kant is itself properly a double distilled lie, the second power of a lie. And now, if a whole nation fall into that, in such case, I answer, infallibly they will return out of it, for life is no cunningly devised deception or self-deception. It is a great truth that thou art alive, that thou hast desires, necessities. Neither can these subsist and satisfy themselves on delusions, 
but on fact. To fact, depend on it, we shall come back to such fact, blessed or cursed, as we have wisdom for. The lowest, least blessed fact one knows of, on which necessitous mortals have ever based themselves, seems to be the primitive one of cannibalism, that I can devour thee. What if such primitive fact were precisely the one we had with our improved methods to revert to and begin anew from? End of Book 2, Chapter 7《The French Revolution — A History》by Thomas Carlyle, Volume 1 Book 2 — The Paper Age Chapter 8 — Printed Paper This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan. Book 2 — Chapter 8 — Printed Paper in such a practical France, let the theory of perfectibility say what it will, discontents cannot be wanting. Your promised reformation is so indispensable, yet it comes not. Who will begin it with himself? Discontent with what is around us, still more with what is above us, goes on increasing, seeking ever new events. Of street ballads, of epigrams that, from of old-tempered despotism, we need not speak. Nor of manuscript newspapers, nouvelles à la main, do we speak. Bachaumont and his journeymen and followers may close those thirty volumes of scurrilous eavesdropping and quit that trade, for at length, if not liberty of the press, there is licence. Pamphlets can be surreptitiously vended and read in Paris. Did they even bear to be printed at Peking? We have a courier de l'Europe in those years, regularly published at London, by a de Morand whom the guillotine has not yet devoured. There, too, an unruly langue still unguillotined, when his own country has become too hot for him and his brother advocates have cast him out, can emit his hoarse wailings, and Bastille de Voile, Bastille unveiled. Loquacious Abbe Ranal at length has his wish, sees the histoire philosophique with its lubricity, unveracity, loose, loud, eleutheromaniac rant, contributed, they say, by philosopherdom at large, though in the Abbe's name and to his glory, burnt by the common hangman, and sets out on his travels as a martyr. It was the edition of 1781, perhaps the last notable book that had such fire beatitude, the hangman discovering now that it did not serve. Again, in courts of law, with their money quarrels, divorce cases, wheresoever a glimpse into the household existence can be had, what indications? The Parlement of Bessinson and I ring, audible to all France, with the amours and destinies of a young Mirabeau. He, under the nurture of a friend of men, has in state prisons, in marching regiments, Dutch authors, garrets and quite other scenes, been for twenty years learning to resist despotism. Despotism of men and also of gods. How beneath this rose-coloured veil of universal benevolence and astraea redux is the sanctuary of home so often a dreary void or a dark contentious hell on earth. The old friend of men has his own divorce case too, and at times his whole family but one under lock and key. He writes much about reforming and enfranchising the world, and for his own private behoof he has needed sixty lettres de cachet. A man of insight too, with resolution, even with manful principle, but in such an element, inward and outward, which he could not rule, but only madden. Edacity, rapacity, quite contrary to the finest sensibility of the heart. Fools that expect your verdant millennium and nothing but love and abundance, brooks running wine, winds whispering music, with the whole ground and basis of your existence champed into a mud of sensuality, which daily growing deeper will soon have no bottom but the abyss. Or consider that unutterable business of the diamond necklace. 
red-hatted Cardinal Louis de Rohan, Sicilian jailbird Balsamo Cagliostro, milliner Dame de la Motte with a face of some piquancy, the highest church dignitaries waltzing in Walpurgis dance with quack prophets, pick purses and public women, a whole Satan's invisible world displayed, working there continually under the daylight visible one, the smoke of its torment going up forever. The throne has been brought into scandalous collision with the treadmill. Astonished Europe rings with the mystery for ten months, sees only lie unfold itself from lie, corruption among the lofty and the low, gulosity, credulity, imbecility, strength nowhere but in the hunger. Weep, fair queen, thy first tears of unmixed wretchedness. Thy fair name has been tarnished by foul breath, irremediably while life lasts. No more shalt thou be loved and pitied by living hearts, till a new generation has been born, and thy own heart lies cold, cured of all its sorrows. The epigrams henceforth become not sharp and bitter, but cruel, atrocious, unmentionable. On that 31st of May, 1786, a miserable Cardin Grand Almoner Rohan, on issuing from his Bastille, is escorted by hurrahing crowds, unloved he and worthy of no love, but important since the court and queen are his enemies. How is our bright era of hope dimmed, and the whole sky growing bleak with signs of hurricane and earthquake? It is a doomed world, gone all obedience that made men free, fast going the obedience that made men slaves, at least to one another. Slaves only of their own lusts they now are and will be, slaves of sin, inevitably also of sorrow. Behold the mouldering mass of sensuality and falsehood, round which plays foolishly, itself a corrupt phosphorescence, some glimmer of sentimentalism, and over all, rising as ark of their covenant, the grim patibulary fork, forty feet high, which also is now nigh rotted. Add only that the French nation distinguishes itself among nations by the characteristic of excitability with the good but also with the perilous evil which belongs to that. Rebellion, explosion of unknown extent is to be calculated on. There are, as Chesterfield wrote, all the symptoms I have ever met with in history. Shall we say then, woe to philosophism, that it destroyed religion, what it called extinguishing the abomination, écrasé l'infâme. Woe rather to those that made the holy an abomination and extinguishable. Woe at all men that live in such a time of world abomination and world destruction. Nay, answer the couriers, it was Turgo, it was Necker, with their mad innovating. It was the Queen's want of etiquette. It was he, it was she, it was that. Friends, it was every scoundrel that had lived and quack-like pretended to be doing and been only eating and misdoing in all provinces of life as shoeblack or as sovereign lord, each in his degree from the time of Charlemagne and earlier. All this, for be sure no falsehood perishes but is as seed sown out to grow, has been storing itself for thousands of years and now the account day has come and rude will the settlement be of wrath laid up against the day of wrath. O oh, my brother, be not thou a quack. Die rather, if thou wilt take counsel. Tis but dying once, and thou art quit of it for ever. Cursed is that trade, and bears curses. Thou knowest not how, long ages after thou art departed, and the wages thou hadst are all consumed. Nay, as the ancient wise have written, through eternity itself, and is verily marked in the doom-book of a god. Hope deferred maketh the heart sick. And yet, as we said, hope is but deferred, not abolished, not abolishable. It is very notable and touching how this same hope does still light onwards the French nation through all its wild destinies. For we shall still find hope shining, be it for fond invitation, be it for anger and menace, as a mild heavenly light it shone, as a red conflagration it shines, burning sulphurous blue through darkest regions of terror 
it still shines, and goes sent out at all, since desperation itself is a kind of hope. Thus is our era still to be named of hope, though in the saddest sense, when there is nothing left but hope. But if anyone would know summarily what a Pandora's box lies there for the opening, he may see it in what by its nature is the symptom of all symptoms, the surviving literature of the period. Abbe Reynal, with his lubricity and loud, loose rant, has spoken his word, and already the fast-hastening generation responds to another. Glance at Beaumarchais's marriage to Figaro, which now, in 1784, after difficulty enough, has issued on the stage and runs its hundred nights to the admiration of all men. By what virtue or internal vigour it so ran, the reader of our day will rather wonder, and indeed will know so much the better, that it flattered some pruriency of the time, that it spoke what all were feeling and longing to speak. Small substance in that Figaro, thin wire-drawn intrigues, thin wire-drawn sentiments and sarcasms, a thing lean, barren, yet which winds and whisks itself as through a wholly mad universe, adroitly with a high-sniffing air, wherein each, as was hinted, which is the grand secret, may see some image of himself and of his own state and ways. So it runs its hundred nights, and all France runs with it, laughing applause. If the soliloquizing barber asks, What has your lordship done to earn all this? and can only answer, You took the trouble to be born. Vous vous êtes donné la peine de naître. All men must laugh, and a gay horse-racing Anglo-maniac noblesse loudest of all. For how can small books have a great danger in them, asks the Sieur Caron, and fancies his thin epigram may be a kind of reason. Conqueror of a golden fleece by giant smuggling, tamer of hell-dogs in the Parlement Montpio, and finally crowned Orpheus in the Théâtre Francais, Beaumarchais has now culminated and unites the attributes of several demigods. We shall meet him once again in the course of his decline. Still more significant are two books produced on the eve of the ever-memorable explosion itself and read eagerly by all the world. Saint Pierre Paul et Virginie and Louvet's Chevalier de Faublet. Noteworthy books which may be considered as the last speech of old feudal France. In the first there rises melodiously, as it were, the wail of a moribund world, everywhere wholesome nature in unequal conflict with disease perfidious art cannot escape from it in the lowest hut in the remotest island of the sea. Ruin and death must strike down the loved one, and what is most significant of all, death even here, not by necessity, but by etiquette. What a world of prurient corruption lies visible in that super-sublime of modesty. Yet, on the whole, our good Saint-Pierre is musical, poetical, though most morbid. We will call his book The Swan Song of Old Dying France. Louvet's again let no man account musical. Truly, if this wretched faubla is a death speech, it is one under the gallows and by a felon that does not repent. Wretched cloaca of a book, without depth even as a cloaca. What picture of French society is here? Picture, properly, of nothing, if not of the mind that gave it out as some sort of picture, yet symptom of much, above all, of the world that could nourish itself thereon. End of book two. Chapter 8「The French Revolution: A History by Thomas Carlyle, Volume 1. Book 3: The Parliament of Paris. Chapter 1: Dishonored Bills. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain, read by Peter Dan. Book 3, Chapter 1: Dishonored Bills. While the unspeakable confusion is everywhere weltering within and through so many cracks in the surface sulphur smoke is issuing, the question arises, through what crevice will the main explosion carry itself? Through which of the old craters or chimneys, or must it at once form a new crater for itself? 
In every society are such chimneys, are institutions serving as such. Even Constantinople is not without its safety valves. There, too, discontent can vent itself in material fire. By the number of nocturnal conflagrations or of hanged bakers, the reigning powers can read the signs of the times and change course according to these. We may say that this French explosion will doubtless first try all the old institutions of escape, for by each of these there is, or at least there used to be, some communication with the interior deep. They are national institutions in virtue of that. Had they even become personal institutions, and what we can call choked up from their original uses, there, nevertheless, must the impediment be weaker than elsewhere. Through which of them, then? An observer might have guessed through the law parlement, above all through the parlement of Paris. Men, though never so thickly clad in dignity, sit not inaccessible to the influences of their time, especially men whose life is business, who at all turns, were it even from behind judgment seats, have come in contact with the actual workings of the world. The councillor of Parliament, the President himself, who has bought his place with hard money that he might be looked up to by his fellow creatures, how shall he, in all philosophic soirees and saloons of elegant culture, become notable as a friend of darkness? Among the Paris long robes there may be more than one patriotic malécherbe whose rule is conscience and the public good. There are clearly more than one hot-headed Despremenil to whose confused thought any loud reputation of the brutus sort may seem glorious. The Le Pelletier, Le Moignons, have titles and wealth, yet at court are only styled noblesse of the robe. There are Duport of deep scheme, Freto, Sebatier of incontinent tongue, all nursed more or less on the milk of the contrat social. Nay, for the whole body, is not this patriotic opposition also a fighting for oneself? Awake, Parliament of Paris, renew thy long warfare. Was not the Parliament Maupeo abolished with ignominy? Not now hast thou to dread a Louis fourteen with the crack of his whip and his Olympian looks. Not now a Richelieu and Bastillon. No, the whole nation is behind thee. Thou too, O oh heavens, mayst become a political power, and with the shakings of thy horsehair wig shake principalities and dynasties like a very jove with his ambrosial curls. Light old Monsieur de Maurepas, since the end of 1781, has been fixed in the frost of death. Nevermore, said the good Louis, shall I hear his step overhead. His light jestings and gyratings are at an end. No more can the importunate reality be hidden by pleasant wit, and today's evil be deftly rolled over upon tomorrow. The morrow itself has arrived, and now nothing but a solid, phlegmatic Monsieur de Vergen sits there in dull matter-of-fact, like some dull, punctual clerk, which he originally was, admits what cannot be denied, let the remedy come whence it will. In him is no remedy, only clerk-like dispatch of business according to routine. The poor king, grown older, yet hardly more experienced, must himself, with such no faculty as he has, begin governing, wherein also his queen will give help. Bright queen, with her quick, clear glances and impulses, clear and even noble, but all too superficial, vehement, shallow for that work. To govern France was such a problem, and now it has grown well nigh too hard to govern even the Oye de Boeuf. For if a distressed people has its cry, so likewise, and more audibly, has a bereaved court. To the Oye de Boeuf it remains inconceivable how, in a France of such resources, the horn of plenty should run dry. Did it not used to flow? Nevertheless, Necker, with his revenue of parsimony, has suppressed above six hundred places. Before the courtiers could oust him, parsimonious finance pedant as he was. Again, a military pedant, Saint-Germain, with his Prussian manoeuvres, with his Prussian notions, as if merit and not coat of arms should be the rule of promotion, has disaffected military men. The mousquetaires with much else are suppressed, for he too was one of your suppressors, and unsettling and oversetting did mere mischief to the oeil de boeuf. 
complaints abound, scarcity, anxiety. It is a changed oil de boeuf. Bessonville says, already in these years, 1781, there was such a melancholy, such a tristesse about court compared with former days as made it quite dispiriting to look upon. No wonder that the oil de boeuf feels melancholy when you are suppressing its places. Not a place can be suppressed, but some purse is the lighter for it, and more than one heart the heavier, for did it not employ the working classes too? manufacturers, male and female, of laces, essences, of pleasure generally. Whosoever could manufacture pleasure. Miserable economies never felt over twenty-five millions. So, however, it goes on and is not yet ended. Few years more and the wolfhounds shall fall suppressed and bearhounds, the falconry, places shall fall thick as autumnal leaves. Duke de Polignac demonstrates to the complete silencing of ministerial logic that his place cannot be abolished. Then, gallantly turning to the Queen, surrenders it, since Her Majesty so wishes. Less chivalrous was Duke de Quigny, and not yet luckier. We got into a real quarrel, Quigny and I, said King Louis, but if he had even struck me, I could not have blamed him. In regard to such matters, there can be but one opinion. Baron Bessonval, with that frankness of speech which stamps the independent man, plainly assures Her Majesty that it is frightful, affreux. You go to bed and are not sure, but you shall rise impoverished on the morrow. One might as well be in Turkey. It is, indeed, a dog's life. How singular this perpetual distress of the royal treasury. And yet it is a thing not more incredible than undeniable. A thing mournfully true, the stumbling block on which all ministers successively stumble and fall. Be it want of fiscal genius or some far other want, there is a palpablest discrepancy between revenue and expenditure. A deficit of the revenue, you must choke comblia, the deficit, or else it will swallow you. This is the stern problem, hopeless seemingly, a squaring of the circle. Controller Jolie de Fleury, who succeeded Necker, could do nothing with it, nothing but propose loans which were tardily filled up, impose new taxes unproductive of money, productive of clamour and discontent. As little could Controller Dormesson do, or even less, for if Jolie maintained himself beyond year and day, Dormesson reckons only by months, till the king purchased Rambouillet without consulting him, which he took as a hint to withdraw. And so, towards the end of 1783, matters threatened to come to still stand. Vain seems human ingenuity. In vain has our newly devised Council of Finances struggled. A intendant of finance, controller general of finances. There are unhappily no finances to control. Fatal paralysis invades the social movement. Clouds of blindness or of blackness envelop us. Are we breaking down, then, into the black horrors of national bankruptcy? Great is bankruptcy, the great bottomless pit into which all falsehoods, public and private, do sink, disappearing. Whither, from the first origin of them, they were all doomed. For nature is true, and not a lie. No lie you can speak or act, but it will come after longer or shorter circulation like a bill drawn on nature's reality and be presented there for payment, with the answer, no effects. Pity only that it often had so long a circulation that the original forger was so seldom he who bore the final smart of it. Lies and the burden of evil they bring are passed on, shifted from back to back and from rank to rank, and so land ultimately on the dumbest lowest rank, who with spade and mattock, with sore heart and empty wallet, daily come in contact with reality and can pass the cheat no further. Observe, nevertheless, how, by a just compensating law, if the lie with its burden in this confused whirlpool of society sinks and is shifted ever downwards, then in return the distress of it rises ever upwards and upwards. 
whereby, after the long pining and demi-starvation of those twenty millions, a Duc de Coigny and his majesty come also to have their real quarrel. Such is the law of just nature, bringing, though at long intervals, and were it only by bankruptcy, matters round again to the mark. But with a Fortunatus's purse in his pocket, through what length of time might not almost any falsehood last? Your society, your household, practical or spiritual arrangement is untrue, unjust, offensive to the eye of God and man. Nevertheless, its hearth is warm, its larder well replenished. The innumerable Swiss of heaven, with a kind of natural loyalty, gather round it, will prove by pamphleteering, musketeering, that it is a truth, or if not an unmixed, unearthly impossible truth, then better a wholesomely attempered one as wind is to the shorn lamb, and works well. Changed outlook, however, when purse and larder grow empty. Was your arrangement so true, so accordant to nature's ways? Then how in the name of wonder has nature, with her infinite bounty, come to leave it famishing there? To all men, to all women, and all children, it is now indutiable that your arrangement was false. Honour to bankruptcy, ever righteous on the great scale, though in detail it is so cruel. Under all falsehoods it works, unweariedly mining. No falsehood did it rise heaven high and cover the world, but bankruptcy one day will sweep it down and make us free of it. End of Book 3, Chapter 1《The French Revolution》A History by Thomas Carlyle, Volume 1 Book 3, The Parliament of Paris Chapter 2, Controller Cologne This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan. Book 3, Chapter 2, Controller Cologne Under such circumstances of tristesse, obstruction and sick languor, when to an exasperated court it seems as if fiscal genius had departed from among men, what apparition could be welcomer than that of Monsieur de Calonne? Calonne, a man of indisputable genius, even fiscal genius more or less, of experience both in managing finance and parliaments, for he has been intendant at Metz, at Lille, king's procureur at Douar, a man of weight, connected with the moneyed classes, of unstained name, if it were not some peccadillo of showing a client's letter in that old Dagon la Chalotte business, as good as forgotten now. He has kinsmen of heavy purse, felt on the stock exchange. Our Foulon, Bertier, intrigue for him, old Foulon, who has now nothing to do but intrigue, who is known and even seen to be what they call a scoundrel, but of unmeasured wealth who, from commissariat clerk, which he once was, may hope some think, if the game go right, to be minister himself one day. Such propping and backing has Monsieur de Calon, and then, intrinsically, such qualities. Hope radiates from his face, persuasion hangs on his tongue. For all straits he has present remedy, and will make the world roll on wheels before him. On the 3rd of November, 1783, the Oye de Boeuf rejoices in its new controller-general. Colon also shall have trial. Colon also, in his way, as Turgo and Necker had done in theirs, shall forward the consummation, suffuse with one other flush of brilliancy our now too leaden-coloured era of hope, and wind it up into fulfilment. Great, in any case, is the felicity of the Oye de Boeuf. Stinginess has fled from these royal abodes. Suppression ceases. Your Bessonval may go peaceably to sleep, sure that he shall awake unplundered. Smiling plenty, as if conjured by some enchanter, has returned, scatters contentment from her new flowing horn. And mark what suavity of manners. A bland smile distinguishes our controller. To all men he listens with an air of interest, nay, of anticipation, makes their own wish clear to themselves and grants it, or at least grants conditional promise of it. I fear this is a matter of difficulty, said Her Majesty. Madame, answered the controller, if it is but difficult, it is done. 
If it is impossible, it shall be done. Sephara. A man of such facility withal, to observe him in the pleasure vortex of society, which none partakes of with more gusto, you might ask, when does he work? And yet his work, as we see, is never behindhand, above all, the fruit of his work, ready money. Truly a man of incredible facility, facile action, facile elocution, facile thought. How, in mild suasion, philosophic depth sparkles up from him as mere wit and lambent sprightliness, and in her majesty's soirees, with the weight of a world lying on him, he is the delight of men and women. By what magic does he accomplish miracles? By the only true magic, that of genius. Men name him the minister, as indeed, when was there another such? Crooked things are become straight by him, rough places plain, and over the oid birth there rests an unspeakable sunshine. Nay, in seriousness, let no man say that Calan had not genius, genius for persuading before all things, for borrowing. With the skilfulest judicious appliances of underhand money, he keeps the stock exchanges flourishing, so that loan after loan is filled up as soon as opened. Calculators likely to know have calculated that he spent in extraordinaries at the rate of one million daily, which indeed is some fifty thousand pounds sterling. But did he not procure something with it, namely peace and prosperity for the time being? Philosoph dumb grumbles and croaks, buys, as we said, 80,000 copies of Necker's new book, but Nompareil Calan, in Her Majesty's apartment, with the glittering retinue of dukes, duchesses and mere happy admiring faces, can let Necker and philosophdom croak. The misery is such a time cannot last. Squandering and payment by loan is no way to choke a deficit. Neither is oil the substance for quenching conflagrations, but only for assuaging them, not permanently. To the non himself, who wants not insight, it is clear at intervals and dimly certain at all times that his trade is by nature temporary, growing daily more difficult, that changes incalculable lie at no great distance. Apart from financial deficit, the world is wholly in such a newfangled humour, all things working loose from their old fastenings towards new issues and combinations. There is not a dwarf jockey, a cropped brutus head, or anglomaniac horseman rising on his stirrups that does not betoken change. But what then? The day, in any case, passes pleasantly. For the morrow, if the morrow come, there shall be counselled too. Once mounted by munificence, suasion, magic of genius, high enough in favour with the oye de boeuf, with the king, queen, stock exchange, and so far as possible with all men, a non pareil controller may hope to go careering through the inevitable in some unimagined way as handsomely as another. At all events, for these three miraculous years, it has been expedient heaped on expedient till now, with such cumulation and height, the pile topples perilous. And here has this world's wonder of a diamond necklace brought it at last to the clear verge of tumbling. Genius in that direction can no more. Mounted high enough or not mounted, we must fare forth. Hardly is poor Rohan, the necklace cardinal, safely bestowed in the Auvergne Mountains, Dame de la Motte unsafely in the Salpetriere, and that mournful business hushed up, when our sanguine controller once more astonishes the world. An expedient unheard of for these hundred and sixty years has been propounded, and by dint of suasion, for his light audacity, his hope and eloquence are matchless, has been got adopted. Convocation of the Notables Let notable persons, the actual or virtual rulers of their district, be summoned from all sides of France. Let a true tale of His Majesty's patriotic purposes and wretched pecuniary impossibilities be suasively told them, and then the question put, what are we to do? Surely to adopt 
healing measures, such as the magic of genius will unfold, such as one sanctioned by notables, all parliament, and all men must, with more or less reluctance, submit to. End of Book 3, Chapter 2《The French Revolution》A History by Thomas Carlyle, Volume 1 Book 3, The Parliament of Paris Chapter 3, The Notables This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan Book 3, Chapter 3, The Notables Here, then, is verily a sign and wonder, visible to the whole world, bodeful of much. The Oie de Boeuf dolorously grumbles. Were we not well as we stood, quenching conflagrations by oil? Constitutional philosophedom starts with joyful surprise, stares eagerly what the result will be. The public creditor, the public debtor, the whole thinking and thoughtless public have their several surprises, joyful and sorrowful. Count Mirabeau, who has got his matrimonial and other lawsuits huddled up, better or worse, and works now in the dimmest element at Berlin, compiling Prussian monarchies, pamphlets on Cagliostro, writing with pay, but not with honourable recognition, innumerable dispatches for his government, scents, or decries, richer quarry from afar. He, like an eagle or vulture, or mixture of both, preens his wings for flight homewards. Monsieur de Calonne has stretched out an Aaron's rod over France, miraculous, and is summoning quite unexpected things. Audacity and hope alternate in him with misgivings, though the sanguine valiant side carries it. Anon, he writes to an intimate friend, Je me fais pitié et moi-même. I am an object of pity to myself. Anon invites some dedicating poet or poetaster to sing this assembly of the notables and the revolution that is preparing. Preparing indeed, and a matter to be sung, only not till we have seen it and what the issue of it is. In deep, obscure unrest, all things have so long gone rocking and swaying. Will Monsieur de Calonne, with this his alchemy of the notables, fasten all together again and get new revenues? or wrench all asunder, so that it go no longer rocking and swaying, but clashing and colliding. Be this as it may, in the bleak short days we behold men of weight and influence threading the great vortex of French locomotion, each on his several line from all sides of France towards the chateau of Versailles, summoned thither de par le roi. There, on the 22nd day of February, 1787, they have met and got installed, notables to the number of 137, as we count them name by name. Add seven princes of the blood, it makes the round gross of notables. Men of the sword, men of the robe, peers, dignified clergy, parliamentary presidents, divided into seven boards, bureau, under our seven princes of the blood, Monsieur, Datois, Pontievre, and the rest, amongst whom let not our new Duke d'Orléans, for since 1785 he is Chartres no longer, be forgotten. Never yet made admiral, and now turning the corner of his fortieth year, with spoiled blood and prospects, half weary of a world which is more than half weary of him, Monseigneur's future is most questionable. Not in illumination and insight, not even in conflagration, but, as was said, in dull smoke and ashes of outburnt sensualities, does he live and digest. Sumptuosity and sordidness, revenge, life weariness, ambition, darkness, putrescence, and say in sterling money three hundred thousand a year, were this poor prince once to burst loose from his court moorings, to what regions, with what phenomena, might he not sail and drift? Happily as yet, he affects to hunt daily, sits there since he must sit, presiding that bureau of his with dull moon visage, dull glassy eyes, as if it were a mere tedium to him. We observe, finally, that Count Mirabeau has actually arrived. He descends from Berlin on the scene of action, 
glares into it with a flashing sun glance, discerns that it will do nothing for him. He had hoped these notables might need a secretary. They do need one, but have fixed on Dupont de Namur, a man of smaller fame, but then of better, who indeed, as his friends often hear, labours under this complaint, surely not a universal one, of having five kings to correspond with. The pen of a Mirabeau cannot become an official one. Nevertheless, it remains a pen. In defect of secretaryship, he sets to denouncing stock brokerage, denunciation de l'agiotage, testifying as his wont is by loud bruit that he is present and busy, till, warned by friend Talleyrand, and even by Cologne himself underhand, that a seventeenth letter de cachet may be launched against him, he timefully flits over the marches. And now, in stately royal apartments, as pictures of that time still represent them, a hundred and forty-four notables sit organised, ready to hear and consider. Controller Cologne is dreadfully behindhand with his speeches, his preparatives. However, the man's facility of work is known to us. For freshness of style, lucidity, ingenuity, largeness of view, that opening harangue of his was unsurpassable had not the subject matter been so appalling. A deficit concerning which accounts vary, and the controller's own account is not unquestioned, but which all accounts agree in representing as enormous. This is the epitome of our controller's difficulties. And then his means? Mere turgotism. For thither, it seems, we must come at last. Provincial assemblies, new taxation, nay, strangest of all, new land tax, what he calls subvention territoriale, from which neither privileged nor unprivileged noblemen, clergy nor parliamentiers shall be exempt. Foolish enough! These privileged classes have been used to tax, levying toll, tribute and custom at all hands while a penny was left, but to be themselves taxed? Of such privileged persons, meanwhile, do these notables, all but the merest fraction, consist. Headlong Cologne had given no heed to the composition or judicious packing of them, but chosen such notables as were really notable, trusting for the issue to an off-hand ingenuity, good fortune and eloquence that never yet failed. Headlong Controller General. Eloquence can do much, but not all. Orpheus, with eloquence grown rhythmic, musical, what we call poetry, drew iron tears from the cheek of Pluto. But by what witchery of rhyme or prose wilt thou from the pocket of Plutus draw gold? Accordingly, the storm that now rose and began to whistle round Cologne, first in these seven bureaus, and then on the outside of them, awakened by them, spreading wider and wider over all France, threatens to become unappeasable. A deficit so enormous? Mismanagement, profusion is too clear. Peculation itself is hinted at. Nay, Lafayette and others go so far as to speak it out with attempts at proof. The blame of his deficit, our brave Cologne, as was natural, had endeavoured to shift from himself on his predecessors, not excepting even Necker. But now Necker vehemently denies, whereupon an angry correspondence which also finds its way into print. In the Oie de Boeuf and Her Majesty's private apartments, an eloquent controller with his Madame, if it is but difficult, had been persuasive. But alas, the cause is now carried elsewhither. Behold him one of these sad days in Monsieur's bureau, to which all the other bureaus have sent deputies. He is standing at bay, alone, exposed to an incessant fire of questions, interpolations, objurgations from those 137 pieces of logic ordnance, what we may well call bouche à feu, fire mouth, literally. Never, according to Bissonval, or hardly ever, had such display of intellect, dexterity, coolness, suasive eloquence been made by man, to the raging play of so many firemouths, he opposes nothing angrier than light beams, self-possession and fatherly smiles. 
with the imperturbalist bland clearness, he for five hours long keeps answering the incessant volley of fiery, captious questions, reproachful interpolations, in words prompt as lightning, quiet as light. Nay, the crossfire, too, such side questions and incidental interpolations as, in the heat of the main battle, he, having only one tongue, could not get answered, these also he takes up at the first slake, answers even these. Could blandest suasive eloquence have saved France, she was saved. Heavy-laden controller, in the seven bureaus seems nothing but hindrance. In Monsieur's bureau, a Lomini de Brienne, Archbishop of Toulouse, with an eye himself to the controllership, stirs up the clergy. There are meetings, underground intrigues. Neither from without anywhere comes sign of help or hope. For the nation, where Mirabeau is now with stentor lungs denouncing agio, the controller has hitherto done nothing or less. For philosophedom, he has done as good as nothing, sent out some scientific La Perouse or the like, and is he not in angry correspondence with its necker? The very oi de boeuf looks questionable. A falling controller has no friends. Solid Monsieur de Vergennes, who with his phlegmatic judicious punctuality might have kept down many things, died the very week before these sorrowful notables met. And now a seal-keeper, garde de Sceaux Miromenil, is thought to be playing the traitor, spinning plots for Lomini Brienne. Queen's reader, Abbe de Vermont, unloved individual, was Brienne's creature, the work of his hands from the first. It may be feared the backstairs passage is open, ground getting mined under our feet. Treacherous garde de Sceaux Miromenil at least should be dismissed, La Moignon, the eloquent notable, a stanch man with connections and even ideas, Parliament President, yet intent on reforming Parliament, were not he the right keeper? So, for one, thinks busy Bessonval, and at dinner table rounds the same into the controller's ear, who always, in the intervals of landlord duties, listens to him as with charmed look, but answers nothing positive. Alas, what to answer? The force of private intrigue, and then also the force of public opinion, grows so dangerous, confused. Philosophedom sneers aloud, as if its necker already triumphed. The gaping populace gapes over woodcuts or copper cuts, where, for example, a rustic is represented convoking the poultry in his barnyard with this opening address. Dear animals, I have assembled you to advise me what sauce I shall dress you with to which a cock, responding, We don't want to be eaten, is checked by, You wander from the point. Vous vous écartez de la question. Laughter and logic, ballad singer, pamphleteer, epigram and caricature, what wind of public opinion is this, as if the cave of the winds were bursting loose? At nightfall, President Lamogno steals over to the controller, finds him walking with large strides in his chamber like one out of himself. With rapid, confused speech, the controller begs Monsieur de Lamoignon to give him an advice. Lamoignon candidly answers that except in regard to his own anticipated keepership, unless that would prove remedial, he really cannot take upon him to advise. On the Monday after Easter, the 9th of April, 1787, a date one rejoices to verify, for nothing can excel the indolent falsehood of these histoires and memoirs, on the Monday after Easter, as I, Bessonval, was riding towards Romainville to the Maréchal de Ségur's, I met a friend on the boulevards who told me that Monsieur de Calonne was out. A little further on came Monsieur the Duc d'Orléans, dashing towards me, head to the wind, trotting à l'anglaise, and confirmed the news. It is true news. Treacherous garde de Sir Miromenil is gone, and Lamoignon is appointed in his room, but appointed for his own profit only, not for the controller's. Next day the controller also has had to move. A little longer he may linger near, be seen among the money changers, and even working in the controller's office, where much lies unfinished, but neither will that hold. Two strong blows and beats this tempest of public opinion, of private intrigue, as from the cave of all winds, and blows him, higher authority giving sign, out of Paris and France, over the horizon, into invisibility or outer darkness. 
such destiny the magic of genius could not forever avert. Ungrateful Oye de Boeuf, did he not miraculously rain gold manner on you, so that, as a courtier said, all the world held out its hand and I held out my hat for a time. Himself, his poor, penniless, had not a financier's widow in Lorraine offered him, though he was turned of fifty, her hand and the rich purse it held? Dim henceforth shall be his activity, though unwearied, Letters to the king, appeals, prognostications, pamphlets from London, written with the old suasive facility, which, however, do not persuade. Luckily, his widow's purse fails not. Once in a year or two, some shadow of him shall be seen hovering on the northern border, seeking election as national deputy, but be sternly beckoned away. Dimmer then, far borne over utmost European lands, in uncertain twilight of diplomacy, he shall hover, intriguing for exiled princes, and have adventures, be overset into the Rhine stream, and half drowned, nevertheless save his papers dry, unwearied, but in vain. In France he works miracles no more, shall hardly return thither to find a grave. Farewell, thou facile, sanguine controller-general, with thy light, rash hand, thy suasive mouth of gold. Worse men there have been, and better, but to thee also was allotted a task of raising the wind and the winds, and thou hast done it. But now, while ex-controller Cologne flies storm-driven over the horizon in this singular way, what has become of the controllership? It hangs vacant, one may say, extinct like the moon in her vacant interlunar cave. Two preliminary shadows, poor Monsieur Foucault, poor Monsieur Vide, poor Monsieur Viedoy, do hold in quick succession some simulacrum of it, as the new moon will sometimes shine out with a dim preliminary old one in her arms. Be patient, ye notables, an actual new controller is certain and even ready were the indispensable manoeuvres but gone through. Long-headed Lamoignon with Home Secretary Breteuil and Foreign Secretary Montmorin have exchanged looks. Let these three once meet and speak. Who is it that is strong in the Queen's favour and the Amé de Vermont? That is the man of great capacity? Or at least that has struggled these fifty years to have it thought great. Now, in the clergy's name, demanding to have Protestant death penalties put in execution, no flaunting it in the oil de boeuf as the gayest man-pleaser and woman-pleaser, gleaning even a good word from philosophedom and your Voltaire and d'Alembert, with a party ready-made for him and the notables, Lomani de Brienne, Archbishop of Toulouse, answer all the three with the clearest instantaneous concord and rush off to propose him to the king in such haste, says Bessonval, that Monsieur de Lamoignon had to borrow a cimar, seemingly some kind of cloth apparatus necessary for that. Lomini Brienne, who had all his life felt a kind of predestination for the highest officers, has now, therefore, obtained them. He presides over the finances. He shall have the title of Prime Minister itself, and the effort of his long life be realised. Unhappy only that it took such talent and industry to gain the place, that to qualify for it hardly any talent or industry was left disposable. Looking now into his inner man, what qualification may he have, Lomini beholds, not without astonishment, next to nothing but vacuity and possibility? principles or methods, acquirement outward or inward, for his very body is wasted by hard tear and wear, he finds none, not so much as a plan, even an unwise one. Lucky in these circumstances that Cologne has had a plan. Cologne's plan was gathered from Turgos and Neckers by compilation, shall become Lomini's by adoption. Not in vain has Lomini studied the working of the British Constitution, for he professes to have some Anglomania of a sort. Why, in that free country, does one minister, driven out by Parliament, vanish from his king's presence, and another entered, borne in by Parliament? Surely not for mere change, which is ever wasteful, but that all men may have a share of what is going, and so the strife for freedom indefinitely prolong itself, and no harm be done. 
The notables, mollified by Easter festivities, by the sacrifice of Cologne, are not in the worst humour. Already His Majesty, while the interlunar shadows were in office, had held session of notables and from his throne delivered promisory conciliatory eloquence. The Queen stood waiting at a window till his carriage came back and Monsieur from afar clapped hands to her. In sign that all was well. It has had the best effect if such do but last. Leading notables, meanwhile, can be caressed. Brienne's new gloss, Lamoignon's long head, will profit somewhat. Conciliatory eloquence shall not be wanting. On the whole, however, it is not undeniable that this of ousting Cologne and adopting the plan of Cologne is a measure which, to produce its best effect, should be looked at from a certain distance, cursorily, not dwelt on with minute near scrutiny. In a word, that no service the notables could now do was so obliging as, in some handsome manner, to take themselves away. Their six propositions about provisional assemblies, suppression of corvées and such like, can be accepted without criticism. The subvention on land tax and much else one must glide hastily over, safe nowhere but in flourishes of conciliatory eloquence. Till at length, on this 25th of May, year 1787, in solemn final session, there burst forth what we can call an explosion of eloquence, King, Lomani, Lamoignon and Retinue taking up the successive strain in harangues to the number of ten besides his majesties, which last the livelong day, whereby, as in a kind of choral anthem or bravura peal of thanks, praises, promises, the notables are, so to speak, organed out and dismissed to their respective places of abode. They had sat and talked some nine weeks. They were the first notables since Richelieu's in the year 1626. By some historians sitting much at their ease in the safe distance, Lomany has been blamed for this dismissal of his notables. Nevertheless, it was clearly time. There are things, as we said, which should not be dwelt on with minute close scrutiny. Over hot coals you cannot glide too fast. In these seven bureaus, where no work could be done unless talk will work, the questionablest matters were coming up. Lafayette, for example, in Monseigneur d'Artois' bureau, took upon him to set forth more than one deprecatory oration about lettre de cachet, liberty of the subject, agio, and such like, which Monseigneur, endeavouring to repress, was answered that a notable being summoned to speak his opinion must speak it. Thus, too, his grace the Archbishop of Ay, perorating once with a plaintive pulpit tone in these words, Tithe that free will offering of the piety of Christians. Tithe, interrupted Duke de Rochefoucauld, with the cold business manner he has learned from the English, that free will offering of the piety of Christians, on which there are now 40,000 lawsuits in this realm. Nay, Lafayette, bound to speak his opinion, went the length one day of proposing to convoke a national assembly. You demand States General, asked Monseigneur with an air of military surprise. Yes, Monseigneur, and even better than that. Write it, said Monseigneur to the clerks. Written accordingly it is, and what is more will be acted by and by. End of Book 3, Chapter 3《ทอมัสคาร์ลิล》Volume One, Book Three, The Parliament of Paris, Chapter Four, Lomani's Edicts. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan. Book Three, Chapter Four, Lomani's Edicts. Thus then have the notables returned home, carrying to all quarters of France such notions of deficit, decrepitude, distraction and that states-general will cure it, or will not cure it, but kill it. The unquietest humour possesses all men, ferments, seeks issue in pamphleteering, caricaturing, projecting, declaiming, vain jangling of thought, word and deed. 
It is spiritual bankruptcy, long tolerated, verging now towards economical bankruptcy and become intolerable. For from the lowest dumb rank, the inevitable misery, as was predicted, has spread upwards. In every man is some obscure feeling that his position, oppressive or else oppressed, is a false one. All men, in one or the other acrid dialect, as assaulters or as defenders, must give vent to the unrest that is in them. Of such stuff, national well-being and the glory of rulers is not made. O oh, Lomini, what a wild-heaving, waste-looking, hungry and angry world hast thou, after lifelong effort, got promoted to take charge of. Lomini's first edicts are mere soothing ones. Creation of provincial assemblies for apportioning the imposts, when we get any. Suppression of corvée or statute labour. Alleviation of gabel. Soothing measures recommended by the notables, long clamoured for by all liberal men. Oil cast on the waters has been known to produce a good effect. Before venturing with great essential measures, Lomini will see this singular swell of the public mind abate somewhat. Most proper, surely. But what if it were not a swell of the abating kind? There are swells that come of upper tempests and wind gust, but again there are swells that come of subterranean pent wind, some say, and even of inward decomposition, of decay that has become self-combustion. As when, according to Neptuno-Plutonic geology, the world is all decayed down into due atritis of this sort and shall now be exploded and new made. These latter abate not by oil. The fool says in his heart, How shall not tomorrow be as yesterday, as all days which were once tomorrows? The wise man looking on this France, moral, intellectual, economical, sees, in short, all the symptoms that he has ever met with in history, unabatable by soothing edicts. Meanwhile, abate or not, cash must be had, and for that quite another sort of edict, namely bursal or fiscal ones. How easy were fiscal edicts, did you know for certain that the Parliament of Paris would what they call register them? Such right of registering, properly of mere writing down, the Parliament has got by old want, and though but a law court, can remonstrate and higgle considerably about the same. Hence many quarrels, desperate Morpeo devices and victory and defeat, a quarrel now nearly forty years long. Hence fiscal edicts, which otherwise were easy enough, become such problems. For example, is there not Cologne subvention territoriale, universal unexempting land tax, the sheet anchor of finance? Or to show, so far as possible, that one is not without original finance talent, Lomini himself can devise an addit to timbre, or stamp tax, borrowed also, it is true, but then from America. May it prove luckier in France than there. France has her resources. Nevertheless, it cannot be denied. The aspect of that Parlement is questionable. Already among the notables in that final symphony of dismissal, the Paris president had an ominous tone. Adrien Dupont, quitting magnetic sleep in this agitation of the world, threatens to rouse himself into preternatural wakefulness. Shallower, but also louder, there is magnetic despremenil with his tropical heat, he was born at Madras, with his dusky confused violence, holding of illumination, animal magnetism, public opinion, Adam Weishaupt, Harmodius and Aristogoton, and all manner of confused violent things, of whom can come no good. The very peerage is infected with the leaven. Our peers have, in too many cases, laid aside their frogs, laces, bagwigs, and go about in English costume, or ride rising in their stirrups, in the most headlong manner, nothing but insubordination, eleutheromania, confused unlimited opposition in their heads. Questionable, not to be ventured upon if we had a fortunatus purse. 
But Lamini has waited all June, casting on the waters what oil he had, and now, betide as it may, the two finance edicts must out. On the 6th of July, he forwards his proposed stamp tax and land tax to the Parliament of Paris, and, as if putting his own leg foremost, not his borrowed Cologne's leg, places the stamp tax first in order. Alas, the Parliament will not register. The Parliament demands instead a state of the expenditure, a state of the contemplated reductions, states enough, which His Majesty must decline to furnish. Discussions arise, patriotic eloquence, the peers are summoned. Does the Nemean lion begin to bristle? Here surely is a duel which France and the universe may look upon with prayers, at lowest with curiosity and bets. Paris stirs with new animation. The outer courts of the Palais de Justice roll with unusual crowds coming and going. Their huge outer hum mingles with the clang of patriotic eloquence within and gives vigour to it. Poor Lomini gazes from the distance, little comforted, has his invisible emissaries flying to and fro, assiduous, without result. So pass the sultry dog days in the most electric manner, and the whole month of July. And still in the sanctuary of justice sounds nothing but harmodious aristigiton eloquence environed with the hum of crowding Paris, and no registering accomplished, and no states furnished. States, said a lively parliamentier, monsieur, the states that should be furnished us, in my opinion, are the states general. On which timely joke there follow cachinatory buzzes of approval. What a word to be spoken in the Palais de Justice. Old Dormesson, the ex-controller's uncle, shakes his judicious head, far enough from laughing. But the outer courts, and Paris, and France, catch the glad sound and repeat it, shall repeat it, and re-echo and reverberate it, till it grows a deafening peal. Clearly enough, here is no registering to be thought of. The pious proverb says, There are remedies for all things but death. When a parliament refuses registering, the remedy, by long practice, has become familiar to the simplest, a bed of justice. One complete month this Parliament has spent in mere idle jargoning and sound and fury, the timbre edict not registered or like to be, the subvention not yet so much as spoken of. On the 6th of August, let the whole refractory body roll out in wheeled vehicles as far as the King's Chateau of Versailles. There shall the king, holding his bed of justice, order them by his own royal lips to register. They may remonstrate in an undertone, but they must obey, lest a worse unknown thing befall them. It is done. The Parlement has rolled out on royal summons, has heard the express royal order to register. Whereupon it has rolled back again amid the hushed expectancy of men. And now, behold, on the morrow, this Parliament, seated once more in its own palais, with crowds inundating the outer courts, not only does not register, but, oh, portent, declares all that was done on the prior day to be null, and the bed of justice as good as a futility. In the history of France, here verily, is a new feature. Nay, better still, our heroic Parliament, getting suddenly enlightened on several things, declares that, for its part, it is incompetent to register tax edicts at all, having done it by mistake during these late centuries, that for such act one authority only is competent, the assembled three estates of the realm. To such length can the universal spirit of a nation penetrate the most isolated body corporate, Say rather, with such weapons, homicidal and suicidal, in exasperated political duel, will bodies corporate fight. But in any case, is not this the real death grapple of war and internecine duel, Greek meeting Greek, whereon men, had they even no interest in it, might look with interest unspeakable? 
crowds, as was said, inundate the outer courts. Inundation of young Eleutheromaniac noblemen in English costume uttering audacious speeches. Of procureur, basoche clerk, who are idle in these days of loungers, newsmongers and other nondescript classes. Rolls tumult there. From three to four thousand persons, waiting eagerly to hear the aret resolutions you arrive at within, applauding with bravos, with the clapping of from six to eight thousand hands. Sweet also is the mead of patriotic eloquence when your despremenil, your freto, or sabatier, issuing from his demosthenic Olympus, the thunder being hushed for the day, is welcomed in the outer courts with a shout from four thousand throats, is borne home shoulder-high with benedictions and strikes the stars with his sublime head. End of Book 3, Chapter 4《The French Revolution — A History》by Thomas Carlyle, Volume 1. Book 3 — The Parliament of Paris. Chapter 5 — Lomini's Thunderbolts. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan. Book 3 — Chapter 5 — Lomini's Thunderbolts. Arise, Lomini Brienne. Here is no case for letters of jussion, for faltering or compromise. Thou seest the whole loose fluent population of Paris, whatsoever is not solid and fixed to work, inundating these outer courts like a loud destructive deluge, the very basoche of lawyers' clerks talk sedition. The lower classes in this duel of authority with authority, Greek, throttling Greek, have ceased to respect the city watch. Police satellites are marked on the back with chalk, the M signifies mouchard, spy. They are hustled, hunted like ferrae naturae. Subordinate rural tribunals send messengers of congratulation, of adherence. Their fountain of justice is becoming a fountain of revolt. The provincial parliament look on with intent eye, with breathless wishes, while their elder sister of Paris does battle. The whole twelve are of one blood and temper. The victory of one is that of all. Ever worse it grows. On the 10th of August there is plaint omitted touching the prodigalities of Cologne and permission to proceed against him. No registering, but instead of it, denouncing of dilapidation, peculation, and ever the burden of the song, States General. Have the royal armories no thunderbolt that thou couldst, O Lomini, with red right hand, launch it among these demosthenic theatrical thunder barrels, mere resonant noise for the most part, and shatter and smite them silent? On the night of the 14th of August, Lomini launches his thunderbolt, or handful of them. Letters named of the seal, de cachet, as many as needful, some six score and odd, are delivered overnight. And so, next day betimes, the whole Parliament, once more set on wheels, is rolling incessantly towards Troy in Champagne, escorted, says history, with the blessings of all people, the very innkeepers and postilions looking gratuitously reverent. This is the 15th of August, 1787. What will not people bless in their extreme need? Seldom had the Parliament of Paris deserved much blessing, or received much. An isolated body corporate, which, out of old confusions, while the sceptre of the sword was confusedly struggling to become a sceptre of the pen, had got itself together, better and worse, as body corporates do, to satisfy some dim desire of the world, and many clear desires of individuals, and so had grown in the course of centuries, on concession, on acquirement and usurpation, to be what we see it, a prosperous social anomaly deciding lawsuits, sanctioning or rejecting laws, and withal disposing of its places and offices by sale for ready money, which method, sleek President no after meditation, will demonstrate to be the indifferent best. In such a body, existing by purchase for ready money, there could not be excess of public spirit, there might well be excess of eagerness to divide the public spoil. 
Men in helmets have divided that with swords, men in wigs with quill and inkhorn do divide it, and even more hatefully these latter, if more peaceably, for the wig method is at once irresistibler and baser. By long experience, says Bessonval, it has been found useless to sue a parliamentier at law. No officer of justice will serve a writ on one. His wig and gown are his Vulcan's panoply, his enchanted cloak of darkness. The Parliament of Paris may count itself an unloved body, mean, not magnanimous, on the political side. Were the king weak, always, as now, has his Parliament barked, cur-like, at his heels, with what popular cry there might be. Were he strong, it barked before his face, hunting for him as his alert beagle. An unjust body, where foul influences have more than once worked shameful perversion of judgment. Does not in these very days the blood of murdered Lally cry aloud for vengeance? Baited, circumvented, driven mad like the snared lion, Valour had to sink extinguished under vindictive chicane. Behold him, that hapless lily, his wild dark soul looking through his wild dark face, trailed on the ignominious death hurdle, the voice of his despair choked by a wooden gag. The wild fire soul that had known only peril and toil and for three score years has buffeted against fate's obstruction and men's perfidy like genius and courage amid poltroonery, dishonesty and commonplace, faithfully enduring and endeavouring. O Parliament of Paris, dost thou reward it with a gibbet and a gag? The dying Lally bequeathed his memory to his boy, a young lally has arisen, demanding redress in the name of God and man. The Parliament of Paris does its utmost to defend the indefensible, abominable, nay, what is singular, dusty glowing Aristogiton Despremenil is the man chosen to be its spokesman in that. Such social anomaly is it that France now blesses. An unclean social anomaly, but in duel against another worse. The exiled parliament is felt to have covered itself with glory. There are quarrels in which even Satan bringing help were not unwelcome. Even Satan, fighting stiffly, might cover himself with glory of a temporary sort. But what a stir in the outer courts of the Palais when Paris finds its parliament trundled off to Troy in Champagne and nothing left but a few meat keepers of records, the demosthenic thunder become extinct, the martyrs of liberty clean gone. Confused wail and menace rises from the four thousand throats of procureurs, bachoche clerks, nondescripts and anglo-maniac noblesse, ever new idlers crowd to see and hear, rascality with increasing numbers and vigour hunts mouchard. Loud whirlpool rolls through these spaces, the rest of the city fixed to its work cannot yet go rolling. Audacious placards are legible in and about the palais. The speeches are as good as seditious. Surely the temper of Paris is much changed. On the third day of this business, 18th of August, Monsieur and Monseigneur d'Artois, coming in state carriages according to use and want, to have these late obnoxious arrêts and protests expunged from the records, are received in the most marked manner. Monsieur who is thought to be in opposition, is met with vivats and strewed flowers. Monseigneur, on the other hand, with silence, with murmurs which rise to hisses and groans. Nay, an irreverent rascality presses towards him in floods with such hissing vehemence that the captain of the guards has to give orders, Hort les arms! Handle arms! At which thunderword, indeed, and the flash of the clear iron, the rascal flood recoils through all avenues fast enough. New features, these. Indeed, as good Monsieur de Malacheur pertinently remarks, it is a quite new kind of contest, this, with the Parlement. No transitory sputter as from collision of hard bodies, but more like the first sparks of what, if not quenched, may become a great conflagration. This good Malesherb sees himself now again in the king's council after an absence of ten years. Lomini would profit, if not by the faculties of the man, yet by the name he has. As for the man's opinion, it is not listened to. 
Wherefore he will soon withdraw a second time back to his books and his trees. In such king's counsel, what can a good man profit? Turgo tries it not a second time. Turgo has quitted France and this earth some years ago and now cares for none of these things. Singular enough, Turgo, this same Lomini and the Abbe Mourlet were once a trio of young friends, fellow scholars in the Sorbonne. Forty new years have carried them severally thus far. Meanwhile, the Parlement sits daily at Troy, calling cases and daily adjourns, no procureur making his appearance to plead. Troy is as hospitable as could be looked for. Nevertheless, one has comparatively a dull life. No crowds now to carry you shoulder high to the immortal gods. Scarcely a patriot or two will drive out so far and bid you be of firm courage. You are in furnished lodgings, far from home and domestic comfort. Little to do but wander over the unlovely champagne fields, seeing the grapes ripen, taking counsel about the thousand times consulted, a prey to tedium, in danger even that Paris may forget you. Messengers come and go. Pacific Lomini is not slack in negotiating, promising. Dormesson and the prudent elder members see no good in strife. After a dull month, the Parliament, yielding and retaining, makes truce, as all Parliaments must. The stamp tax is withdrawn. The subvention land tax is also withdrawn, but in its stead there is granted what they call a prorogation of the second twentieth, itself a kind of land tax, but not so oppressive to the influential classes, which lies mainly on the dumb class. Moreover, secret promises exist on the part of the elders that finances may be raised by loan. Of the ugly words, States General, there shall be no mention. And so, on the 20th of September, our exiled Parliament returns. Despramenel said, It went out covered in glory, but had come back covered with mud. Debout. Not so, Aristogiton, or if so, thou surely art the man to clean it. End of Book 3, Chapter 5《The French Revolution: A History》by Thomas Carlyle, Volume One, Book Three: The Parliament of Paris, Chapter Six: Lomini's Plots. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan. Book Three, Chapter Six: Lomini's Plots. Was ever unfortunate chief minister so bested as Lomini Brienne? The reins of the state fairly in his hand these six months are not the smallest motive power of finance to stir from the spot with this way or that. He flourishes his whip but advances not. Instead of ready money there is nothing but rebellious debating and recalcitrating. Far is the public mind from having calmed. It goes chafing and fuming ever worse, and in the royal coffers, with such yearly deficit running on, there is hardly the colour of coin. Ominous prognostics. Malesherb, seeing an exhausted, exasperated France grow hotter and hotter, talks of conflagration. Mirabeau, without talk, has, as we perceive, descended on Paris again, close on the rear of the Parlement, not to quit his native soil any more. Over the frontiers, behold, Holland invaded by Prussia, the French party oppressed, England and the stadtholder triumphing to the sorrow of War Secretary Montmorin and all men. But without money, sinews of war as of work and of existence itself, what can a chief minister do? Taxes profit little. This of the second twentieth falls not due till next year and will then, with its strict valuation, produce more controversy than cash. Taxes on the privileged classes cannot be got registered, are intolerable to our supporters themselves. Taxes on the unprivileged yield nothing, as from a thing drained dry more cannot be drawn. Hope is nowhere, if not in the old refuge of loans. To Lomini, aided by the long head of Lamoignon, 
deeply pondering this sea of troubles, the thought suggested itself, why not have a successive loan, emprunt successif, of loan that went on lending year after year as much as needful, say till 1792. The trouble of registering such loan were the same. We had then breathing time, money to work with, at least to subsist on. Edict of a successive loan must be proposed. To conciliate the philosoph, let a liberal edict walk in front of it for emancipation of Protestants. Let a liberal promise guard the rear of it that when our loan ends in that final 1792, the States General shall be convoked. Such liberal edict of Protestant emancipation, the time having come for it, shall cost Alamany as little as the death penalties to be put in execution did. As for the liberal promise of States General, it can be fulfilled or not. The fulfilment is five good years off. In five years, much intervenes. But the registering? Ah, truly, there is the difficulty. However, we have that promise of the elders given secretly at Troy, judicious gratuities, cajoleries, underground intrigues with old Foulon named Am Damne, familiar demon of the Parliament, may perhaps do the rest. At worst and lowest, the royal authority has resources, which ought it not to put forth. If it cannot realise money, the royal authority is as good as dead, dead of that surest and miserablest death, inanition. Risk and win. Without risk, all is already lost. For the rest, as in enterprises of pith, a touch of stratagem often proves furthersome. His Majesty announces a royal hunt for the 19th of November next, and all whom it concerns are joyfully getting their gear ready. Royal hunt indeed, but of two-legged, unfeathered game... At eleven in the morning of that royal hunt day, 19th of November, 1787, unexpected blare of trumpeting, tumult of charioteering and cavalcading disturbs the seat of justice. His Majesty is come with garde sur la Magnon and peers and retinue to hold royal session and have edicts registered. What a change since Louis XIV entered here in boots and whip in hand, ordered his registering to be done with an Olympian look which none durst gainsay, and did without stratagem in such unceremonious fashion hunt as well as register. For Louis XVI on this day the registering will be enough, if indeed he and the day suffice for it. Meanwhile, with fit ceremonial words, the purpose of the royal breast is signified. Two edicts for Protestant emancipation for successive loan, of both which edicts our trusty garde de Sir La Magnon will explain the purport, on both which a trusty parliament is requested to deliver its opinion, each member having free privilege of speech. And so, La Magnon too, having perorated, not amiss, and wound up with that promise of States General, the sphere music of parliamentary eloquence begins. Explosive, responsive, sphere answering sphere, it waxes louder and louder. The peers sit attentive, of diverse sentiment, unfriendly to States General, unfriendly to despotism, which cannot reward merit and is suppressing places. But what agitates His Highness d'Orléans? The rubicond moonhead goes wagging, darker beams the copper visage like unscoured copper in the glazed eye's disquietude. He rolls uneasy in his seat as if he meant something. Amid unutterable satiety, has sudden new appetite for new forbidden fruit been vouchsafed him? Disgust and edacity, laziness that cannot rest, futile ambition, revenge, non-admiralship, Oh, within that carbuncled skin, what a confusion of confusion sits bottled. Eight couriers in the course of the day gallop from Versailles, where Lomini waits palpitating, and gallop back again, not with the best news. In the outer courts of the palais, huge buzz of expectation reigns. It is whispered the chief minister has lost six votes overnight and from within resounds nothing but forensic eloquence, pathetic and even indignant, 
heart-rending appeals to the royal clemency that his majesty would please to summon states general forthwith and be the saviour of france were in dusky glowing despremenel but still more sabatier de cabra and fretto since named comer fretto goody fretto are among the loudest for six mortal hours at last in this manner the infinite hubbub unslackened and so now, when brown dusk is falling through the windows and no end visible, His Majesty, on hint of garde des so la Mognon, opens his royal lips once more to say, in brief, that he must have his loan edict registered. Momentary deep pause. See, si. Monseigneur d'Orléans rises, with moon visage turned towards the royal platform. He asks, with a delicate graciosity of manner covering unutterable things, whether it is a bed of justice, then, or a royal session. Fire flashes on him from the throne and neighbourhood. Surly answer that it is a session. In that case, Monseigneur will crave leave to remark that edicts cannot be registered by order in a session and indeed to enter against such registry his individual humble protest. Vous êtes bien le maître, you will do your pleasure, answers the king, and thereupon in high state marches out, escorted by his court retinue. Dorleon himself, as in duty bound, escorting him, but only to the gate. Which duty done, Dorleon returns in from the gate, redacts his protest in the face of an applauding Parliament, an applauding France, and so has cut his court mooring, shall we say, and will now sail and drift fast enough towards chaos? Thou foolish Dorleon, a quality that art to be. Is royalty grown a mere wooden scarecrow, whereon thou, pert, scold-headed crow, mayst alight at pleasure and Peck, not yet wholly. Next day, a letter de cachet sends Dorleon to bethink himself in his chateau of Villiers Cotteret, where, alas, is no Paris with its joyous necessaries of life, no fascinating, indispensable Madame du Buffon, light wife of a great naturalist, much too old for her. Monseigneur, it is said, does nothing but walk distractedly at Villiers Cotteret, cursing his stars. Versailles itself shall hear penitent wail from him, so hard is his doom. By a second simultaneous letter de cachet, Goody Freito is hurled into the stronghold of Ham amid the Norman marshes. By a third, Sabatier de Cabre into Mont Saint Michel amid the Norman quicksands. As for the Parlement, it must on summons travel out to Versailles with its register book under its arm to have the protest buffet expunged, not without admonition and even rebuke. A stroke of authority which one might have hoped would quiet matters. Unhappily, no. It is a mere taste of the whip to rearing courses which makes them rear worse. When a team of twenty-five millions begins rearing, what is Lomini's whip? The Parliament will nowise acquiesce meekly and set to register the Protestant edict and do its other work in salutary fear of these three lettres de cachet. Far from that, it begins questioning lettres de cachet generally, their legality, endurability, emits dolorous objurgation, petition on petition to have its three martyrs delivered, cannot till that be complied with so much as think of examining the Protestant edict, but puts it off always till this day week, in which objurgatory strain Paris and France joins it, or rather has preceded it, making fearful chorus. And now also the other Parliament, at length opening their mouths, begin to join, some of them as at Grenoble and at Rennes, with portentous emphasis threatening by way of reprisal to interdict the very tax-gatherer. In all formal contests, as Malesher remarks, it was the Parliament that excited the public, but here it is the public that excites the Parliament. End of Book 3, Chapter 6 The French Revolution, A History, by Thomas Carlyle, Volume 1 Book 3, The Parliament of Paris Chapter 7, Internecine this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 
Read by Peter Dan. Book 3, Chapter 7, Internecine. What a France through these winter months of the year 1787. The very oeil de boeuf is doleful, uncertain, with a general feeling among the suppressed that it were better to be in Turkey. The wolfhounds are suppressed, the bearhounds, the Duc de Coigny, Duc de Polignac, in the Trianon Little Heaven, Her Majesty one evening takes Bessonval's arm, asks his candid opinion. The intrepid Bessonval, having, as he hopes, nothing of the sycophant in him, plainly signifies that, with a parliament in rebellion and an oeil de boeuf in suppression, the king's crown is in danger. Whereupon, singular to say, Her Majesty, as if hurt, changed the subject. Et ne me parla plus de rien. To whom, indeed, can this poor queen speak? in need of wide counsel, if ever mortal was, yet beset here only by the hubbub of chaos. Her dwelling place is so bright to the eye, and confusion and black care darkens it all. Sorrows of the sovereign, sorrows of the woman, think coming sorrows environ her more and more. Lamotte, the neckless countess, has in these late months escaped, perhaps been suffered to escape, from the Salpietre. Vain was the hope that Paris might thereby forget her, and this ever-widening lie and heap of lies subside. The La Motte with a V for voleurs, thief, branded on both shoulders, has got to England, and will therefrom emit lie on lie, defiling the highest queenly name, mere distracted lies, which in its present humour France will greedily believe. For the rest, it is too clear our successive loan is not filling. As indeed, in such circumstances, a loan registered by expunging of protests was not the likeliest to fill. Denunciation of lettre de cachet, of despotism generally, abates not. The twelve parliaments are busy, the twelve hundred placarders, ballad singers, pamphleteers. Paris is what, in figurative speech, they call flooded with pamphlets, regorge de brochures, flooded and eddying again, hot deluge from so many patriot ready writers, all at the fervid or boiling point, each ready writer now in the hour of eruption going like an Iceland geyser, against which what can a judicious friend morally do, a riverol, an unruly langue, well paid for it, spouting, cold. Now also at length does come discussion of the Protestant edict, but only for new embroilment, in pamphlet and counter-pamphlet, increasing the madness of men. Not even orthodoxy, bedrid as she seemed, but will have a hand in this confusion. She, once again in the shape of Abbe L'Enfant, whom prelates drive to visit and congratulate, raises audible sound from her pulpit drum. Or Marca Despremenil, who has his own confused way in all things, produces at the right moment, in parliamentary harangue, a pocket crucifix with the apostrophe, Will ye crucify him afresh? Him, O oh Despremenil, without scruple, considering what poor stuff of ivory and filigree he is made of. To all which had only that poor Brienne has fallen sick, so hard was the tear and wear of his sinful youth, so violent, incessant is this agitation of his foolish old age. Baited, bayed at through so many throats, his grace growing consumptive, inflammatory, with humour de dart, lies reduced to milk diet, in exasperation, almost in desperation, with repose, precisely the impossible recipe, prescribed as the indispensable. On the whole, what can a poor government do but once more recoil, ineffectual? The king's treasury is running towards the lees, and Paris eddies with a flood of pamphlets. At all rates, let the latter subside a little, D'Orléans gets back to Rancy, which is nearer Paris, and the fair, frail Buffon. Finally, to Paris itself. Neither Afreto and Sabatier banished forever. The Protestant edict is registered, to the joy of Boissy d'Anglas and good Malesherbe, successive loan, all protests expunged or else withdrawn, remains open, the rather as few or none come to fill it. 
States general for which the Parliament has clamoured, and now the whole nation clamours, will follow in five years, if indeed not sooner. Oh, Parliament of Paris, what a clamour was that! Monsieur, said old Domesson, you will get States general, and you will repent it. Like the horse in the fable, who, to be avenged of his enemy, applied to the man. The man mounted did swift execution on the enemy, but unhappily would not dismount. Instead of five years, let three years pass, and this clamorous parliament shall have both seen its enemy hurled prostrate and been itself ridden to foundering, say rather jugulated for hide and shoes, and lie dead in the ditch. Under such omens, however, we have reached the spring of 1788. By no path can the king's government find passage for itself, but is everywhere shamefully flung back. Beleaguered by twelve rebellious parliaments, which are grown to be the organs of an angry nation, it can advance nowhither, can accomplish nothing, obtain nothing, not so much as money to subsist on, but must sit there seemingly to be eaten up of deficit. The measure of the iniquity, then, of the falsehood which has been gathering through long centuries is nearly full? At least that of the misery is. For the hovels of the twenty-five millions, the misery, permeating upwards and forwards, as its law is, has got so far to the very oeil de boeuf of Versailles. Man's hand in this blind pain is set against man, not only the low against the higher, but the higher against each other. Provincial noblesse is bitter against court noblesse, robe against sword, roche against pen. But against the king's government, who is not bitter? Not even Bessonval in these days. To it, all men and bodies of men are become as enemies. It is the centre whereon infinite contentions unite and clash. What new universal vertiginous movement is this of institutions, social arrangements, individual minds, which once worked cooperative, now rolling and grinding in distracted collision? Inevitable, it is the breaking up of a world solecism, worn out at last, down even to bankruptcy of money. And so this poor Versailles court, as the chief or central solecism, finds all other solecisms arrayed against it. Most natural. For your human solecism, be it person or combination of persons, is ever by law of nature uneasy. If verging towards bankruptcy, it is even miserable. And when would the meanest solecism consent to blame or amend itself, while there remained another to amend? These threatening signs do not terrify Lomeny, much less teach him. Lomeny, though of light nature, is not without courage of a sort. Nay, have we not read of lightest creatures, trained canary birds, that could fly cheerfully with lighted matches and fire cannon, fire whole powder magazines? To sit and die of deficit is no part of Lomeny's plan. The evil is considerable, but can he not remove it? Can he not attack it? At lowest, he can attack the symptom of it, these rebellious parliament he can attack and perhaps remove. Much is dim to Lomini, but two things are clear. That such parliamentary duel with royalty is growing perilous, nay, internecine, above all, that money must be had. Take thought, brave Lomini, thou garde de ce Lomagnon, who hast ideas. So often defeated, balked cruelly when the golden fruit seemed within clutch, rally for one other struggle. To tame the parliament, to fill the king's coffers, these are now life and death questions. Parliaments have been tamed more than once, set to perch on the peaks of rocks inaccessible except by litters, a parliament grows reasonable. O Mopio, thou bold man, had we left thy work where it was! But apart from exile or other violent methods, is there not one method whereby all things are tamed, even lions, the method of hunger? What if the Parliament supplies were cut off, namely its lawsuits? Minor courts, for the trying of innumerable minor causes, might be instituted. These we could call grand balayage, whereon the Parliament, shortened of its prey, would look with yellow despair. 
but the public fond of cheap justice with favour and hope. Then, for finance, for registering of edicts, why not from our own oeil de boeuf dignitaries, our princes, dukes, marshals, make a thing we could call plenary court, and there, so to speak, do our registering ourselves? St. Louis had his plenary court of great barons, most useful to him. Our great barons are still here, at least the name of them is still here. Our necessity is greater than his. Such is the Lomini Lamognon device, welcome to the king's council as a light beam in great darkness. The device seems feasible. It is eminently needful. Be it once well executed, great deliverance is wrought. Silent then and steady, now or never, the world shall see one other historical scene, and so singular a man as Lomini de Brienne still the stage manager there. Behold, accordingly, a Home Secretary Bretaille, beautifying Paris in the peaceablest manner in this hopeful spring weather of 1788. The old hovels and hutches disappearing from our bridges, as if for the state too there were halcyon weather and nothing to do but beautify. Parliament seems to sit acknowledged victor. Brienne says nothing of finance, or even says and prints that it is all well. How is this, such halcyon quiet, though the successive loan did not fill? In a victorious parliament, Councillor Gosselin de Montsabert even denounces that levying of the second twentieth on strict valuation, and gets decree that the valuation shall not be strict, not on the privileged classes. Nevertheless, Brienne endures it, launches no lettre de cachet against it. How is this? Smiling is such vernal weather, but treacherous, sudden. For one thing, we hear it whispered, the intendant of provinces have all got order to be at their posts on a certain day. Still more singular, what incessant printing is this that goes on at the king's chateau under lock and key? Sentries occupy all gates and windows, the printers come not out, they sleep in their workrooms, their very food is handed into them. A victorious parliament smells new danger. Despremenil has ordered horses to Versailles, prowls round that guarded printing office, prying, snuffing, if so be the sagacity and ingenuity of man may penetrate it. To the shower of gold most things are penetrable. Despremenil descends on the lap of a printer's danai in the shape of five hundred louis d'or, the Danai's husband smuggles a ball of clay to her, which she delivers to the golden councillor of Parliament, kneaded within it their stick-printed proof-sheets. By heaven, the royal edict of that same self-registering plenary court of those grand balayages that shall cut short our lawsuits. It is to be promulgated all over France on one and the same day. This, then, is what the intendant will bid wait for at their posts. This is what the court sat hatching as its accursed cockatrice egg, and would not stir, though provoked, till the brood were out. High with it, Despremenil, home to Paris, convoke instantaneous sessions, let the Parliament and the earth and heavens know it. End of Book 3, Chapter 7The French Revolution, A History, by Thomas Carlyle, Volume 1. Book 3, The Parliament of Paris. Chapter 8, Lomeny's Death Throes. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan. Book 3, Chapter 8, Lomeny's Death Throes. On the morrow, which is the 3rd of May, 1788, an astonished Parliament sits convoked, listens speechless to the speech of Despremenil, unfolding the infinite misdeed, deed of treachery, of unhallowed darkness, such as despotism loves. Denounce it, O Parliament of Paris, awaken France and the universe, roll what thunder-barrels of forensic eloquence thou hast, with thee too it is verily now or never. The Parliament is not wanting at such juncture. In the hour of his extreme jeopardy, the lion first incites himself by roaring, by lashing his sides. So, here, the Parliament of Paris. 
On the motion of Despremenil, a most patriotic oath of the one and all sort is sworn with united throat, an excellent new idea which in these coming years shall not remain unimitated. Next comes indomitable declaration, almost of the rights of man, at least of the rights of Parliament, invocation to the friends of French freedom in this and in subsequent time, all which, or the essence of all which, is brought to paper in a tone wherein something of plaintiveness blends with and tempers heroic valour. And thus, having sounded the storm-bell, which Paris hears, which all France will hear, and hurled such defiance in the teeth of lomony and despotism, the Parliament retires as from a tolerable first day's work. But how Lomini felt to see his cockatrice egg, so essential to the salvation of France, broken in this premature manner, let readers fancy. Indignant, he clutches at his thunderbolts, de cachet, of the seal, and launches two of them, a bolt for Despremenil, a bolt for that busy Gauchelard whose service in the second twentieth and strict valuation is not forgotten. Such bolts clutched promptly overnight, and launched with the early new morning, shall strike agitated Paris, if not into requiescence, yet into wholesome astonishment. Ministerial thunderbolts may be launched, but if they do not hit? Despremenel and Goslard, warned both of them, as is thought by singing of some friendly bird, elude the Lomini tipstaves, escape disguised through sky windows, over roofs, to their own palais de justice. The thunderbolts have missed. Paris, for the buzz flies abroad, is struck into astonishment, not wholesome. The two martyrs of liberty doff their disguises, don their long gowns. Behold, in the space of an hour, by aid of ushers and swift runners, the Parliament, with its councillors, presidents, even peers, sits anew assembled. The assembled Parliament declares that these its two martyrs cannot be given up to any sublunary authority. Moreover, that the session is permanent, admitting of no adjournment, till pursuit of them has been relinquished. And so, with forensic eloquence, denunciation and protest, with couriers going and returning, the Parliament, in this state of continual explosion that shall cease neither night nor day, waits the issue. Awakened Paris once more inundates those outer courts, boils in floods wilder than ever through all avenues. Dissonant hubbub there is, jargon as of Babel, in the hour when they were first smitten, as here with mutual unintelligibility, and the people had not yet dispersed. Paris City goes through its diurnal epochs of working and slumbering, and now, for the second time, most European and African mortals are asleep. But here, in this whirlpool of words, sleep falls not. The night spreads her coverlid of darkness over it in vain. Within is the sound of mere martyr invincibility, tempered with the due tone of plaintiveness. Without is the infinite expectant hum, growing drowsier a little. So has it lasted for six and thirty hours. But hark, through the dead of midnight, what tramp is this? Tramp as of armed men, foot and horse, guard Francaise, guard Suisse, marching hither in silent regularity, in the flare of torchlight. There are sappers too, with axes and crowbars. Apparently if the doors open not, they will be forced. It is Captain Dagou, missioned from Versailles. Dagou, a man of known firmness, who once forced Prince Condé himself by mere incessant looking at him to give satisfaction and fight. He now, with axes and torches, is advancing on the very sanctuary of justice. Sacrilegious! Yet what help? The man, as a soldier, looks merely at his orders, impassive, moves forward like an inanimate engine. The doors open on summons. There need no axes, door after door. And now the innermost door opens, discloses the long-gowned senators of France, a hundred and sixty-seven by tail, seventeen of them peers, sitting there, majestic, in permanent session. Were not the men military and of cast iron, this sight, this silence, re-echoing the clank of his own boots, might stagger him. For the hundred and sixty-seven receive him in perfect silence. 
which some liken to that of the Roman Senate overfallen by Brennus, some to that of a nest of coiners surprised by officers of the police. Monsieur, said Dagou, de par le roi, express order has charged Dagou with the sad duty of arresting two individuals, Monsieur Duval d'Espremenil and Monsieur Gaulard de Montsabert which respectable individuals, as he has not the honour of knowing them, are hereby invited in the king's name to surrender themselves. Profound silence. Buzz, which grows a murmur. We are all Despremenil's ventures a voice, which other voices repeat. The president inquires whether he will employ violence. Captain Daegu, honoured with His Majesty's commission, has to execute His Majesty's order. Would so gladly do it without violence, will in any case do it, grants an august silent space to deliberate which method they prefer. And thereupon Daegu, with grave military courtesy, has withdrawn for the moment. What boots it, august senators? All avenues are closed with fixed bayonets. Your courier gallops to Versailles through the dewy night, but also gallops back again with tidings that the order is authentic, that it is irrevocable. The outer courts simmer with idle population, but Dagu's grenadier ranks stand there as immovable floodgates. There will be no revolting to deliver you. Monsieur, thus spoke Despremenil, when the victorious Gauls entered Rome, which they had carried by assault, the Roman senators, clothed in their purple, sat there in the curule chairs with a proud and tranquil countenance, awaiting slavery or death. Such, too, is the lofty spectacle which you, in this hour, offer to the universe, à l'univers, after having generously, with much more of the like, as can be read. In vain, O oh, Despremenil, here is this cast-iron Captain Daegu with his cast-iron military air come back. Despotism, constraint, destruction sit waving in his plumes. Despremenil must fall silent, heroically give himself up, lest worst befall. Him Goslard heroically imitates, with spoken and speechless emotion they fling themselves into the arms of their parliamentary brethren for a last embrace. And so, amid plaudits and plaints, from a hundred and sixty-five throats, amid waving sobbings, a whole forest's eye of parliamentary pathos, they are led through the winding passages to the rear gate, where, in the grey of the morning, two coaches with exempts stand waiting. There must the victims mount, bayonets menacing behind. Despremenal's stern question to the populace, whether they have courage, is answered by silence. They mount and roll, and neither the rising of the May sun, it is the sixth morning, nor its setting shall lighten their heart, but they fare forward continually. This Bremenel, towards the utmost isles of Saint Marguerite, or here, supposed by some, if that is any comfort, to be Calypso Island, Goslard, towards the land fortress of pierre en extant then near the city of Lyon. Captain Daigou may now, therefore, look forward to majorship, to commandship of the Tuileries, and withal vanish from history, where, nevertheless, he has been fated to do a notable thing. For not only are Despremenil and Goslard safe whirling southward, but the Parliament itself has straightway to march out, to that also his inexorable order reaches. Gathering up their long skirts, they file out, the whole hundred and sixty-five of them, through two rows of unsympathetic grenadiers, a spectacle to gods and men. The people revolt not, they only wonder and grumble. Also, we remark, these unsympathetic grenadiers are garde Francais, who one day will sympathise. In a word, the Palais de Justice is swept clear, the doors of it are locked, and Daegu returns to Versailles with a key in his pocket, having, as was said, merited preferment. As for this Parliament of Paris now turned out to the street, we will, without reluctance, leave it there. The beds of justice it had to undergo in the coming fortnight at Versailles, in registering, or rather refusing to register, those new hatched edicts, and how it assembled in taverns and tap-rooms there for the purpose of protesting, or hovered disconsolate with outspread skirts, not knowing where to assemble, and was reduced to lodge protest with a notary, and in the end to sit still in a state of forced vacation and do nothing, 
All this, natural now, as the burying of the dead after battle, shall not concern us. The Parliament of Paris has as good as performed its part, doing and misdoing. So far, but hardly further, could it stir the world. Lomani has removed the evil then? Not at all. Not so much as the symptom of the evil, scarcely the twelfth part of the symptom, and exasperated the other eleven. The intendant of provinces, the military commandants, are at their posts on the appointed 8th of May, but in no parliament, if not in the single one of Douai, can these new edicts get registered. Not peaceable signing with ink, but browbeating, bloodshedding, appeal to primary club law. Against these bailliages, against this plenary court, exasperated theme as everywhere shows face of battle. The provincial noblesse are of her party, and whoever hates Lomini in the evil time, with her attorneys and tipstaves, she enlists and operates down even to the populace. At Rennes, in Brittany, where the historical Bertrand de Morville is intendant, it has passed from fatal continual duelling between the military and gentry to street fighting, to stone volleys and musket shot, and still the edicts remain unregistered. The afflicted Bretons send remonstrance to Lomini by a deputation of twelve, whom, however, Lomini, having heard them, shuts up in the Bastille. A second, larger deputation he meets by his scouts on the road and persuades or frightens back. But now a third, largest deputation is indignantly sent by many roads, refused audience on arriving. It meets to take counsel, invites Lafayette, an old patriot Breton, in Paris to assist, agitates itself, becomes the Breton Club, first germ of the Jacobins' society. So many as eight parliaments get exiled. Others might need that remedy, but it is one not always easy of appliance. At Grenoble, for instance, where a Mounier, a Banave, have not been idle, the Parliament had due order, by lettre de cachet, to depart and exile itself. But on the morrow, instead of coaches getting yoked, the alarm bell burst forth, ominous, and peals and booms all day. Crowds of mountaineers rushed down with axes, even with firelocks, whom, most ominous of all, the soldiery shows no eagerness to deal with. Axe overhead, the poor general has to sign capitulation, to engage that the lettre de cachet shall remain unexecuted, and a beloved parliament stay where it is. Besançon, Dijon, Rouen, Bordeaux are not what they should be. At Pau, in Bern, where the old commandant had failed, the new one, a Grammont native to them, is met by a procession of townsmen with the cradle of Henri Quatre, the palladium of their town is conjured as he venerates this old tortoise shell in which the great Henri was rocked not to trample on Bernese liberty, is informed withal that his majesty's cannon are all safe in the keeping of his majesty's faithful burghers of power, and do now lie pointed on the walls there, ready for action. At this rate, your grand bayages are likely to have a stormy infancy. As for the plenary court, it has literally expired in the birth. The very courtiers looked shy at it. Old Marshal Brogli declined the honour of sitting therein. Assaulted by a universal storm of mingled ridicule and execration, this poor plenary court met once and never any second time. Distracted country, contention hisses up with forked hydra tongues, wheresoever poor Lomini sets his foot. Let a commandant, a commissioner of the king, says Weber, enter one of these parliaments to have an edict registered, the whole tribunal will disappear and leave the commandant alone with the clerk and first president. The edict registered and the commandant gone, the whole tribunal hastens back to declare such registration null. The highways are covered with grand deputations of parliaments proceeding to Versailles to have their registers expunged by the king's hand or returning home to cover a new page with a new resolution still more audacious. Such is the France of this year, 1788. Not now a golden or paper age of hope with its horse racings, balloon flyings and finer sensibilities of the heart. Ah, gone is that, its golden effulgence paled, be darkened in this singular manner, brewing towards preternatural weather. 
for, as in that wreck storm of Paul et Virginie at Saint Pierre, one huge motionless cloud, say of sorrow and indignation, girdles our whole horizon, streams up hairy, copper edged over a sky of the colour of lead. Motionless itself, but small clouds, as exiled parliaments and such like, parting from it, fly over the zenith with the velocity of birds till at last, with one loud howl, the whole four winds be dashed together, and all the world exclaim, There is the tornado! Tout le monde s'écria, voilà l'ouragan! For the rest, in such circumstances, the successive loan, very naturally, remains unfilled, neither, indeed, can that impost of the second twentieth, at least not on strict valuation, be levied to good purpose. Lenders, says Weber, in his hysterical, vehement manner, are afraid of ruin, tax-gatherers of hanging. The very clergy turn away their face. Convoked in extraordinary assembly, they afford no gratuitous gift, don gratui, if it be not that of advice. Here, too, instead of cash, is clamour for states-general. O oh, Lomini Brienne, with thy poor flimsy mind all bewildered, and now three actual cauteries on thy worn-out body, who art like to die of inflammation, provocation, milk diet, d'atre vivre, and malady, best untranslated, and presidest over a France with innumerable actual cauteries, which also is dying of inflammation and the rest. Was it wise to quit the bosky verges of Brienne and thy new Ashla chateau there and what it held for this? Soft were those shades and lawns, sweet the hymns of poetasters, the blandishments of high-rouged graces, and always this and other philosophe Murale, nothing deeming himself or thee a questionable sham priest, could be so happy in making happy, and also, hadst thou known it, in the military school hard by there sat, studying mathematics, a dusky complexioned taciturned boy under the name of Napoleon Bonaparte. With fifty years of effort and one final deadlift struggle, thou hast made an exchange. Thou hast got thy robe of office, as Hercules had his Nessus shirt. On the 13th of July of this 1788, there fell on the very edge of harvest the most frightful hailstorm, scattering into wild waste the fruits of the year, which had otherwise suffered grievously by drought. For sixty leagues round Paris, especially, the ruin was almost total. To so many other evils, then, there is to be added that of dearth, perhaps of famine. Some days before this hailstorm, on the 5th of July, and still more decisively some days after it, on the 8th of August, Lomini announces that the States-General are actually to meet in the following month of May, till after which period this of the plenary court and the rest shall remain postponed. Further, as in Lomini there is no plan of forming or holding these most desirable states-generals, thinkers are invited to furnish him with one through the medium of discussion by the public press. What could a poor minister do? There are still ten months of respite reserved. A sinking pilot will fling out all things, his very biscuit bags, lead, log, compass and quadrant, before flinging out himself. It is on this principle of sinking and the incipient delirium of despair that we explain likewise the almost miraculous invitation to thinkers. Invitation to chaos to be so kind as build out of its tumultuous driftwood an ark of escape for him. In these cases not invitation but command has usually proved serviceable. The Queen stood that evening pensive in a window with her face turned towards the garden. The chef de Gobelet had followed her with an obsequious cup of coffee and then retired till it was sipped. Her Majesty beckoned Dame Campan to approach. Grand Dieu, murmured she with the cup in her hand, what a piece of news will be made public today. The King grants States General. Then raising her eyes to heaven, if Campan were not mistaken, she added, Tis a first beat of the drum of ill omen for France. This noblesse will ruin us. During all that hatching of the plenary court, while Lamagnon looked so mysterious, Bessonval had kept asking him one question, whether they had cash. 
to which, as Lamagnon always answered on the faith of Lomini, that the cash was safe. Judicious Bessonval rejoined that then all was safe. Nevertheless, the melancholy fact is that the royal coffers are almost getting literally void of coin. Indeed, apart from all other things, this invitation to thinkers and the great change now at hand are enough to arrest the circulation of capital and forward only that of pamphlets. A few thousand gold louis are now all of money or money's worth that remains in the king's treasury. With another movement as of desperation, Lomini invites Necker to come and be controller of finances. Necker has other work in view than controlling finances for Lomini. With a dry refusal, he stands taciturn, awaiting his time. What shall a desperate prime minister do? He has grasped at the strongbox of the king's theatre. Some lottery has been set on foot for those sufferers by the hailstorm. In his extreme necessity, Lomini lays hands even on this. To make provision for the passing day on any terms will soon be impossible. On the 16th of August, poor Weber heard at Paris and Versailles, hawkers with a hoarse stifled tone of voice, Voix étoffe, sourd drawling and snuffling through the streets, an edict concerning payments. Such was the soft title Riverol had controlled for it. All payments at the royal treasury shall be made henceforth three-fifths in cash and the remaining two-fifths in paper bearing interest. Poor Weber almost swooned at the sound of these cracked voices with their bodeful raven note and will never forget the effect it had on him. But the effect on Paris, on the world generally? From the dens of stock brokerage, from the heights of political economy, of neckerism and philosophism, from all articulate and inarticulate throats rise hootings and howlings such as ear had not yet heard. Sedition itself may be imminent. Monseigneur d'Artois, moved by Duchess Polignac, feels called to wait upon Her Majesty and explain frankly what crisis matters stand in. The Queen wept, Brienne himself wept, for it is now visible and palpable that he must go. Remains only that the court, to whom his manners and garrulities were always agreeable, shall make his fall soft. The grasping old man has already got his Archbishop of Toulouse exchanged for the richer one of sense, and now, in this hour of pity, he shall have the coadjutorship for his nephew, hardly yet of due age a dameship of the palace for his niece, a regiment for her husband, for himself a red cardinal's hat, a coupe de bois cutting from the royal forests, and on the whole from five to six hundred thousand livres of revenue. Finally, his brother, the Comte de Brienne, shall still continue war minister. Buckled round with such bolsters and huge feather beds of promotion, let him now fall as soft as he can. And so, Lamini departs, rich if court titles and money bonds can enrich him, but if these cannot, perhaps the poorest of all extant men. Hissed at by the people of Versailles, he drives forth to Jardis, southward to Brienne, for recovery of health, then to Nice, to Italy, but shall return, shall glide to and fro, tremulous, faint twinkling, fallen on awful times, till the guillotine snuff out his weak existence. Alas, worse, for it is blown out or choked out foully, pitiably, on the way to the guillotine. In his palace of Sens, rude Jacobin bailiffs made him drink with them from his own wine cellars, feast with them from his own larder, and on the morrow morning the miserable old man lies dead. This is the end of Prime Minister Cardinal Archbishop Lomini de Brienne. Flimsy a mortal was seldom fated to do as weighty a mischief, to have a life as despicable envied, an exit as frightful. Fired, as the phrase is, with ambition, blown like a kindled rag, the sport of winds, not this way, not that way, but of always straight towards such a powder mine, which he kindled. Let us pity the hapless Lomini and forgive him, and as soon as possible, forget him. End of Book 3, Chapter 8《The French Revolution, A History, by Thomas Carlyle, Vol.
Volume 1. Book 3. The Parliament of Paris. Chapter 9. Burial with Bonfire. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan. Book 3. Chapter 9. Burial with Bonfire. Bessonval, during these extraordinary operations of payments to fifth in paper and change of Prime Minister, had been out on a tour through his district of command, and indeed for the last months peacefully drinking the waters of Contrex Ville. Returning now in the end of August towards Moulins, and knowing nothing, he arrives one evening at Langres, finds the whole town in a state of uproar, grande rumeur, doubtless some sedition, a thing too common in these days. He alights, nevertheless, inquires of a man tolerably dressed what the matter is. How, answers the man, have you not heard the news? The archbishop is thrown out and Monsieur Necker is recalled and all is going to go well. Such rumour and vociferous acclaim has risen round Monsieur Necker ever from that day when he issued from the Queen's apartments a nominated minister. It was on the 24th of August. The galleries of the chateau, the courts, the streets of Versailles, in few hours the capital, and as the news flew, all France resounded with the cry of Vive le Ra, Vive Monsieur Necker. In Paris, indeed, it unfortunately got the length of turbulence. Petards, rockets go off in the Place Dauphine, more than enough. A wicker figure, mannequin dossier, in Archbishop's stole, made emblematically three-fifths of its satin, two-fifths of its paper, is promenaded, not in silence, to the popular judgment bar, is doomed, shriven by a mock abbe de Vaumont, then solemnly consumed by fire at the foot of Henri's statue on the Pont Neuf, with such petarding and huzzaing that Chevalier Dubois and his city watch see good finally to make a charge, more or less ineffectual, and there wanted not burning of sentry boxes, forcing of guard houses, and also dead bodies thrown into the Seine overnight to avoid new effervescence. Parliament, therefore, shall return from exile. Plenary court, payment two-fifths in paper, have vanished, gone off in smoke at the foot of Henri's statue. States-general, with a political millennium, are now certain. Nay, it shall be announced in our fond haste for January next, and all, as the longer man said, is going to go. To the prophetic glance of Bessonval, one other thing is too apparent. That friend Lamagnon cannot keep his keepership. Neither he nor War Minister Comte de Brienne. Already old Foulon, with an eye to be War Minister himself, is making underground movements. This is that same Foulon named Arme damne du Parlement, a man grown grey in treachery, in griping, projecting, intriguing and iniquity, who once, when it was objected to some finance scheme of his, what will the people do, made answer in the fire of discussion, the people may eat grass. Hasty words which fly abroad irrevocable and will send back tidings. Foulon, to the relief of the world, fails on this occasion and will always fail. Nevertheless, it steads not Monsieur de la Magnon. It steads not the doomed man that he have interviews with the king and be seen to return radieux, emitting rays. La Magnon is the hated of parliaments. Comte de Brienne is brother of the cardinal archbishop. The 24th of August has been, and the 14th of September is not yet, when they too, as their great principal had done, descend, made to fall soft, like him. And now, as if the last burden had been rolled from its heart and assurance were at length perfect, Paris bursts forth anew into extreme jubilee. The Basoche rejoices aloud that the foe of parliaments is fallen. Nobility, gentry, commonality have rejoiced and rejoice. Nay, now, with new emphasis, rascality itself, starting suddenly from its dim depths, will arise and do it, for down even thither the new political evangel in some rude version or other has penetrated. It is Monday the 14th of September, 1788. Rascality assembles anew in great force in the Place Dauphine, lets off petards, fires blunderbusses to an incredible extent without interval for eighteen hours. There is again a wicker figure, mannequin of Osier, the centre of endless howlings. 
Also, Necker's portrait snatched or purchased from some print shop is borne processionally aloft on a perch with hazards, an example to be remembered. But chiefly on the Pont Neuf, where the great Henri in bronze rides sublime, there do crowds gather. All passengers must stop till they have bowed to the people's king and said audibly, Vive Henri IV, au diable la Magnon! No carriage but must stop, not even that of His Highness d'Orléans. Your coach doors are opened. Monsieur will please to put forth his head and bow, or even, if refractory, to alight altogether and kneel. From Madame a wave of her plumes, a smile of her fair face, there where she sits shall suffice. And surely a coin or two to buy fusées were not unreasonable from the upper classes, friends of liberty. In this manner it proceeds for days, in such rude horse play, not without kicks. The city watch can do nothing, hardly save its own skin, for the last twelve months, as we have sometimes seen, it has been a kind of pastime to hunt the watch. Bessonval indeed is at hand with soldiers, but they have orders to avoid firing and are not prompt to stir. On Monday morning, the explosion of petards began, and now it is near midnight of Wednesday, and the wick mannequin is to be buried, apparently in the antique fashion. Long rows of torches following it move towards the Hôtel La Magnon, but a servant of mine, Besson Valls, has run to give warning, and there are soldiers come. Gloomy La Magnon is not to die by conflagration, or this night, nor yet for a year, and then by gunshot. Suicidal or accidental is unknown. Foiled rascality burnt its mannequin of osier under his windows, tears up the sentry box and rolls off to try Brienne, to try Dubois, captain of the watch. Now, however, all is bestirring itself. Garde Francaise, Invalide, Horse Patrol, the torch procession is met with sharp shot, with the thrusting of bayonets, the slashing of sabres. Even Dubois makes a charge with that cavalry of his, and the cruelest charge of all, there are a great many killed and wounded. Not without clangour, complaint, subsequent criminal trials, and official persons dying of heartbreak. So, however, with steel besom, rascality is brushed back into its dim depths, and the streets are swept clear. Not for a century and a half had rascality ventured to step forth in this fashion. Not for so long showed its huge, rude lineaments in the light of day. A wonder and a new thing, as yet gambling merely in awkward, brobdignag sport, not without quaintness, hardly in anger. Yet in its huge, half-vacant laugh lurks a shade of grimness, which could unfold itself. However, the thinkers, invited by Lomini, are now far on with their pamphlets. States general, on one plan or another, will infallibly meet, if not in January, as was once hoped, yet at latest in May. Old Duc de Richelieu, moribund in these autumn days, opens his eyes once more, murmuring, What would Louis XIV, whom he remembers, have said? Then closes them again, forever, before the evil time. End of Book 3, Chapter 9《The French Revolution A History》by Thomas Carlyle, Volume 1 Book 4, States General Chapter 1, The Notables Again This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan Book 4, Chapter 1, The Notables Again the universal prayer, therefore, is to be fulfilled. Always in days of national perplexity, when wrong abounded and help was not, this remedy of states-general was called for. By a Malesherbes, nay, by a Fenelon, even parliaments calling for it were escorted with blessings. And now, behold, it is vouchsafed us. States-general shall verily be. To say, let states-general be, was easy. To say in what manner they shall be is not so easy. Since the year of 1614, there have no states general met in France. All trace of them has vanished from the living habits of men. Their structure, powers, methods of procedure, which were never in any measure fixed, have now become wholly a vague possibility. 
clay, which the potter may shape, this way or that, say rather the twenty-five millions of potters, for so many have now more or less a vote in it. How to shape the states general? There is a problem. Each body corporate, each privileged, each organised class has secret hopes of its own in that matter, and also secret misgivings of its own. For, behold, this monstrous twenty-five million class, hitherto the dumb sheep which these others had to agree about the manner of shearing, is now also arising with hopes. It has ceased, or is ceasing, to be dumb. It speaks through pamphlets, or at least brays and growls behind them, in unison, increasingly wonderfully their volume of sound. As for the Parliament of Paris, it has at once declared for the old form of 1614, which form had this advantage, that the tiers estate, third estate, or commons, figured there as a show mainly, whereas the noblesse and clergy had but to avoid quarrel between themselves and decide unobstructed what they thought best. Such was the clearly declared opinion of the Paris Parliament. But, being met by a storm of mere hooting and howling from other men, such opinion was blown straightway to the winds, and the popularity of the Parliament along with it, never to return. The Parliament's part, we said above, was as good as played. Concerning which, however, there is this further to be noted, the proximity of dates. It was on the 22nd of September that the Parliament returned from vacation or exile in its estates to be reinstalled amid boundless jubilee from all Paris. Precisely next day it was that this same Parliament came to its clearly declared opinion. And then on the morrow after that you behold it covered with outrages, its outer court one vast sibilation and the glory departed from it for evermore. A popularity of twenty-four hours was in those times no uncommon allowance. On the other hand, how superfluous was that invitation of Lomenes, the invitation to thinkers. Thinkers and unthinkers, by the million, are spontaneously at their post, doing what is in them. Clubs, Labour, Society, Publicol, Breton Club, Enraged Club, Club des Enragés, Likewise, dinner parties in the Palais Royal, your Mirabeau's Talleyrand dining there in company with Chamfort, Morellet, with Dupont and hot parliamenteers, not without object, for a certain Neckerian lions provider, whom one could name, assembles them there, or even their own private determination to have dinner does it. And then, as to pamphlets, in figurative language, it is a sheer snowing of pamphlets like to snow up the government thoroughfares. Now is the time for friends of freedom, sane and even insane. Count, or self-styled Count d'Intrigue, the young Laguedocian gentleman, with perhaps Chamfort the cynic to help him, rises into furor, almost pithic, highest where many are high foolish young Languedocian gentleman who himself so soon emigrating among the foremost must fly indignant over the marches with the contrast social in his pocket towards outer darkness thankless intriguing ignis fatuous hoverings and death by the stiletto Abbe Sier has left Chartres Cathedral and canonry and bookshelves there, has let his tonsure grow and come to Paris with a secular head of the most irrefragible sort to ask three questions and answer them. What is the third estate? All. What has it hitherto been in our form of government? Nothing. What does it want? To become something. Orleon, for to be sure he, on his way to chaos, is in the thick of this, promulgates his deliberations, fathered by him, written by Laclos of the Liaison Dangereuse, the result of which comes out simply, the third estate is the nation. On the other hand, Monseigneur d'Artois, with other princes of the blood, publishes, in solemn memorial to the king, that if such things be listened to, privilege, nobility, monarchy, church, state and strongbox are in danger. In danger, truly. And yet, if you do not listen, are they out of danger? It is the voice of all France, this sound that rises. 
immeasurable, manifold as the sound of outbreaking waters. Wise were he who knew what to do in it, if not to fly to the mountains and hide himself. How an ideal, all-seeing Versailles government, sitting there on such principles, in such an environment, would have determined to demean itself at this new juncture, may even yet be a question. Such a government would have felt too well that its long task was now drawing to a close, that, under the guise of these states-general, at length inevitable, a new, omnipotent, unknown of democracy was coming into being, in presence of which no Versailles government either could or should, except in a provisory character, continue extant. To an act which provisory character, so unspeakably important, might its whole faculties but have sufficed, and so a peaceable, gradual, well-conducted abdication and domine dimictas have been the issue. This for our ideal, all-seeing Versailles government. But for the actual, irrational Versailles government, alas, that is a government existing there only for its own behoof, without right except possession, and now also without might. It foresees nothing, sees nothing, has not so much as a purpose, but has only purposes, and the instinct whereby all that exists will struggle to keep existing. Wholly a vortex in which vain counsels, hallucinations, falsehoods, intrigues and imbecilities whirl like withered rubbish in the meeting of winds. The Oi de Boeuf has its irrational hopes, if also its fears. Since hitherto all states general have done as good as nothing, why should these do more? The commons indeed look dangerous, but on the whole is not revolt, unknown now for five generations, an impossibility? The three estates can, by management, be set against each other. The third will, as heretofore, join with the king, will, out of mere spite and self-interest, be eager to tax and vex the other two. The other two are thus delivered, bound into our hands, that we may fleece them likewise. Whereupon, money being got, and the three estates all in quarrel, dismiss them, and let the future go on as it can. As good Archbishop Lomini was wont to say, there are so many accidents, and it needs but one to save us. How many to destroy us? Poor Necker, in the midst of such an anarchy, does what is possible for him. He looks into it with obstinately hopeful face, lords the known rectitude of the kingly mind, listens indulgent-like to the known perverseness of the queenly and courtly, emits, if any proclamation or regulation, one favouring the tiers etat, but settles nothing, hovering afar off rather, and advising all things to settle themselves. The grand questions for the present have got reduced to two, the double representation and the vote by head. Shall the Commons have a double representation, that is to say, have as many members as the noblesse and clergy united? Shall the States General, when once assembled, vote and deliberate in one body, or in three separate bodies, vote by head, or vote by class, ordre as they call it? These are the moot points, now filling all France with jargon, logic and eleutheromania. To terminate which Necker bethinks him, might not a second convocation of the notables be fittest? Such second convocation is resolved on. On the 6th of November of this year, 1788, these notables accordingly have reassembled after an interval of some 18 months. They are Cologne's old notables, the same 144, to show one's impartiality, likewise to save time. They sit there once again in their seven bureaus in the hard winter weather. It is the hardest winter since 1709, thermometer below zero of Fahrenheit, Seine River frozen over. Cold, scarcity and eleutheromaniac clamour, a changed world since these notables were organed out in May gone a year. They shall see now whether, under their seven princes of the blood in their seven bureaus, they can settle the moot points. 
To the surprise of patriotism, these notables, once so patriotic, seem to incline the wrong way, towards the anti-patriotic side. They stagger at the double representation, at the vote by head. There is not affirmative decision. There is mere debating, and that is not with the best aspects. For indeed, were not these notables themselves mostly of the privileged classes? They clamoured once, now they have their misgivings, make their dolorous representations. Let them vanish, ineffectual, and return no more. They vanish after a month's session on this 12th of December, year 1788, the last terrestrial notables not to reappear any other time in the history of the world. And so, the clamour still continuing, and the pamphlets and nothing but patriotic addresses louder and louder, pouting in from all corners of France, Necker himself some fortnight after, before the year is yet done, has to present his report, recommending at his own risk that some double representation, nay, almost enjoining it so loud as the jargon and eleutheromania, what dubitating, what circumambulating, these whole six noisy months, for it began with Brienne in July, has not report followed report and one proclamation flown in the teeth of the other? However, that first moot point, as we see, is now settled. As for the second, that of voting by head or by order, it, unfortunately, is still left hanging. It hangs there, we may say, between the privileged orders and the unprivileged as a ready-made battle prize and necessity of war from the very first, which battle prize, whosoever seizes it, may thenceforth bear as battle flag with the best omens. But so, at least, by royal edict of the 24th of January, does it finally, to impatient, expectant France, become not only indubitable that national deputies are to meet, but possible, so far and hardly farther has the royal regulation gone, to begin electing them. End of Book 4, Chapter 1《The French Revolution》A History by Thomas Carlyle, Volume 1 Book 4, States General, Chapter 2, The Election This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan. Book 4, Chapter 2, The Election Up then, and be doing! The royal signal word flies through France as through vast forests the rushing of a mighty wind. At parish churches, in town halls, and every house of convocation, by bailliages, by senescences, in whatever form men convene, there, with confusion enough, are primary assemblies forming. To elect your electors, such is the form prescribed. Then to draw up your writ of plaints and grievances, cahier de plaintes et doléances, of which latter there is no lack. With such virtue works this royal January edict as it rolls rapidly in its leathern mails along these frost-bound highways towards all the four winds. Like some fiat or magic spell word which such things do resemble. For always as it sounds out at the market cross accompanied with trumpet blast presided by Bailly Seneschal or other minor functionary with beef-eaters or in country churches is droned forth after sermon or prone des mess par salle and is registered, posted and let fly all over the world you behold how this multitudinous French people so long simmering and buzzing in eager expectancy begins heaping and shaping itself into organic groups which organic groups, again, hold smaller organic grouplets. The inarticulate buzzing becomes articulate speaking and acting. By primary assembly and then by secondary, by successive elections and infinite elaboration and scrutiny according to prescribed process, shall the genuine plaint and grievances be at length got to paper, shall the fit national representative be at length laid hold of. How the whole people shakes itself as if it had one life, and in thousand-voiced rumour announces that it is awake, suddenly out of long death sleep, and will thenceforth sleep no more. The long looked for has come at last. Wondrous news of victory, deliverance, enfranchisement, sounds magical through every heart. 
to the proud strong man it has come, whose strong hand shall no more be gived, to whom boundless unconquered continents lie disclosed. The weary day drudge has heard of it, the beggar with his crusts moistened in tears. What to us also has hope reached, down even to us? Hunger and hardship are not to be eternal. The bread we extorted from the rugged glebe, and with the toil of our sinews reaped and ground and kneaded into loaves, was not holy for another then, but we also shall eat of it and be filled. Glorious news, answer the prudent elders, but all too unlikely. Thus, at any rate, may the lower people who pay no money taxes and have no right to vote assiduously crowd round those that do, and most halls of assembly, within doors and without, seem animated enough. Paris alone of towns is to have representatives, the number of them twenty. Paris is divided into sixty districts, each of which, assembled in some church or the like, is choosing two electors. Official deputations pass from district to district, for all is inexperience as yet, and there is endless consulting. The streets swarm strangely with busy crowds, pacific yet restless and loquacious. At intervals is seen the gleam of military muskets, especially about the Palais, where Parliament once more on duty sits querulous, almost tremulous. Busy is the French world. In those great days, what poorest speculative craftsman but will leave his workshop, if not to vote, yet to assist in voting? On all highways is a rustling and bustling, over the wide surface of France, ever and anon, through the spring months, as the sower casts his corn abroad among the furrows, sounds of congregating and dispersing, of crowds in deliberation, acclamation, voting by ballot and by voice, rise discrepant towards the ear of heaven. To which political phenomena add this economical one, that trade is stagnant, and also bread getting dear. For before the rigorous winter there was, as we said, a rigorous summer, with drought, and on the 13th of July with destructive hail. What a fearful day! All cried while that tempest fell. Alas, the next anniversary of it will be worse. Under such aspect is France electing national representatives. The incidents and specialties of these elections belong not to universal but to local or parish history, for which reason let not the new troubles of Grenoble or Bessinson, the bloodshed on the streets of Rennes and consequent march thither of the Breton young men with manifesto by their mothers, sisters and sweethearts, nor such like, detain us here. It is the same sad history everywhere, with superficial variations. A reinstated Parliament, as at Besançon, which stands astonished at this behemoth of a States-General it had itself evoked, starts forward with more or less audacity to fix a thorn in its nose, and alas is instantaneously struck down and hurled quite out, for the new popular force can use not only arguments but brickbats. Or else, and perhaps combined with this, it is an order of noblesse, as in Brittany, which will beforehand tie up the third estate, that it harm not the old privileges. In which act of tying up, never so skilfully set about, there is likewise no possibility of prospering. But the behemoth Briareus snaps your cords like green rushes. Tie up? Alas, monsieur! And then, as for your chivalry, rapiers, valour and wager of battle, think one moment, how can that answer? The plebeian heart, too, has read life in it, which changes not to paleness at glance even of you. And the six hundred Breton gentlemen assembled in arms for seventy-two hours in the Cordelia's cloister at Rennes have to come out again, wiser than they entered. For the Nant youth, the Angers youth, all Brittany was astir. Mothers, sisters and sweethearts shrieking after the march. The Breton noblesse must even let the mad world have its way. In other provinces, the noblesse, with equal goodwill, finds it better to stick to protests, to well-redacted career of grievances and satirical writings and speeches. Such is partially their course in Provence, whither indeed Gabriel Honoré Riquetti, Comte de Mirabeau, has rushed down from Paris to speak a word in season. 
in Provence, the privileged, backed by their A Parliament, discover that such novelties, enjoined though they be by royal edict, tend to national detriment, and what is still more indisputable, to impair the dignity of the noblesse. Whereupon Mirabeau, protesting aloud, this same noblesse, amid huge tumult, within doors and without, flatly determines to expel him from their assembly. No other method, not even that of successive duels, would answer with him, the obstreperous, fierce, glaring man, expelled he accordingly is. In all countries, at all times, exclaims he, departing, the aristocrats have implacably pursued every friend of the people, and with tenfold implacability, if such a one were himself born of the aristocracy. It was thus that the last of the Gracchi perished by the hands of the patricians, but he, being struck with the mortal stab, flung dust towards heaven, and called on the avenging deities, and from this dust there was born Marius, Marius not so illustrious for exterminating the Cimbri as for overturning in Rome the tyranny of the nobles. Casting up which new curious handful of dust through the printing press to breed what it can and may, Mirabeau stalks forth into the third estate. That he now, to ingratiate himself with this third estate, opened a cloth shop in Marseilles and for moments became a furnishing tale, or even the fable that he did so, is to us always among the pleasant memorabilities of this era. Stranger Clothier never wielded the L wand and rent webs for men or fractional parts of men. The fils adoptif is indignant at such disparaging fable, which nevertheless was widely believed in those days. But indeed, of Achilles in the heroic aged killed mutton, why should not Mirabeau in the unheroic ones measure broadcloth? More authentic are his triumph progresses through that disturbed district, with mob jubilee, flaming torches, windows hired for two louis, and voluntary guard of a hundred men. He is deputy-elect both of A and of Marseille, but will prefer A. He has opened his far-sounding voice, the depths of his far-sounding soul. He can quell such virtue is in a spoken word, the pride tumults of the rich, the hunger tumults of the poor, and wild multitudes move under him as under the moon do billows of the sea. He has become a world compeller and ruler over men. One other incident and specialty we note, with how different an interest... It is of the Parliament of Paris, which starts forward, like the others, only with less audacity, seeing better how it lay, to nose-ring that behemoth of a state's general. Worthy Dr. Guillotin, respectable practitioner in Paris, has drawn up his little plan of a carrière of doléances, as had he not, having the wish and gift, the clearest liberty to do. He is getting the people to sign it, whereupon the surly Parliament summons him to give an account of himself. He goes, but with all Paris at his heels, which floods the outer courts and copiously signs the cahier even there, while the doctor is giving account of himself within. The Parliament cannot too soon dismiss Guillotine with compliments to be borne home shoulder high. This respectable guillotine we hope to behold once more, and perhaps only once. The Parliament not even once, but let it be engulfed unseen by us. Meanwhile, such things, cheering as they are, tend little to cheer the national creditor, or indeed the creditor of any kind. In the midst of universal portentous doubt, what certainty can seem so certain as money in the purse and the wisdom of keeping it there? Trading, speculation, commerce of all kinds has as far as possible come to a dead pause, and the hand of the industrious lies idle in his bosom. Frightful enough when now the rigour of seasons has also done its part, and to scarcity of work is added scarcity of food. In the opening spring there come rumours of forestalment, there come king's edicts, petitions of bakers against millers, and at length in the month of April, troops of ragged lackalls and fierce cries of starvation. 
these are the thrice-famed brigands, an actual existing quotity of persons who long reflected and reverberated through so many millions of heads as in concave multiplying mirrors, become a whole brigand world and like a kind of supernatural machinery wondrously move the epos of the revolution. The brigands are here, the brigands are there, the brigands are coming. Not otherwise sounded the clang of Phoebus, Apollo's silver bow, scattering pestilence and pale terror, for this clang too was of the imagination, preternatural, and it too walked in formless immiserability, having made itself alike to the night, Nicticos. But remark at least, for the first time, the singular empire of suspicion in those lands, in those days. If poor famishing men shall, prior to death, gather in groups and crowds, as the poor field fairs and plovers do in bitter weather, were it but that they may chirp mournfully together, and misery look in the eyes of misery. If famishing men, what famishing field fairs cannot do, should discover, once congregated, that they need not die while food is in the land, since they are many and with empty wallets have right hands, in all this what need were there of preternatural machinery? To most people, none. But not to French people in a time of revolution. These brigands, as Turgos also were, 14 years ago, have all been set on, enlisted, though without tuck of drum, by aristocrats, by democrats, by d'Orléans, d'Artois, and enemies of the public wheel. Nay, historians to this day will prove it by one argument. These brigands, pretending to have no victual, nevertheless contrived to drink, nay, have been seen drunk, an unexampled fact. But on the whole, may we not predict that a people with such a width of credulity and of incredulity, the proper union of which makes suspicion and indeed unreason generally, will see shapes enough of immortals fighting in its battle ranks and never want for epical machinery? Be this as it may, the brigands are clearly got to Paris in considerable multitudes, with sallow faces, lank hair, the true enthusiast complexion, with sooty rags and also with large clubs, which they smite angrily against the pavement. These mingle in the election tumult, would fain sign guillotines cahier, or any cahier or petition whatsoever could they but write. Their enthusiast complexion, the smiting of their sticks, bodes little good to anyone, least of all to rich master manufacturers of the suburb Saint-Antoine, with whose workmen they can sort. End of Book 4, Chapter 2《The French Revolution A History》by Thomas Carlyle, Volume 1, Book 4, States General, Chapter 3, Grand Electric. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain, read by Peter Dan. Book 4, Chapter 3 grown electric. But now also national deputies from all ends of France are in Paris with their commissions, what they call pouvoirs or powers, in their pockets, inquiring, consulting, looking out for lodgings at Versailles. The States-General shall open there, if not on the 1st, then surely on the 4th of May, in the grand procession and gala. The Salle de Manu is all new carpentered, bedizened for them. Their very costume has been fixed. A grand controversy which there was as to slouch hats or slouched hats for the common deputies has got as good as adjusted. Ever new strangers arrive, loungers, miscellaneous persons, officers on furlough, as the worthy Captain Damp Martin, whom we hope to be acquainted with. These also from all regions have repaired hither to see what is toward. Our Paris committees of the 60 districts are busier than ever. It is now too clear the Paris elections will be late. On Monday, the 27th of April, astronomer Bailly notices that the Sieur Révillon is not at his post. The Sieur Révillon, extensive paper manufacturer of the Rue Saint-Antoine, he, commonly so punctual, is absent from the electoral committee and even will never reappear there. In those immense magazines of velvet paper has aught befallen? Alas, yes. 
Alas, it is no Montgolfier rising there today, but drudgery, rascality, and the suburb that is rising. Was the Sir Réveillon himself once a journeyman, heard to say that a journeyman might live handsomely on fifteen sous a day? Some sevenpence halfpenny, tis a slender sum. Or was he only thought and believed to be heard saying it? By this long chafing and friction, it would appear the national temper has grown electric. Down in those dark dens, in those dark heads and hungry hearts, who knows in what strange figure the new political evangel may have shaped itself? What miraculous communion of drudges may be getting formed? Enough. Grim individuals soon waxing to grim multitudes, and other multitudes crowding to see, beset that paper warehouse, demonstrate in loud, ungrammatical language, addressed to the passions too, the insufficiency of sevenpence halfpenny a day. The city watch cannot dissipate them. Broils arise and bellowings. Réveillon, at his wit's end, entreats the populace, entreats the authorities. Bessonval, now in active command, commandant of Paris, does towards evening to Réveillon's earnest prayer send some thirty garde Francais. These clear the street, happily without firing, and take post there for the night in hope that it may be all over. Not so. On the morrow it is far worse. Saint Antoine has arisen anew, grimmer than ever, reinforced by the unknown tattered Amalian figures with their enthusiast complexion and large sticks. The city through all streets is flowing thitherward to see two cartloads of paving stones that happen to pass that way have been seized as a visible godsend. Another detachment of Garde Francaise must be sent, Bessonval and the colonel taking earnest counsel. Then still another. They, hardly with bayonets and menace of bullets, penetrate to the spot. What a sight! A street choked up with lumber, tumult, and the endless press of men. A paper warehouse eviscerated by axe and fire. Mad din of revolt. Musket volleys responded to by yells, by miscellaneous missiles, by tiles raining from roof and windows, tiles, execrations, and slain men. The guard Francais like it not, but have to persevere. All day it continues, slackening and rallying. The sun is sinking, and Saint Antoine has not yielded. The city flies hither and thither. Alas, the sound of that musket volleying booms into the far dining rooms of the Chaussee d'Antin, alters the tone of the dinner gossip there. Captain Damp Martin leaves his wine, goes out with a friend or two to see the fighting. Unwashed men growl on him with murders of Abale's aristocrats, down with the aristocrats, and insult the cross of St. Louis. They elbow him and hustle him, but do not pick his pocket, as indeed at Réveillon's too there was not the slightest stealing. At fall of night, as the thing will not end, Bessonval takes his resolution, orders out the guard Suisse with two pieces of artillery, the Swiss guard shall proceed thither, summon that rabble to depart in the king's name. If disobeyed, they shall load their artillery with grape-shot, visibly to the general eye, shall again summon. If again disobeyed, fire, and keep firing, till the last man be in this manner blasted off and the street clear with which spirited resolution, as might have been hoped, the business is got ended. At sight of the lit matches of the foreign red-coated Switzers, Saint Antoine dissipates hastily in the shades of dusk. There is an encumbered street. There are from four to five hundred dead men. Unfortunate Réveillon has found shelter in the Bastille, does therefrom, safe behind stone bulwarks, issue plaint, protestation, explanation for the next month. Bold Bessonval has thanks from all the respectable Parisian classes, but finds no special notice taken of him at Versailles, a thing the man of true worth is used to. But how it originated, this fierce electric sputter and explosion? 
from Dorleon, cried the court party. He, with his gold, enlisted these brigands. Surely, in some surprising manner, without sound of drum, he raked them in hither from all corners to ferment and take fire. Evil is his good. From the court, cries enlightened patriotism, it is the cursed gold and wiles of aristocrats that enlisted them, set them upon ruining an innocent sieur Réveillon to frighten the faint and disgust men with the career of freedom. Bessonval, with reluctance, concludes that it came from the English, our natural enemies. Or, alas, might not one rather attribute it to Diana in the shape of hunger, to some twin dioscuri, oppression and revenge so often seen in the battles of men. Poor lackals, all betoiled, besoiled, encrusted into dim defacement, into whom nevertheless the breath of the Almighty has breathed a living soul. To them it is clear only that eleutheromaniac philosophism has yet baked no bread, that patriotic committee men will level down to their own level and no lower. Brigands, or whatever they might be, it was bitter earnest with them. They bury their dead with the title of Défenseurs de la Patrie, Martyrs of the Good Cause. Or, shall we say, insurrection has now served its apprenticeship, and this was its proof-stroke, and no inconclusive one. Its next will be a master-stroke, announcing indisputable mastership to a whole astonished world. Let that rock, fortress, tyranny, stronghold which they name Bastille, or building, as if there were no other building, look to its guns. But in such wise, with primary and secondary assemblies and carrier of grievances, with motions, congregations of all kind, with much thunder of froth eloquence, and at last with thunder of platoon musketry, does agitated France accomplish its elections. With confused winnowing and sifting in this rather tumultuous manner, it has now, all except some remnants of Paris, sifted out the true wheat grains of national deputies, 1,214 in number, and will forthwith open its States General. End of Book 4, Chapter 3《The French Revolution》A History by Thomas Carlyle, Volume 1. Book 4, States General. Chapter 4, The Procession. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan. Book 4, Chapter 4, The Procession. On the first Saturday of May, it is gala at Versailles, and Monday, fourth of the month, is to be a still greater day. The deputies have mostly got thither and sought out lodgings, and are now successively, in long, well-ushered files, kissing the hand of majesty in the chateau. Supreme Usher de Brézé does not give the highest satisfaction. We cannot but observe that in ushering noblesse or clergy into the anointed presence, he liberally opens both his folding doors, and on the other hand, for members of the third estate, opens only one. However, there is room to enter. Majesty has smiles for all. The good Louis welcomes his honourable members with smiles of hope. He has prepared for them the whole of menus, the largest near him, and often surveyed the workmen as they went on. A spacious hall, with raised platform for throne, court and blood royal, space for six hundred commons deputies in front, for half as many clergy on this hand and half as many noblesse on that. It has lofty galleries, wherefrom dames of honour, splendid in gaze door, foreign diplomacies and other gilt-edged, white-frilled individuals to the number of two thousand may sit and look. Broad passages flow through it, and outside the inner wall, all round it. There are committee rooms, guard rooms, robing rooms, really a noble hall, where upholstery aided by the subject fine arts has done its best, and crimson tasselled cloths and emblematic fleur-de-lis are not wanting. The hall is ready, the very costume, as we said, has been settled, and the commons are not to wear the hated slouch hat, chapeau clabeau, but one not quite so slouched, chapeau rabatou. As for their manner of working, when all dressed, for their voting by head or by order and the rest, this, which it were perhaps still time to settle, and in few hours will be no longer time, remains unsettled, 
hangs dubious in the breast of twelve hundred men. But now finally the sun on Monday the 4th of May has risen, unconcerned as if it were no special day. And yet, as his first rays could strike music from the Memnon statue on the Nile, what tones were there, so thrilling, tremulous of preparation and foreboding, which he awoke in every bosom at Versailles? Huge Paris, in all conceivable and inconceivable vehicles, is pouring itself forth. From each town and village come subsidiary rills, Versailles' very sea of men. But above all, from the Church of St. Louis to the Church of Notre Dame, one vast suspended billow of life, with spray scattered even to the chimney pots. For on chimney tops too, as over the roofs, and up thitherwards on every lamp iron signpost, breakneck coin of vantage, sits patriotic courage, and every window bursts with patriotic beauty, for the deputies are gathering at St. Louis Church to march in procession to Notre Dame and hear sermon. Yes, friends, ye may sit and look, boldly or in thought, all France and all Europe may sit and look, for it is a day like few others. Oh, one might weep like Xerxes, so many serried rows sit perched there like winged creatures, alighted out of heaven. All these and so many more that follow them shall have wholly fled aloft again, vanishing into the blue deep, and the memory of this day still be fresh. It is the baptism day of democracy. Sick time has given it birth, the numbered months being run. The extreme unction day of feudalism. A superannuated system of society, decrepit with toils, for has it not done much, produced you and what ye have and know, and with thefts and brawls named glorious victories, and with profligacy, sensualities, and on the whole with dotage and senility, is now to die. And so, with death throes and birth throes, a new one is to be born. What a work, O earth and heavens, what a work! Battles and bloodshed, September massacres, bridges of Lodi, retreats of Moscow, Waterloo's, Peterloo's, ten-pound franchises, tar barrels and guillotines. And from this present date, if one might prophesy, two centuries of it still to fight two centuries, hardly less, before democracy go through its due most baleful stages of quackocracy and pestilential world be burnt up and have begun to grow green and young again. Rejoice, nevertheless, ye Versailles multitudes, to you from whom all this is hid, and glorious end of it is visible. This day sentence of death is pronounced on shams. Judgment of resuscitation, were it but far off, is pronounced on realities. This day it is declared aloud, as with a doom trumpet, that a lie is unbelievable. Believe that, stand by that, if more there be not, and let what thing or things soever will follow it follow. Ye can no other, God be your help. So spake a greater than any of you, opening his chapter of world history. Behold, however, the doors of St. Louis Church flung wide, and the procession of processions advancing towards Notre Dame. Shouts rend the air, one shout at which Grecian birds might drop dead. It is indeed a stately, solemn sight. The elected of France, and then the court of France. They are marshalled and marched there, all in prescribed place and costume. Our commons in plain black mantle and white cravat. Noblesse in gold-worked, bright-dyed cloaks of velvet, resplendent, rustling with laces, waving with plumes. The clergy and roche alb and other best pontificalibus. Lastly comes the king himself and king's household, also in their brightest blaze of pomp, their brightest and final. One, some fourteen hundred men blown together from all winds on the deepest errand. Yes, in that silent marching mass there lies futurity enough. No symbolic ark like the old Hebrews do these men bear, yet with them too is a covenant. They too preside at a new era in the history of men. 
The whole future is there and destiny dim brooding over it. In the hearts and unshaped thoughts of these men it lies illegible, inevitable. Singular to think, they have it in them. Yet not they, not mortal, only the eye above can read it, as it shall unfold itself in fire and thunder of siege and field artillery, in the rustling of battle banners, the tramp of hosts, in the glow of burning cities, the shriek of strangled nations. Such things lie hidden, safe wrapped in this fourth day of May. Say rather, had lain in some other unknown day, of which this latter is the public fruit and outcome. And indeed, what wonders lie in every day, had we the sight, as happily we have not, to decipher it? For is not every meanest day the conflux of two eternities? Meanwhile, suppose we too, good reader, should, as now, without miracle, Muse Clio enables us, take our station also on some coin of vantage, and glance momentarily over this procession and this life sea with far other eyes than the rest do, namely with prophetic. We can mount and stand there without fear of falling. As for the life sea, or onlooking unnumbered multitude, it is unfortunately all too dim. Yet, as we gaze fixedly, do not nameless figures, not a few, which shall not always be nameless, disclose themselves, visible or presumable there? Young Baroness de Stael, she evidently looks from a window among older honourable women. Her father is minister and one of the gala personages, to his own eyes the chief one. Young, spiritual Amazon, thy rest is not there, nor thy loved father's. As Malabranche saw all things in God, so Monsieur Necker sees all things in Necker, a theorem that will not hold. But where is the brown-locked, light-behaved, fire-hearted Demoiselle Terragne? Brown, eloquent beauty, who, with thy winged words and glances, shalt thrill rough bosoms, hold steel battalions, and persuade an Austrian Kaiser, pike and helm lie provided for thee in due season, and, alas, also straight waistcoat and long lodging in the Salpetriere. Best hadst thou stayed in native Luxembourg and been the mother of some brave man's children, but it was not thy task, it was not thy lot. Of the rougher sex, how, without tongue or hundred tongues of iron, enumerate the notabilities? Has not Marquis Valladi hastily quitted his Quaker broad rim, his Pythagorean Greek in Wapping in the city of Glasgow? De Morand from his Courier de l'Europe, Lingue from his Annals, they looked eager through the London fog and became ex-editors, that they might feed the guillotine and have their due. Does Louvet of Faublas stand a tiptoe? And Brissot, Haidt de Wolville, friend of the blacks? He, with the Marquis Condorcet and Clavier the Genovese, have created the Moniteur newspaper, or are about creating it. Able editors must give account of such a day. Or seest thou with any distinctness, low down probably, not in place of honour, a Stanislas Maillard riding tipstaff, huisse à cheval, of the Châtelet, one of the shiftiest of men? A Captain Ulin of Geneva, Captain Ailey of the Queen's Regiment, both with an air of half-pay. Jourdain with tile-coloured whiskers, not yet with tile-beard, an unjust dealer in mules. He shall be, in a few months, Jourdain the headsman, and have other work. Surely also in some place not of honour stands or sprawls up querulous that he too, though short may see, one squalidest bleared mortal, redolent of soot and horse drugs, Jean-Paul Marat of Neuchâtel. O oh, Marat, renovator of human science, lecturer on optics, O oh, thou remarkablest horse-leech, once in d'Artois stable, as thy bleared soul looks forth through thy bleared, dull, acrid, woe-stricken face, what sees it in all this? Any faintest light of hope, like day-spring after no Vesembler night? Or is it but blue sulphur-light and spectres, woe, suspicion, revenge without end? Of Draper Lacointre, how he shut his cloth shop hard by and stepped forth, one need hardly speak. Nor of saint the sonorous brewer from the Faubourg Saint-Antoine. Two other figures, and only two, we signalise there. 
the huge brawny figure through whose black brows and rude flattened face, figure écrasée, there looks a waste energy as of Hercules not yet furibond. He is an Assyrian unprovided advocate, Danton by name. Him, Mark. Then that other, his slight-built comrade and craft brother, he with the long curling locks, with the face of dingy blackguardism, wondrously irradiated with genius, as if a naphtha lamp burnt within it, that figure is Camille des Moulins, a figure of infinite shrewdness, wit, nay, humour, one of the sprightliest, clearest souls in all these millions. Thou poor Camille, say of thee what they may, it were but falsehood to pretend one did not almost love thee, thou headlong, lightly sparkling man. But the brawny, not yet furibund figure, we say, is Jacques Danton, a name that shall be tolerably known in the revolution. He is president of the Electoral Cordelia's district at Paris, or about to be it, and shall open his lungs of brass. We dwell no longer on the mixed shouting multitude, for now, behold, the commons' deputies are at hand. Which of these six hundred individuals in plain white cravat that have come up to regenerate France might one guess would become their king? For a king or leader they, as all bodies of men, must have, be their work what it may, there is one man there who, by character, faculty, position, is fittest of all to do it, that man, as future not yet elected king, walks there among the rest. He with the thick black locks, will it be? With the hewer, as himself calls it, or black boar's head, fit to be shaken as a senatorial portent? Through whose shaggy beetle brows and rough-hewn seamed carbuncle face there look natural ugliness, smallpox, incontinence, bankruptcy, and burning fire of genius, like comet fire glaring fuliginous through murkiest confusions. It is Gabriel Honore Ricchetti de Mirabeau, the world compeller, man-ruling deputy of I. According to the Baroness de Stael, he steps proudly along, though looked at askance here, and shakes his black chevalier or lion's mane, as if prophetic of great deeds. Yes, reader, that is the type, Frenchman of this epoch, as Voltaire was of the last. He is French in his aspirations, acquisitions, in his virtues, in his vices perhaps more French than any other man, and intrinsically such a mass of manhood too. Mark him well. The National Assembly were all different without that one. Nay, he might say with the old despot, the National Assembly, I am that. Of a southern climate, of wild southern blood, for the Rechettis, or Arreghettis, had to fly from Florence and the Guelphs long centuries ago, and settled in Provence, where, from generation to generation, they have ever approved themselves a peculiar kindred, irascible, indomitable, sharp-cutting, true like the steel they wore, of an intensity and activity that sometimes verged towards madness, yet did not reach it. One ancient Ricchetti, in mad fulfilment of a mad vow, chains two mountains together, and the chain, with its iron star of five rays, is still to be seen. May not a modern Ricchetti unchain so much and set it drifting, which also shall be seen? Destiny has work for that swart, burly-headed Mirabeau. Destiny has watched over him, prepared him from afar. Did not his grandfather, stout Col d'Argent, silver stock, so they named him, shattered and slashed by seven and twenty wounds in one fell day, lie sunk together on the bridge at Cassano, while Prince Eugene's cavalry galloped and regalloped over him? Only the flying sergeant had thrown a camp kettle over that loved head, and Vendôme, dropping his spyglass, moaned out, Mirabeau is dead then. Nevertheless, he was not dead. He awoke to breathe, and miraculous surgery, for Gabriel was yet to be. With his silver stock he kept his scarred head erect through long years, and wedded and produced tuft Marquis Victor, the friend of men, whereby at last in the appointed year 1749 this long-expected rough-hewn Gabriel Honore did likewise see the light, roughest lion's whelp ever littered of that rough breed. 
how the old lion, for our old Marquis too, was lion-like, most unconquerable, kingly genial, most perverse, gazed wonderingly on his offspring and determined to train him as no lion had yet been. It is in vain, O Marquis, this cub, though thou slay him and flay him, will not learn to draw in dog-cart of political economy and be a friend of man. He will not be thou, must and will be himself another than thou. Divorce lawsuits, whole family save one in prison, and threescore lettres de cachet for thy own sole use do but astonish the world. Our luckless Gabriel, sinned against and sinning, has been in the Isle of Ré, and heard the Atlantic from his tower, in the Castle de Vif, and heard the Mediterranean at Marseilles. He has been in the fortress of Jou, and forty-two months, with hardly clothing on his back, in the dungeon of Vincennes, all by letter de cachet from his lion father. He has been in Pontalia jails, self-constituted prisoner was noticed fording estuaries of the sea at low water in flight from the face of men. He has pleaded before a parliaments to get back his wife, the public gathering on roofs to see, since they could not hear, the clatter teeth, clack dent, snarled singular old Mirabeau, discerning in such admired forensic eloquence nothing but two clattering jawbones and a head vacant sonorous of the drum species. But as for Gabriel Honore, in these strange wayfarings, what has he not seen and tried? From drill sergeants to prime ministers to foreign and domestic booksellers, all manner of men he has seen, all manner of men he has gained, for at bottom it is a social loving heart, that wild unconquerable one, more especially all manner of women. From the archer's daughter at Saint to that fair young Sophie, Madame Monnier, whom he could not but steal and be beheaded for in effigy. For indeed, hardly since the Arabian prophet lay dead to Ali's admiration was there seen such a love hero with the strength of thirty men. In war, again, he has helped to conquer Corsica, fought duels, irregular brawls, horse-whipped calumnious barons. In literature he has written on despotism, on lettres de cachet, erotic, sapphic, westerian, obscenities, profanities, books on the Prussian monarchy, on Cagliostro, on Cologne, on the water companies of Paris, each book comparable, we will say, to a bituminous alarum fire, huge, smoky, sudden. The firepan, the kindling, the bitumen were his own, but the lumber of rags, old wood, and nameless combustible rubbish, for all is fuel to him, was gathered from huckster and aspanniers of every description under heaven. Whereby, indeed, hucksters enough have been heard to exclaim, Out upon it, the fire is mine! Nay, consider it more generally. Seldom had man such a talent for borrowing. The idea, the faculty of another man, he can make his. The man himself, he can make his. All reflex and echo, tout de reflet et serre verbe, snarls old Mirabeau, who can see but will not. Crabbed old friend of men, it is his sociality, his aggregative nature, and will now be the quality of all for him. In that forty years' struggle against despotism, he has gained the glorious faculty of self-help, and yet not lost the glorious natural gift of fellowship, of being helped. Rare union. This man can live self-sufficing, yet lives also in the life of other men, can make men love him, work with him. A born king of men. But consider further how, as the old Marquis still snarls, he has made away with, you may, swallowed all formulas, a fact which, if we meditate it, will in these days mean much. This is no man of system, then. He is only a man of instincts and insights. A man, nevertheless, who will glare fiercely on any object and see through it and conquer it, for he has intellect, he has will, force beyond other men. A man not with logic spectacles, but with an eye. Unhappily, without decalogue, moral code, or theorem of any fixed sort, yet not without a strong living soul in him and sincerity there, a reality, not an artificiality, not a sham. And so he, having struggled forty years against despotism and made away with all formulas, shall now become the spokesman of a nation bent to do the same. 
For is it not precisely the struggle of France also to cast off despotism, to make away with her old formulas, having found them naught, worn out, far from the reality? She will make away with such formulae, and even go bare, if need be, till she have found new ones. Toward such work, in such manner, marches he, this singular Ricchetti Mirabeau. In fiery, rough figure, with black Samson locks under the slouch hat, he steps along there. A fiery, fuliginous mass, which could not be choked and smothered, but would fill all France with smoke. And now it has got air, it will burn its whole substance, its whole smoke atmosphere too, and fill all France with flame. Strange lot. Forty years of that smouldering, with foul fire damp and vapour enough, then victory over that, and like a burning mountain he blazes heaven high, and for twenty-three resplendent months pours out in flame and molten fire torrents all that is in him, the pharos and wonder sign of an amazed Europe, and then lies hollow, cold forever. Pass on, our questionable Gabriel Honore, the greatest of them all, in the whole national deputies, in the whole nation, there is none like and none second to thee. But now, if Mirabeau is the greatest, who of these six hundred may be the meanest? Shall we say that anxious, slight, ineffectual-looking man, under thirty, in spectacles, his eyes were the glasses off, troubled, careful, with upturned face, snuffling dimly the uncertain future time, complexion of a multiplex atrabilia colour, the final shade of which may be the pale sea-green, that greenish-coloured verdatra individual is an advocate of ours. His name is Maximilien Robespierre. The son of an advocate, his father founded mason lodges under Charles Edward, the English prince or pretender. Maximilian, the firstborn, was thriftily educated. He had brisk Camille de Moulin for schoolmate in the College of Louis le Grand at Paris. But he begged our famed necklace cardinal Rohan, the patron, to let him depart thence and resign in favour of a younger brother. The strict-minded Max departed, home to paternal Arras, and even had a law case there and pleaded, not unsuccessfully, in favour of the first Franklin Thunderrod. With a strict, painful mind, an understanding small but clear and ready, he grew in favour with official persons who could foresee in him an excellent man of business, happily quite free from genius. The bishop, therefore, taking counsel, appoints him judge of his diocese, and he faithfully does justice to the people, till, behold, one day a culprit comes whose crime merits hanging, and the strict mindest Max must abdicate, for his conscience will not permit the dooming of any son of Adam to die. A strict-minded, straight-laced man, a man unfit for revolutions, whose small soul, transparent, wholesome, looking as small ale, could by no chance ferment into virulent alligar, the mother of ever new alligar, till all France were grown acetous virulent. We shall see. Between which two extremes of grandest and meanest, so many grand and mean roll on towards their several destinies in that procession. There is Cazales, the learned young soldier, who shall become the eloquent orator of royalism and earn the shadow of a name. Experience Mounier, experience Malloué, whose presidential parliamentary experience the stream of things shall soon leave stranded. A Petion has left his gown and briefs at Chartres for a stormier sort of pleading, has not forgotten his violin, being fond of music. His hair is grizzled, though he is still young. Convictions, beliefs, placid, unalterable, are in that man, not hindmost of them, belief in himself. A Protestant clerical, Rabo saint Etienne, a slender, young, eloquent and vehement Barnave, will help to regenerate France. There are so many of them young. Till thirty the Spartans did not suffer a man to marry, but how many men here under thirty? coming to produce not one sufficient citizen, but a nation and a world of such. The old to heal up rents, the young to remove rubbish, which latter, is it not indeed, the task here? 
dim, formless from this distance, yet authentically there, thou noticedest the deputies from Nantes? To us mere cloth screens with slouch hat and cloak, but bearing in their pocket a cahier of doliances with this singular clause and much such in it, that the master wigmakers of Nantes be not troubled with new guild brethren, the actually existing number of ninety-two being more than sufficient. The Wren people have elected Farmer Gerard, a man of natural sense and rectitude without any learning. He walks there with solid step, unique in his rustic farmer clothes, which he will wear always, careless of short cloaks and costumes. The name Gerard, or Père Gerard, Father Gerard, as they please to call him, will fly far, borne about in endless banter, in royalist satires, in republican didactic almanacs. As for the man, Gerard, being asked once what he did, after trial of it, candidly think of this parliamentary work, I think, answered he, that there are a good many scoundrels among us. So walks Father Gerard, solid in his thick shoes, whithersoever bound. And worthy Dr. Guillotine, whom we hope to behold one other time? If not here, the doctor should be here, and we see him with the eye of prophecy, for indeed the Parisian deputies are all a little late. Singular guillotine, respectable practitioner, doomed by a satiric destiny to the strangest immortal glory that ever kept obscure mortal from his resting place, the bosom of oblivion. Guillotine can improve the ventilation of the hall, in all cases of medical police and hygiene be a present aid, but greater far he can produce his report on the penal code and reveal therein a cunningly devised beheading machine which shall become famous and world famous. This is the product of Guillotine's endeavours gained not without meditation and reading, which product popular gravity or levity christens by a feminine derivative name, as if it were his daughter, La Guillotine. With my machine, messieurs, I whisk off your head, vous fais sauter la tête in a twinkling, and you have no pain, whereat they all laugh. Unfortunate doctor, for two and twenty years he, young Guillotine, shall hear nothing but Guillotine, see nothing but Guillotine, then dying shall through long centuries wander, as it were, a disconsolate ghost on the wrong side of Styx and Leith, his name like to outlive Caesar's. See Bailly, likewise of Paris, time-honoured historian of astronomy ancient and modern, for by ye hath I serenely beautiful philosophizing with its soft moonshiny clearness and thinness ends in foul thick confusion of presidency, mayorship, diplomatic officiality, rabid triviality and the throat of everlasting darkness. Far was it to descend from the heavenly galaxy to the drapeau rouge. Beside that fatal dung heap on that last hell day thou must tremble, though only with cold. De foire. Speculation is not practice. To be weak is not so miserable, but to be weaker than our task. Woe the day when they mounted thee, a peaceable pedestrian, on that wild hippogriff of a democracy, which, spurning the firm earth, nay, lashing at the very stars, no yet known Astolfo could have ridden. In the common deputies there are merchants, artists, men of letters, 374 lawyers, and at least one clergyman, the Abbé Sier. Him also Paris sends among its twenty. Behold him, the light, thin man, cold but elastic, wiry, instinct with the pride of logic, passionless, or with but one passion, that of self-conceit. If indeed that can be called a passion, which in its independent, concentrated greatness seems to have soared into transcendentalism, and to sit there with a kind of godlike indifference and look down on passion. He is the man, and wisdom shall die with him. This is the CIA who shall be system builder, constitution builder general, and build constitutions as many as wanted, sky high, which shall all unfortunately fall before he get the scaffolding away. La politique, he said to Dumont, polity is a science I think I have completed, achevé. What things, O C.A., with thy clear, assiduous eyes art thou to see? 
But were it not curious to know how C.A. now in these days, for he is said to be still alive, looks out on all that constitution masonry through the roomy soberness of extreme age? Might we hope still with the old irrefragible transcendentalism? The victorious cause pleased the gods, the vanquished one pleased C.A.'s, Victor Catoni. Thus, however, amid sky-rending vivats and blessings from every heart, has the procession of the commons' deputies rolled by. Next follow the noblesse, and next the clergy, concerning both of whom it might be asked what they specially have come for, specially, little as they dream of it, to answer this question, put in a voice of thunder, What are you doing in God's fair earth and task garden, where whosoever is not working is begging or stealing? Woe, woe to themselves and to all, if they can only answer, Collecting tithes, preserving game. Remark, meanwhile, how Dorleon affects to step before his own order and mingle with the commons. For him are vivats, few for the rest, though all wave in plumed hats of a feudal cut and have sword on thigh, though among them is Dantraig, the young Languedocian gentleman, and indeed many appear more or less noteworthy. There are Lianco and La Rochefoucauld, the liberal Anglomaniac dukes. There is a filially pious Lally, a couple of liberal Lameths. Above all, there is Lafayette, whose name shall be Cromwell Grandison and fill the world. Many a formula has this Lafayette too made away with, yet not all formulas. He sticks by the Washington formula, and by that will he stick, and hang for it, as by sure bower anchor hangs and swings the tight warship, which, after all changes of wildest weather and water, is still found hanging. Happy for him, be it glorious or not. Alone of all Frenchmen, he has a theory of the world and right mind to conform thereto. He can become a hero and perfect character were it but the hero of one idea. Note further our old parliamentary friend Christum Catiline d'Espremenil. He is returned from the Mediterranean islands, a red-hot royalist, repentant to the finger-ends, unsettled-looking, whose light, dusky glowing, at best, now flickers foul in the socket, whom the National Assembly will by and by, to save time, regard as in a state of distraction. Note lastly that globular younger Mirabeau, indignant that his elder brother is among the commons. It is Vicomte Mirabeau, named oftener Mirabeau Tonno, barrel Mirabeau, on account of his rotundity and the quantities of strong liquor he contains. There then walks our French noblesse, all in the old pomp of chivalry, and yet alas how changed from the old position, drifted far down from their native latitude like arctic icebergs got into the equatorial sea and fast thawing there. Once the chivalry dukes, dukes, as they are still named, did actually lead the world, were it only towards battle spoil, where lay the world's best wages then. Moreover, being the ablest leaders going, they had their lion's share, those dukes, which none could grudge them. But now, when so many looms, improved ploughshares, steam engines and bills of exchange have been invented, and for battle brawling itself men hire drill sergeants at eighteen pence a day, what mean these gold-mantle chivalry figures walking there in black velvet cloaks, in high-plumed hats of a feudal cut? Reeds shaken in the wind! The clergy have got up with Kair for abolishing pluralities, enforcing residence of bishops, better payment of tithes. The dignitaries, we can observe, walk stately, apart from the numerous undignified, who indeed are properly little other than commons disguised in curate frocks. Here, however, though by strange ways, shall the precept be fulfilled, and they that are greatest, much to their astonishment, become least. For one example, out of many, mark that plausible Gregoire, one day Cure Gregoire, shall be a bishop, when the now stately are wandering distracted as bishops in partibus. With other thought, mark also the Abbe Mori, his broad, bold face, mouth accurately primmed, full eyes that ray out intelligence, falsehood, the sort of sophistry which has astonished you should find it sophistical. 
skilfullest vamper up of old rotten leather to make it look like new. Always a rising man, he used to tell Mercier. You will see I shall be in the academy before you. Likely indeed, thou skilfullest Mori. Nay, thou shalt have a cardinal's hat and plush and glory. But alas, also in the long run, mere oblivion like the rest of us and six feet of earth. What boots it, vamping rotten leather on these terms? Glorious in comparison is the livelihood thy good old father earns by making shoes. One may hope in a sufficient manner. Maurice does not want for audacity. He shall wear pistols by and by, and at death cries of La Lanterne, the lamp by and answer coolly, Friends, will you see better there? But yonder, halting lamely along, thou noticed next Bishop Toleron Perigord, his reverence of Autun. A sardonic grimness lies in that irreverent reverence of Autun. He will do and suffer strange things, and will become surely one of the strangest things ever seen, or likely to be seen. A man living in falsehood and on falsehood, yet not what you can call a false man. There is the specialty. It will be an enigma for future ages, one may hope. Hitherto such a product of nature and art was possible only for this age of ours, age of paper and of burning of paper. Consider Bishop Talleyron and Marquis Lafayette as the topmost of their two kinds, and say once more, looking at what they did and what they were, O tempus ferax rerum. On the whole, however, has not this unfortunate clergy also drifted in the time stream far from its native latitude? An anomalous mass of men, of whom the whole world has already a dim understanding that it can understand nothing. They were once a priesthood, interpreters of wisdom, revealers of the holy that is in man, a true clerus, or inheritance of God on earth. But now? They pass silently with such cahiers as they have been able to redact, and none cries, God bless them. King Louis, with his court, brings up the rear. He, cheerful in this day of hope, is saluted with plaudits, still more necker, his minister. Not so the Queen, on whom hope shines not steadily any more. Ill-fated Queen. Her hair is already grey, with many cares and crosses. Her first-born son is dying in these weeks. Black falsehood has ineffaceably soiled her name, ineffaceably while this generation lasts. Instead of vive la reine, voices insult her with vive d'Orléans. Of her queenly beauty little remains except its stateliness, not now gracious but haughty, rigid, silently enduring. With the most mixed feeling, wherein joy has no part, she resigns herself to a day she hoped never to have seen. Poor Marie Antoinette, with thy quick noble instincts, vehement glancings, vision all too fitful narrow for the work thou hast to do. Oh, there are tears in store for thee, bitterest wailings, soft womanly meltings, though thou hast the heart of an imperial Teresa's daughter, thou doomed one, shut thy eyes on the future. And so, in stately procession, have passed the elected of France, some towards honour and quick fire consummation, most towards dishonour, not a few towards massacre, confusion, emigration, desperation all towards eternity. So many heterogeneities cast together into the fermenting vat, there with incalculable action, counteraction, elective affinities, explosive developments, to work out healing for a sick, moribund system of society. Probably the strangest body of men, if we consider well, that ever met together on our planet on such an errand. So thousandfold complex a society, ready to burst up from its infinite depths, and these men, its rulers and healers, without life rule for themselves, other life rule than a gospel according to Jean Jacques. To the wisest of them, what we must call the wisest man is properly an accident under the sky. Man is without duty round him, except it be to make the constitution. He is without heaven above him or hell beneath him. He has no God in the world. What further or better belief can be said to exist in these twelve hundred? 
belief in high-plumed hats of a feudal cut, in heraldic scutcheons, in the divine right of kings, in the divine right of game destroyers. Belief, or what is still worse, canting half-belief, or worst of all, mere Machiavellic pretense of belief, in consecrated dough wafers and the godhead of a poor old Italian man. Nevertheless, in that immeasurable confusion and corruption which struggles there so blindly to become less confused and corrupt, there is, as we said, this one salient point of a new life discernible, the deep, fixed determination to have done with shams. A determination which, consciously or unconsciously, is fixed, which waxes ever more fixed into very madness and fixed idea, which, in such embodiment as lies provided there, shall now unfold itself rapidly, monstrous, stupendous, unspeakable, new for long thousands of years. How has the heaven's light, oftentimes in this earth, to clothe itself in thunder and electric murkiness and descend as molten lightning, blasting if purifying? Nay, is it not rather the very murkiness and atmospheric suffocation that brings the lightning and the light? The new evangel, as the old has been, was it to be born in the destruction of a world? But how the deputies assisted at high mass and heard sermon and applauded the preacher, church as it was, when he preached politics. How next day, with sustained pomp, they are for the first time installed in their salle de menu, hall no longer of amusements, and become a state's general. Readers can fancy for themselves. The king from his estrade, gorgeous as Solomon in all his glory, runs his eye over that majestic hall, Many plumed, many glancing, bright tinted as rainbow, in the galleries and near side spaces where beauty sits reigning bright influence. Satisfaction as of one that after long voyaging had got to port plays over his broad, simple face, the innocent king. He rises and speaks with sonorous tone, a conceivable speech with which, still more, with the succeeding one-hour and two-hour speeches of Garde des Sceaux and Monsieur Necker, full of nothing but patriotism, hope, faith, and the deficiency of the revenue, no reader of these pages shall be tried. We remark only that, as His Majesty, on finishing the speech, put on his plumed hat, and the noblesse, according to custom, imitated him, a tiers etat deputies did mostly, not without a shade of fierceness, in like manner clap on or even crush on their slouched hats and stand there awaiting the issue. Thick buzz among them between majority and minority of couvrez-vous, découvrez-vous, hats off, hats on, to which His Majesty puts end by taking off his own royal hat again. The session terminates without further accident or omen than this with which, significantly enough, France has opened her States-General. End of Book 4, Chapter 3